Section 23 of The Heirloom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gauntz. The Heirloom by T. Duthy Lyle. Volume 2, Chapter 9. Reading Between the Lines. As the colonel, in the privacy of his room in the little Craven Street Hotel, his face blanched livid, and the trifle of paper on which the, to him, surprising and strange epistle was scrawled, twirled and fluttered from his trembling loosened grasp, twirled across the room in the cool light summer morning breeze which came in at the open window, and then what seemed to him as like a billet from the grave, from the hand of the dying or the dead, the flimsy messenger lighted on the floor. Colonel Vandermeulen became absorbed in thought. Then his midnight visitant, who had appeared to him and disappeared so mysteriously in his little, now far-off den at Battery Park, that Merville Garnier, Bertram Gono, or whoever on earth he might be, was still not dead, was yet an active entity of life. The detective stooped down and picked up the flimsy missive from the floor. He examined it closely, and did that which those sharp, clever people do who wish to know more than their correspondents intend to tell, and that is a faculty which, when the correspondent is equally clever and sharp, he knows well how to turn to his own account. Colonel Vandermeulen read between the lines. That is, he conjectured from what was left unsaid, a great deal more than the mysterious writer knew that he was telling, and perhaps from that flimsy half-leaf torn from the memorandum or pocket-book, Colonel Vandermeulen, reading between the lines, learnt as much as if his correspondent had covered a half-sheet of foolscap with words. Adding the World Reporter's graphic newspaper account of the fire at Long Island City, and what he himself had seen at the fire to the fact of the missive which he held in his hand, and putting the two and two together, and still reading between the lines, Colonel Vandermeulen came to the conclusion that, notwithstanding the New York world's sensational and highly colored narrative, notwithstanding what both he, the colonel, and his little gray-coated assistant Paul Nugas had both witnessed, yet by some miracle of chance the man, who for want of any greater certainty as to his true identity we must call Merville Garnier, had somehow, by some marvel of mysteries, escaped at least with his life. How he could have thus escaped would have seemed a miracle to those who, as he fell among the rushing, devouring elements, amid the crashing, falling timbers, saw his apparent and horrid fate. But instances of hairbreadth escape are not wanting throughout the whole range of fiction and travel and adventure, and indeed in sober, ordinary, everyday life and fact, and this might be, probably was, only one other added to the startling list of such as these. That was what Colonel Vandermeulen conjectured and thought. Then he went on to read between the lines. Having much yet to tell, we must refrain from finding space in these chapters to repeat everything that, by this process of reading between the lines, Colonel Vandermeulen came to know. But the scrawly handwriting, the postponement of the appointed meeting, what he himself had seen, all these facts put together led him to feel mentally convinced that somewhere in or near New York, the man Merville Garnier, whoever he might be, lay perhaps nursed by strangers, probably suffering from serious bodily injuries, but from which he believed he would recover, probably even now writhing in agony, scarce able to move to and fro the hand which had scrawled those characters, and peradventure swaying betwixt life and death. Although the little missive which must in some way have got into and come through the New York post office, thence to the detective's Battery Park den, then across three thousand miles of ocean and three hundred miles of land to the little Craven Street Hotel, said not a word of all this, Yet, just as the keen and practiced eye of the Indian on the war trail reads the footprints upon the sand, the marks on the bushes and grass, likewise almost as plainly as if the disabled writer had written it, as surely as if in words he had been told it, that was what Colonel Vandermeulen read. As he thought it over, the whole surroundings, the setting, as we may call it, of the case, 
seemed to his sharp, experienced eyes and acute intelligence as clear as day, for in some inexplicable way American life or the American climate or atmosphere is a wondrous sharpener, a wondrous quickener of intelligence and thought. The day wore on in which the American had received from New York this little epistle which afforded him such a very valuable and startling page of information in so very few words. And as during his wanderings and explorations about the London streets, adding what he could to his fund of knowledge of our great overgrown city, marveling, as most foreigners who see it with intelligent eyes do, and as every native must, at its greatnesses and its littlenesses, at the wondrous variety of its wonders side by side with the petty commonplacenesses of its everyday life. As the day wore on and he revolved the newly known circumstances in his mind, they seemed to him to add but little or nothing, to give him indeed no great reason for any change in his course. As to wondering, he had ceased to wonder had ceased to wonder at the inexplicable development of the complex but important and interesting case which had come into his hands, for it seemed to him like the acting of a chapter of fiction, or some wild romance. Whatever might now occur in connection with the Vernwood tragedy would probably have caused him but small or no surprise. He had arrived at a stage beyond surprise. Had the whole phalanx and all their generations of those dead and gone Gnoes appeared to him in ghostly shape, all those men of the bygone past whose iron and steel-clad effigies with their tall banneretted lances stood now so grimly and silently around the great Vernwood Hall, while their bodies rotted or their bones decayed in the dank, damp mausoleum, and their souls sang jubilees in heaven or writhed in agony elsewhere. Had they now all passed before him in their grim array, it is likely that the hardened New York detective and grand army man of the United States would have sat down and calmly, unastonished and unmoved, have surveyed the whole ghostly company through the fragrant upward circling fumes of his twenty-cent weed. We write this, of course, only figuratively, but to such a degree had now grown to be the incredulous, unbelieving tenor concerning the Vernwood mystery of this man's mind and thoughts. Nothing, no circumstance that could arise, would have caused him much, if any, surprise in connection with this strange and even to his experienced mind, this inexplicable case. The day wore through and Colonel Vandermeulen had, in some way, even to go so far as to tax his ingenuity to get rid of his time. He chafed and fumed to himself at the vexatious loss of valuable hours and days, because there was no other person but himself to whom he could chafe and fume. Mr. Lumley, whom he should have interviewed promptly on reaching London, was away from town, he didn't know exactly where, beyond his reach. For, like many busy men, Mr. Lumley, when he chose to emancipate himself from the cares and toils of his profession, left no very definite trace or information as to his probable whereabouts behind, for he always argued, quite rightly, that if the retirement of his brief well-earned vacations was to be broken in upon by the intrusions and questions of his office every other hour of the twelve, he had better remain in town and not attempt to take any respite of the nature of a holiday at all. Besides, the New York detective had crossed the ocean without any solicitation from his London correspondent, on his own responsibility, for his own satisfaction, and at his own risk, and at his own cost. Nobody had asked him to come. He was in England neither at the invitation or instigation of Mr. Lumley or of Dr. Sirius Wells, so, if he was losing valuable time, he had himself only to thank for the loss. But Colonel Vandermeulen was a man whose natural sagacity led him into very, very few mistakes. He was as wary as a giraffe, as keen-eyed as a lynx or a hawk, and if he had not felt sure that in one way or another his visit to London would turn out a profitable investment of time and money and bodily wear and tear, he would most probably have remained in New York. When he booked from New York to London, he did it with his usually wide-open eyes. And now here he was in London, 
and in London, till there came some turn of the tide, he must exist and subsist, and resolved to remain. And thus it was that as morning turned into afternoon, and as afternoon waned into evening, and evening shadowed into night, and London began to awake into those dissipations which shun the light of day, under the glare and brilliancy of the gaslight, Colonel Vandermeulen found himself in the somewhat lively vicinity of Leicester Square, for the denizens of this part of London become most wide awake as the steady-going inhabitants of the suburbs and shires think it advisable to retire to sleep. Before his eyes a large theatrical establishment was just about opening its doors, and its broad façade was brilliantly aglow with attractive illuminated designs, while an imposing array of placarded pictures of dancing beauties, entrancing ballets, convulsing oddities, and astonishing wonders had the desired effect of luring the very necessary and moderate entrance fee from the usually unimpressionable detective's pocket, and Colonel Vandermeulen found himself within its doors. Certainly the combined spectacular effect which the entertainment produced, of so much color and so much tinsel and so much light, so much beauty, so much muscular agility, so much enravishing music upon and about the stage, and so much allurement among those who were supposed to be there with the purpose of looking on, that the New Yorker thought he had never seen equaled, and he was sure he had never seen excelled, not even in that hub of the universe New York, and Colonel Vandermeulen felt that he had something yet to learn. Then suddenly there entered into Colonel Vandermeulen's heart to conceive how it was all done, and by means of the expenditure of a little more of his wealth, of persuasion, of cajolery, he passed that jealously guarded portal which separates the professional world from the common, and behind the scenes stood among such a marvellous crowd of men and women, young, middle-aged, and old, as only the requirements of a large theatrical establishment can collect from the masses of ordinary humanity which crowd the great metropolis, and remould, redress, and reproduce them into the semblance of kings, or queens, or warriors, or fairies, or gnomes, and every character and creature under heaven which human eyes ever saw or human imagination ever conceived. It was among this crowd, among this wonderful melange of characters, that Colonel Vandermeulen stood. It is beyond the modest power of the writer of these pages, by means of mere words, to paint even in the faintest colors the mixture of character, mixture of character in every way, which Colonel Vandermeulen beheld about him. It added a page to his experience, and a chapter to his life. And yet all was humanity, intensity of humanity, and that surely not in its most exalted state. A certain poet has told us that all the world's a stage, and when we see actors and actresses posturing, bowing, walking, talking in grandiloquently shapely periods in their parts, we must not forget that they too, like us, are only men and women, weighted with all the woes and realities, the joys and sorrows, the hopes and fears of an inner life. Strip off the semblance of the king, and there remains the man. And when we come too near, we cannot but discover too much for our own pleasure of the paint, the spangles, the tinsel, and the gloss, that much, very much of this is outward show, unreal, assumed. Around Colonel Vandermeulen were men in mimic armor, but they were men, walking, working, drinking, toiling men. There were mimic kings in all the faded glories of their sham estate, but these kings were the merest men, perhaps merely society's dregs. There were mimic queens and fairies, but they were human only, with all the frailties and longings and attributes of their sex. There too was the mimic semblance of beings which people only the myth-historic and imaginary realms of fable, fiction, or romance, creatures of mere fancy, denizens of worlds which no human eye, except the eye of fantasy, has ever seen. It was between the acts, the curtain was drawn when the American stood in the midst of this wondrous and motley assemblage which moved and surged in hundreds round him, each engaged as on the active business of life. 
Men, women, boys, girls, and children of every age and either sex, attired or semi-attired, in all the extravagance and oddities which appertain to opera comique or burlesque. Then suddenly, out of this wondrous throng, there started up again before the astonished Vandermeulen, in the midst of the crowd, like some apparition from the dead, what seemed to be the troubling apparition of a haunted life. For there again, in the flesh or in the spirit, he was afraid to determine whether corporeal or only in ghostly guise, there stood before him that same Merville Garnier, or whoever or whatever he might be, again, his midnight visitor of New York, no other than the same whom he was asked to believe was murdered in England, burnt, according to the New York world's report, to a cinder at the great fire in Long Island City, and from whom that very morning he believed he had received a missive written in New York. We have said before this that Colonel Vandermeulen's condition of mind was a condition beyond the influence of surprise and now was added still another stretch to the strain of incredulity with which he was possessed. Although indifferent and in some kind of theatrical guise, there stood before him the same tall form, there appeared the same face with the right cheek indelibly scarred, there was when he laughed the same sardonic Mephistophelian laugh. Colonel Vandermeulen felt he could have pointed him out, identified him for the most exacting requirements of justice, recognized him out of a thousand men. There must be a truth, as there is a truth in everything, no matter how apparently impenetrable is the veil of mystery and disguise. But what that truth was, it was beyond the experience or power of the New York detective Colonel Vandermeulen to divine. Was he being made the victim of some gigantic hoax? Or was the case the most remarkable, the most inexplicable of his life? If it cost him years of toil, years of thought, Vandermeulen swore inwardly to himself he would know. He would probe to its depths the tantalizing enigma by which he almost began to believe himself hoodwinked and befooled. End of section 23「Section 24 of the Heirloom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Little Miss Clumsy. The Heirloom by T. Duthy Lyle. Volume 2. Chapter 10. Captain West. Chickets and Mrs. Chickets were what we will call a lower-middle-class London married disunited pair. So ambiguous and uncertain was the social position and status of the male fraction, for he was something smaller and more insignificant in the opinion of his spouse than the worst half of this inharmonious twain, that he had never arisen to a higher distinction than the appellation of chickets plain and simple chickets in the wifely eyes or on the wifely tongue. Chickets' ancestral pride consisted in the glorious recollection and distinction that his immediate forebear had been actively engaged in supplying bovine fluid to the human race, and unto his son and heir, the sole and same and only chickets with whom these pages are at all concerned, descended the paternal honours of his race. In other words, the father of Chickets had been a London milkman, and previous to the happy or unhappy day of his union with the present and reigning Mrs. Chickets, who was now the ruling factor of his downtrodden life, Chickets Secundus, or Chickets Junior, had been the same. Mrs. Chickett's relations being indefinitely stated to be something in the city, the great gulf which ran between the house of Chickett's, dividing it sharply and widely asunder, was an entity, a reality in which, in a good, round, forcible London English, poor Chickett's the present heard very much more than was consistent with mental peace. As, 
at the rent Chickets and Mrs. Chickets were willing or able to pay, no London landlord had been found who was inclined to let a house large enough or wide enough to contain in peace and harmony these jarring twain, they, in a way, had their establishments apart. Right away in that metropolitan district, between what is known as Maida Vale, Edgware Road, between that and St. John's Wood, there exists a type of domiciliary edifice of which the examples are as plenteous as buds in spring. There is usually a basement or kitchen beneath the ground level, above which there is what is called a dining room, frequently a stuffy and not uncommonly dirty room, lighted by a common inornate window with plain common inornate squares of glass, while above this, up a flight of stairs, the pride of the household, called the drawing-room, is a more or less dingy apartment, before the window of which is built a balcony of ornamental iron work, from which the favoured occupant or tenant of his favoured chamber may, on summer evenings, enjoy a striking view of adjacent chimneys and walls. He can also obtain an admirable view of his opposite neighbour's front windows and doors. Between this building and the street, an oblong rectangular enclosure surrounded by a high wall is called the garden, but is commonly as much unlike a garden and is usually as bare of vegetable life as the site of Memphis or the Sahara Desert. Only at night from this Sahara waste arise the shrill clarion sounds of defeat and victory for it is the seat and battlefield of feline war. Without entering more minutely into details, it was in such a domicile as this that Mrs. Chickets reigned. Around the street corner from this favoured habitation was Chickets' smaller domain, and certainly in Chickets' domain there was more of the garden, much more, than was ever seen in Mrs. Chickett's more imposing domain. From the great financing millionaire, whose ventures and combinations in the commercial world are too often nothing worse or nothing better, nothing less or nothing more than gigantic frauds on the too confiding credulity of the public and devourment of the smaller fry which sail in the commercial sea down to the honest boy in rags and tatters who stands at the street corner and sells an honest bootlace for an honest penny, it is astonishing how many are the degrees and gradations of what is called commerce or business or trade. Round the corner from Mrs. Chickett's mansion, which stood boldly and prominently facing the main road, round the corner in a small front room Chickett's stood. It was a dirty little den, filled with potatoes in baskets and sacks, sticks of celery in bundles, lettuces, milk, eggs, and ginger beer, and at certain intervals, by way of tempting variety, chickets had it, cheap beef sausages, faggots, and saveloys. And it was the disposal of these various comestible dainties and oddments which comprised Chickett's idea of business and trade. How Mrs. Chickett's, whose connections were something in the city, ever came to be deluded into uniting her destinies to a milkman, the aspirations of whose soul never soared above bundles of celery, cheap beef sausages and saveloys, was one of the indissoluble enigmas of her blighted life. But to make up for this, Mrs. Chickets had gone to a neighbouring news vendors and stationers and selected a card stamped in relief with a floral design in the midst of which the word apartments was printed in conspicuous characters. And this card the lady of the house had conspicuously displayed in the balconied window of her first floor front room. We are quite aware that the letter or letteress of apartments, 
is a character acknied in fiction and worn in fact. A character as denuded of its pristine gloss and freshness as is the worn and shiny black satin in which from time immemorial fictionists have described her to flaunt, which usually, like herself, has outlived the splendours of its palmier days. In short, that of Mrs. Chickett's, being a character observable in almost every London street, is one on which it is quite unnecessary for us to dwell. But at last, as if to interrupt the vapid monotony of her existence, there came a bright red-letter day in Mrs. Chickett's life. A stranger presented himself at Mrs. Chickett's front door, desired to be shown the apartment in the window of which the card aforesaid was displayed, and then and there, without any chaffering or demur, agreed to pay Mrs. Chickett's price and become tenant of Mrs. Chickett's first-floor front room. The stranger, who gave his name as Captain West, but who, in fact, was no other than our acquaintance, Colonel Van der Muelen of New York, paid a week's rent down, and signified his desire to enter on his tenancy that very same afternoon. In due time, Mrs. Chickett's new lodger arrived in a cab followed by another cab conveying an imposing load of boxes and trunks, most of which were mere empty dummies filled with rubbish to give them weight, for, as we have already noticed, the colonel's travelling equipment was a most meagre quantity. But as to the exterior person of Mrs. Chickett's new lodger, from the individual whom we know as Colonel Van der Mulen, it was marvellously and wondrously transformed, so wondrously that neither you or I, my reader, however his American speech might have betrayed him to quick and practised ears, would for one moment have recognised the New York Heinrich van der Mulen in the guise of the English Captain West. But perhaps it was the well-dressed exterior of this imposing personality that impressed and so affected Mrs. Chickett's mind. You might have taken Captain West for a British peer. You might have taken him for a member of the Imperial Parliament. You might have taken him for an ultra beau, you might have taken him for some first water swell, but there was one thing you would never have taken him for. You would never have taken him for just what he was. You would never have suspected Captain West, neither did Mrs. Chickett's, to be Colonel Van der Mulen, private detective of New York. Within three hours of the arrival of the new guest, Mrs. Chickett's had flown round with the burning words of gossip upon her tongue, and all her friends had heard of Mrs. Chickett's wonderful new guest. That the new lodger had just arrived in England she knew, for he said so, and he came from near the Parliament Houses. He was a perfect gentleman, Mrs. Chickett's said, somehow connected with the government, she thought. Indeed, she didn't know that he mightn't be something to do with royalty itself. That was the exultingly highly coloured account Mrs. Chickett's gave her gossiping connection of her new lodger, Captain West. As to poor Chickett's, he, in the meantime, had sunk in her eyes to the level of the veriest worm. Having told our reader, en passant, what Mrs. Chickett's thought of her new lodger, we will take a cursory look at Captain West himself in his new home on our own account, and leave out of the question Mrs. Chickett's high-flown, over-glowing and over-painted ideas. In the craftiness of her heart and the worldly wisdom of her profession, and, alas, that we might add it, too often of her sex, Mrs. Chickett's had asked her applicant about one-third more money for the weekly rental for the dingy, musty, worn front room than she could quite well have taken, thus leaving a margin for the expected come-down. 
but the applicant required various extras here and others there, which ran the rent up considerably above what Mrs. Chickets had asked, and even then, as compared to what the New York detective had been paying for the simple privilege of having a roof over his head and a floor under his feet in his own city, he thought he was housed on quite moderate terms. But what Mrs. Chickets did not know was that if she had asked double what she did for the privilege of entering her front door, it would have been cheerfully paid. But as for Colonel Van der Meulen, alias, and as we will for the present call him Captain West, although the same heart beat within the same frame and the same acute brain worked under the same crown, the outward man was metamorphosed to an amusing and surprising degree. A head of iron-grey hair, well-brushed and fashionably curled, betokened an intimate and very frequent acquaintance with the perruquier's heart, while round about the lower part of his visage, all or most of the growth which nature had implanted there had disappeared, and in its place, with a rapidity which would have put all the advertised air-restoring marvels of commerce to the blush, in the same short space of one day there had sprung a growth upon his upper lip which would have done credit to the application of cosmetics and the cultivation of years. By some apparently phenomenal and rapid physical change in his constitution, the pale, sallow face of the New Yorker had suddenly assumed, as if rejuvenated by the draught of some wondrous elixir, a ruddy and healthful glow. Then, whereas the sight of Colonel Van der Meulen of New York was not only good, but his enemies thought a deal too sharp for their benefit, Captain West found it necessary to keep dangling round his neck by a tiny fine gold chain, or now and again perching upon his nose, a double eyeglass mounted and rimmed in a massive setting of gold. In exchange for the eminently quiet and unpretending style of Colonel Van der Meulen's dress, Captain West appeared usually in a frock coat of a conspicuous mixture of light colours, while his understandings were covered with cloth of a marvellous plaid, in the selection of which good taste never certainly had been allowed to put in a word. To this was added a gaudy necktie, gaiters of spotless white peeping down over his patent leather boots, while this whole magnificent person was ornamented with a profuse wealth of gaudy and costly jewels. Mrs. Chickett's mounted apology upon apology for the inadequacy of her accommodation to the requirements of such a perfect gentleman as Captain West appeared to be, and at the dingy atmosphere of her room, but then, as Mrs. Chickett's said, they were mostly old family things. Doubtless they were old, prematurely aged by Mrs. Chickett's preference for the exercise of her tongue to the labour of her hands. As one day after another wore on, Captain West's principal occupation seemed, as far as Mrs. Chickett's could ascertain, writing in his room, for he seldom left it during the day. But had Mrs. Chickett's been more intimate with the private life of her new lodger, if only indeed as intimate as we are, she would have discovered that Captain West's almost constant employment was the careful study through the medium of a powerful pair of binocular field or opera glasses, apparently of some individual who occupied a house in full view of the captain's window. In the close observation of this individual, whoever he might be, Captain West seemed as alert, as eager, as deeply and intensely interested as a cat or a leopard would have been in watching its prey or as an enthusiastic star-gazer would have been when on the lookout for some expected comet or some lost and errant star. 
after several days of intent observation captain west had grown familiar with all the movements and habits of if we may so express it the daily existence of the lost or wandering star but what seemed to captain west a remarkable thing was that the star never ventured out except at night it is quite true as we all know that stars do commonly appear only at night but then what we are likening to a star here was a human being and the human being only ventured out of doors at night but still by close observation and study through his binoculars apart from what he saw at night captain west became wonderfully familiar with even the internal domestic life if domestic life the living of one man alone in one or two rooms be worthy to be called of his man by day but like the bats and the owls this mysterious individual seemed almost entirely nocturnal in the habits of his life nightly no sooner did darkness set in than he sallied forth and then captain west sallied forth too he usually shadowed his mysterious game into a labyrinth of courts and streets which metropolitan improvements have since wiped away in the vicinity of leicester square and then all shadow or trace for the time being was usually lost another time after this and after having missed the scent and sight of his quarry captain west succeeded in making his way again behind the scenes of the great theatre in leicester square and there in the midst of that strangely motley and miscellaneous assembly human brute and supernatural but still all human would he see the same face the same form that he believed was no other than either still living bertram gonard of vernwood or the mysterious merville garnier whom only seven days before he had believed to be living or pending even twixt death and life in new york strange as it was impenetrable as seemed the mystery of that life the new york detective had no thought that even if others were deceiving him he was labouring under any delusion or that by himself he was being deceived no colonel van der Mulen had too much confidence in his own intelligence for that the sight of merville garnier bertram gonald or whoever he might be in new york and again in london seen with his own eyes assured him as no words of dr Sirius wells or any one else could have assured him that far from being murdered this man was still in life End of section 24section 25 of the heirloom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by joe bergen the heirloom by t duffy lyle the grave but where's the dead When the echoes of all these strange circumstances reached, as they did, Mr. Lumley's ears, as he vegetated in the enjoyment of his late summer holiday at the select watering place of Burlington-on-Sea, it induced him to cut short his period of quietude and repose, and the exemptions and relaxations from the calls of his profession, and the consultations over the broad acres and narrow legal details and other interests of his aristocratic client hell and against his will and not to the mollification of his temper to return to the heated summer atmosphere of town of course when all the reports came to him through dr sirius wells from the latter's transatlantic cousin and confrere colonel van der Mulen, that bertram gonault instead of being dead and buried in england or wales was in the firm conviction of the american detective a living and active existence in New York. Of course, 
the great conveying thing lawyer, superciliously and loftily, pooh-poohed and faw-fawed a great deal of the superfluous breath out of his important and portly body. And as to the idea of Bertram Gonald being among the smaller minority of the living, instead of having been unceremoniously sent over to the great majority of the dead, he laughed the very idea to scorn. Of course he did. But when, a few days afterwards, Colonel van der Meulen had moved his London quarters from the uncomfortably close atmosphere of Craven Street Charing Cross to the somewhat fresher and cooler vicinity between St. John's Wood and the Edgware Road, and the lawyer had arrived in town, van der Meulen not only introduced himself and interviewed the great conveyancer for the first time at Mr. Lumley's office near Lincoln's Inn Fields, and expressed to him his firm conviction, founded on his own ocular testimony, that Bertram Gonald, whose foul murder he was asked to investigate professionally, was not only alive, and by himself had been seen and spoken to in New York, but was now alive and probably pretty well, and at that very moment, under the close and unremitting espionage of himself or his agents in London, Mr. Lumley had no more doubt left in him, but that this New Yorker, uh, Dutchman, Knickerbocker, or whatever he was, thus the lawyer contemptuously spoke of him, whom Dr. Sirius Wells had brought into the investigation of the Vernwood tragedy, was no more nor less than a hopeless monomaniac. Mad! And there very nearly happened at Mr. Lumley's, that which very nearly happened on the top floor landing at Dr. Sirius Wells, namely, for giving sensible Englishmen credit for being such fools. Colonel van der Meulen came very near to being kicked downstairs. But Mr. Lumley's professional etiquette restrained him from this violence, as he would have said absolutely, and in due time Mr. Lumley learnt that he had reckoned without quite knowing his host. Mr. Lumley was an Englishman, and a gentleman, whatever that word may mean, a gentleman bred, reared, educated and taught, not in the rough and ready ways of American life, where men in everything go the nearest way to work, but among the higher grades of English social and patrician society. And he did not quite recognise that there was fully as much cute sense in the head of the practised detective of New York as there was in all his own formal, legal, long-winded phraseology, couched in all the verbal pomposity of choirs and reams of foolscap and brief. No, in due time, Colonel van der Meulen quite satisfied Mr. Lumley that he was not a monomaniac, that his head was screwed on quite as it should be, and that he was very far from being mad. But however much he might despise the American in his heart, the lawyer had too much professional caution not to do all that in him lay to soothe the troubled waters and smooth the passage between this van der Meulen and Dr. Sirius Wells. Therefore, however frigid its atmosphere, Mr. Lumley stepped into the gulf of cool waters which divided the two men asunder. And however much the volcanoes and slumbering subterraneous fires of difference or jealousy might be smouldering underneath, Mr. Lumley succeeded in veneering and varnishing over the breach, so that between the two there came to be no volcanic eruption, no open declaration of war. Mr. Lumley, although a good lawyer, was a confirmed conservative. A British Tory of the old and biased section of the old British Tory school. That it should be so was inevitable, almost, from the connection of his profession, for his connections were almost exclusively of that class, among which the future is less a dream than the glorious historic past. If he was not absolutely of patrician birth, there mingled in the blood which coursed through his veins very much of patrician pride. In the wisdom of his own conceit, Mr. Lumley felt confident and secure. That he should be outwitted, outfooled, outdone by a Yankee was a thing in the which he had no belief. One thing Mr. Lumley, when he came back to town, strenuously vowed, it shouldn't take him many days to convert this American importation into the case. If his ocular testimony could convince him that Bertram Gonault was alive, 
Perhaps the same ocular testimony would convince him that he was dead. Verily, he would show this man how absurdly he was in the wrong. And now, leaving the New York detective in the enjoyment of his own opinion and theory, and Mr. Lumley chuckling to himself that he will put this theory to the test, we will again shift the scenes. At Vernwood, up among the tall beech trees on the hilltop, where they waved their gaunt lean heads in the breezes, and where the yew trees lent their shadows, where a long unbroken silence seemed to reign, and where the snowdrops and the daffodils reared their modest lowly heads, and the avenues of cypress seemed like sombre sentinels to stand by the portals of the dead, and the sere brown leaves lay scattered on the ground, here stood, in solemn solitude and silence, the mausoleum set apart for the internment and resting place of the bodies of those men who from generation to generation bore the, there at least, honoured name of Gunnolf. Here, in the centre of a circular enclosure, surrounded by a tall paling of massive ironwork in what is termed a ring fence, a perfect circle in form, stood a temple, or fane, or freestone, surmounted by a plain dome, which had generations before, like as indeed had the whole burying place, been erected at the cost and direction of someone who at least had the thought for a future home, some long dead and gone go not. Thus, between the fane which stood in its centre and the enclosed circle of land was, on every side of the former, a broad level space of turfed and consecrated ground. The Campo Santo of Vernwood, where might rest, let us hope in peace, the bodies and bones of the honoured of their race. But this Campo Santo, this space of holy earth, although many bodies might have been laid therein, was nearly or quite devoid of graves. Beneath the ground level of the chapel, however, and accessible only by an entrance down a flight of steps in its rear, was an extensive underground vaulted hall or chamber. And here, in numerous niches in the sides of the spacious chamber, some empty, some tenanted, are enclosed in marble sarcophagi, the sculpture on which was more or less inartistic or more or less ornate, here were deposited the coffins and remains of many generations of various sizes and ages, and of both sexes of the dead. Such was the resting place which one of his family, many of whose descendants rested within those dark silent walls, had thought well to erect for the tenancy of the successive generations of his race. But perhaps by the unwillingness of any one of the succeeding masters of Vernwood, either to disturb the resting dead, or perchance to be himself reminded too forcibly of his own ultimate fate, the whole place, its surroundings and vicinity, had fallen into a condition of pitiable neglect, dilapidation and decay. In the Campo Santo, or graveyard, surrounding the chapel, the grass untended grew rank and wild and high, while in the edifice of the mausoleum itself, on every side, great blocks of freestone were becoming loosened and detached by the great fissures in the building, and by reason of frost and neglect were fallen or falling from the external walls. While inside the mortuary chapel itself, and still more in the vaulted chamber in which the dead lay underneath, the hand of time and years of neglect had played havoc with this now doubly desolated resting place of the dead. Unhealthy vapours arose to pollute the air. In great drops the damp trickled down the moss-grown internal walls, while the bat and the owl, the toad and the slow-worm, hung upon the rafters, or nightly hooted weird unearthly music, or crawled or writhed or wriggled upon the slimy, slippery and loathsome floor place it was neither endurable to the living or wholesome even for the dead, and generation after generation had been permitted to run more completely to rack and ruin and decay. Even Bertram Gonault, during his reign, where money was as plenteous as the blocks of ore and spar which he excavated from his mines, which he had opened in those bleak, barren-looking Vernwood hills, even Bertram Gonault, who reformed 
and repaired everything else on which he could find an outlet for the lavishment of his easily gotten gold. Even he had given the place a wide berth, or perhaps, with an attack of that procrastination which had been so fatal, had put it off to another and another and a more convenient and indefinite day. And so this was its condition, when after the last owner of Vernwood's death, Mr. Lumley inspected this horrid, unhealthy catacomb with the view of finding a meet resting place for poor Bertram's remains. But Mr. Lumley perceived at once that this foul charnel den, the abode of the bat, the owl and the slow worm, and the lizard, pervaded with and breeding pestilential air, was a place neither for the living or the occupation even of the dead. The chapel and the vault underneath it were unfit even for the reception of a corpse. And so, to overcome the emergency, and to procure, if even only a temporary descent and healthful resting place for the remains near his own ancestry and kin of the last owner and master of the estate, Mr. Lumley had caused the Campo Santo between the chapel and the high iron palings to be cleared of its wild overgrowth of rank grass and uncomely weeds, and there, into a common earth grave, they had lowered the coffin of Bertram Gonaut. As soon, however, as the High Court of Chancery had placed in the hands of the respectable lawyer the power and discretion to manage the Vernwood property, the complete renovation of the mausoleum with a view to giving a permanent and worthy resting place to Bertrand's remains was one of the first things which occupied Mr. Lumley's mind. And with that remarkable celerity with which money can make the mare go, a posse of workmen and mechanics quickly transformed and metamorphosed the whole aspect of the place. This process of renovation was now complete. The chapel externally and internally, and the vaulted chamber beneath, had been cleared and cleansed. The bats and the owls and the toads had been driven forth, beautiful, nay, almost rebuilt, and in the vaulted chamber a new and costly sarcophagus awaited, the transposal and reception of the late Bertram's remains. Before, however, the temporary grave could be legally reopened or the coffin with its occupant exhumed and removed, an order of permit from the English Secretary of State was required by law. This permit Mr. Lumley had already procured, and now all was only waiting his written order to proceed. This rather lengthy explanation has been necessary to show what Mr. Lumley meant when, amid a setting of somewhat strong language, he vowed he would convince Mr. van der Meulen how absurdly he was in the wrong. If they could show the unbelieving Yankee the coffin and the grave, he thought that would be quite enough to convince him that Bertram Gonault was in his coffin, and not alive either in London or New York. Thus far had matters gone. The permit of the Secretary of State had been procured, and now only the actual work of ceremony of removal of the coffin and body remained. Then Mr. Lumley, not thinking that his own presence was absolutely necessary at the disinterment and removal of the remains, had sent orders to Mr. Price, the managing agent on the estate, to have in readiness a gang of workmen, and be prepared for the removal of the coffin containing the body of Bertram Gonault on a particular date. On the previous evening he dispatched Dr. Sirius Wells with Colonel van der Meulen to arrive at Vernwood and be present when the actual removal of the body took place. The two private detectives accordingly left London, passed the night in the hotel of a country town with an easy distance of the Vernwood estate, and the next morning continued their journey and met Mr. Price, who was accompanied by his men, and all proceeded up the hilly road to where the now cleansed and renovated and beautiful building of the mausoleum stood in the midst of the grove of tall beech trees. The summer had not, on the whole, been one of intensely blazing heat, and the earliest winds of approaching autumn had spread upon the ground a sparsely variegated carpet bed of brown and yellow leaves. They had littered the consecrated ground, and falling thickly over the spot where so few short months before, in a few feet of earth, they had laid all that remained of Bertram Gonault. 
Arrived within the paled enclosure, the workmen proceeded to the spot. They lifted and laid aside the green squares of velvet turf, which so fresh and green, and alas, so soon grows over what is left of us all. They dug down and down into the loose and pulverous mould where they thought their late master had been laid. And there they found... What? They found a tenantless grave. End of section 25section 26 of the heirloom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the heirloom by t dolthy lissell volume 2 chapter 12 blank we have shown, in some of the foregoing chapters, which recount the progress of events chronicled in this story, that the return of the heir of the ruined home at Vernwood to claim his own, his subsequent success in the accomplishment of his suit, and then his enterprise and the discovery and development of the unbounded, and till then unknown or untapped, wealth of the old estate, were all a matter of remark, not to say astonishment far and near throughout the countryside. We have shown that the occurrence of the murder of Bertram Gonault, in all its ghastly surroundings, enveloped in all its profound and apparently impenetrable cloud of mystery, had, in an exaggerated and startling degree, the effect of arousing in a whole section of the surrounding country the highest pitch of consternation, not to say alarm. Had the merest beggar in tatters, a mere degraded atom of the scum of humanity, besotted, downbroken, whom nobody knew, and for whom, except to say that it was as well he was dead, nobody cared, or had the merest debased unholy drab in all her iniquities, had such a one as either of these been found dead by the wayside, assassinated by the murderer's ruthless hand, even then the curiosity and interest, perhaps even here and there the sympathy, of the community would have been aroused. The unclean body would have been accorded at least to Christian burial, if indeed but a pauper's grave, and all the machinery of the law would have been set in motion to avenge the cutting off of even so worthless a life. But here the case was aggravated, intensified a millionfold. A young man, Bertram Gonault, had appeared in England with proof sufficient to satisfy even the scrutinizing, microscopic, exacting eye of the English law that he was the legal, rightful, and lineal descent of an old and honored race, and the real and true heir to a stately ancestral home, far extending acres, and a large estate. Not only had he satisfied the law and substantiated his claim, but he had compelled ranges of apparently barren hills and apparently unprofitable woods, and apparently unproductive acres, from their very depths to produce him for his wants, his necessities, his delectation, for even the wild squandering extravagances of his life, almost boundless wealth. And he had yet further still, which ever exalts a man in the estimation of his neighbors and fellows, he had used, distributed, scattered or squandered, sometimes unwisely, sometimes well, but ever lavishly and unstintingly, the wealth that came to him for the idle pleasures or the solid benefit of other men. And such a man as this, in all his greatnesses, in all his littlenesses, had been mysteriously butchered in cold blood, butchered with a deafness, with a clean, cool audacity of purpose, and his life cut off with a suddenness and in a profound mysteriousness of surroundings, which was appalling even to contemplation and to thought. We have shown that the release of the supposed or imagined assassin of Bertram Gonault, the sole person apparently near when the horrid crime was done, had again raised anew the storm of consternation in the popular mind, which seemed, while the suspected remained in custody, and justice, either justly or unjustly, on the innocent or on the guilty, was likely to claim her own, and the crime avenged, which for a time at least was lulled, had had again the effect of providing for thousands of brains and thousands of tongues unlimited food for talk, conjecture, and thought. 
In the pages that have been written, this has all attempted to be set forth and shown. And then the Burnwood tragedy was sinking into the list of undiscovered and unrequited, unpunishable, if not unforgotten, crimes. But if all the intensest sentiments of wonder, consternation, and alarm had been excited by these events, the disappearance of Bertram Gernalt's body from the grave, if ever indeed in the grave it had been really laid, all past astonishments were as nothing compared to this last and new surprise. And then, on to this, there floated on the Vernwood air, there went from tongue to tongue the strange, vague, mysterious, still more terrifying rumor that Bertram Gernalt was not dead, that all that solemn, sad-faced train of mourners, who, to take a last look, had passed the bier, that those who had followed the coffined body on its last journey past the dower house and up the hilly road to the mausoleum, that all these, in some mysterious way, had been duped, and that Bertram Gernalt no more than once, more than twice, again and again, had been seen alive and identified both in London and New York by a detective who had been employed to dog out the track of crime. Was the owner of Vernwood a magician? they asked. After all, if he were a magician or not, he had performed tricks as wonderful and freaks as wild as that. As the summer waned and faded with a gloom which seemed as if the meteorological conditions were in sympathy with Bertram Gernalt's fate, and autumn seemed to be omitted from the declining year, for days and days search parties scoured the estate. But it seemed the complete, entire, disappearance of the coffin and body from the grave, if there it had ever been, which many doubted, was as profound a mystery as was Bertram Gernalt's death, and as strange and mysterious as much, very much, that happened in his life. Having exposed this new development of the Burnwood mystery, we will return again to another, and previously noticed, aspect of the case. After this blank failure of Mr. Lumley's vow that he would show Mr. van der Mullen how absurdly he was in the wrong, and the blank refusal of even the earth to give up her supposed dead. After waiting one or two days at Vernwood, the two detectives returned to town. Colonel van der Mullen, although he put on a serious face, when once more he found himself alone, chuckled vigorously in his sleeve, inwardly sure that in due time he would succeed in showing a different exposure and solution of the fraud, for a fraud it almost seemed to be in the New York detective's keen eyes. And yet, in those days which he had spent at Vernwood, questioning those who were intimately acquainted with the facts of the case, the mystery seemed to him as profound. It appeared to him even more profound, even as a tank or well, by reflection, appears more profound the longer and more steadily we gaze into its, to us, unfathomable depths. The two men returned to London to their respective quarters. Dr. Sirius Wells, a not too active factor in the case, to his office near Whitehall, while the plain Colonel van der Mullen, once more, by that perfect process of metamorphosis which he seemed to be a born adept, took himself again to Mrs. Cricket's first-floor front drawing-room, completely again transmogrified into the impressive personality of Captain West. But here, for Colonel van der Mullen, a disappointment was in store, for, on attempting to resume his system of espionage on the man whom he had gone so far as to learn to know by the stage name of Lawrence Houghton, it was with a consternation, a chagrin which overcame him, that during those days of absence from London spent at Vernwood, he came soon to learn that, from his old haunts, the said Lawrence Houghton had disappeared. Day by day and night by night, Colonel van der Mullen, or Captain West, frequented both the vicinity of Leicester Square and the house off Maida Vale. But no more sign of this Lawrence Houghton was visible than if he had departed this life. The colonel's mortification at thus missing, perhaps losing sight forever of his man, was intense. We will, however, leave, for a while, Captain West in his puzzling dilemma, in order to trace some other characters whose fates and fortunes have ere now become interwoven with the thread of our tale. End of section 26 Recording by Todd Section 27 of The Heirloom This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caleb Schroeder. The Heirloom by T. Duthie Lyle. Volume 2, Chapter 13 Only a Dog. But in the midst of all this dark obscurity, of all this strange mystery, in the depths of this conflict of words, wherein the great London conveyancy solicitor, and every one else who thought they knew, and contemptuously pooh poohed any contrary statement, when they asserted that the late heir to the Vernwood estate was foully and most mysteriously murdered, ruthlessly butchered and dead, while one of, and probably the ablest and acutest detective that either the American or the European continent could produce, just as strongly asserted. Notwithstanding the New York world's highly flavored report that he had been burnt to a cinder in Long Island City, and his remains reduced to ashes, Colonel Vandermeulen, as we will call him once again, just as strongly asserted that he was alive that since the alleged date of the murder he had been in New York, and that he was now in London, and went so far as to undertake to prove to Mr. Lumley, Dr. Cyrus Wells, or anybody else that Bertram Gonault was still in the flesh. During all these weeks and months of contention, of conflict, of statements, and war of words, what had become of Jules Massey? Yes, what had become of him? Where was he? The faithful black servant who had so nearly fallen a victim to Abraham Briggs, inexperienced and misdirected zeal? Where was he? As Jules Massey is a character in this story, not altogether despicable, and whom we hate not, we will endeavor, although it may be only in a few short sentences, to follow out his course of life. The mental anguish which the poor Jules had experienced when, as we have told the reader, he first discovered his late master's mutilated remains, and after that the prostration which came over him when he, he above all others, he who to save his master's life would have freely given up his own, the deep dark sea of tribulation, into which he was plunged, and upon which he tossed, utterly overwhelmed and engulfed, cannot be written, could not be spoken in words. In charging the grand jury prior to Jules' trial, very truly had the judge spoken when he said that the formalities which a trial of murder involved was a painful ordeal, painful to all concerned. How painful? How more than painful? How terrible, how frightful and ghastly an ordeal it was, perhaps few more truly than the dark man Jules Massey, who had passed through so dark a cloud, had learnt to know. His prostration after the murder, and which succeeded his arrest, seemed to him infinitely profounder darkness than that dark passage of the soul through the valley of the shadow of death. But after all these painful formalities and doubts, Jules once more, as we have shown, was a free man as free as the fowls of the air or the winds of heaven, without cable, without anchor, without attachment, to tie him or hold him to any place in life. His past seemed a great, strange, in many respects a splendid, a glorious, as well as a terrible dream, a dream which, as the sensitized glass of the photographer may be cleansed and the blurred imperfect picture be wiped away, so Jules Massey desired should be swept away, and forever blotted out like some unsightly film from his life. Still, for all this, as there had been the strongest affection for his master, there was now stinging his heart the keenest pangs of regret, the profoundest grief that his master, who seemed to him as the more important part himself, was no more. But it must not be supposed that Jules Massey had been all these years the trusted servant, the paymaster and almoner of a millionaire, and a millionaire of his late master's generosity of heart, and had ended his term of servitude in penury, poverty, or want. By no means, during his master's lifetime, as the late 
Bertram Gonault rose to the zenith of his wealth, and the zenith, such as it was, of his fame, Jules Massey's wage had grown, accumulated and increased, while his wants had been few. He was even palatially housed, luxuriously fed, and his own personal adornment, the satisfaction of his inherent personal vanity, was about the only outlet which he had for the dissipation of his ever-increasing pile. Thus, year after year, Jules Massey, instead of being like many other men, struggling continuously to acquire a competency, fighting to keep the very wolf from the door, was, without any particular effort of his own, except the natural honesty and fidelity of his nature, which was in him, adding, week by week, month by month, year by year, to his store. But now, although imprisonment had been also a terrific blow to his vanity, and Jules' amour propre had received a terrible wound, yet now he walked forth through the world a free and independent and unfettered man. Whither should he turn his steps? For now, all the paths of the world which men travel, north, east, south, west, lay open to his wandering feet. At Vernwood he would not, could not stay, so that the pains of the past might be in some measure mitigated, obliterated, or forgotten by the distractions of the present. He turned his back upon Vernwood, the scene of so much that was terrible to his mind to remember and to contemplate, and so hard to forget, and sought the more busy, distracting world of metropolitan London life. But even here, in the midst of its millions of the human race, he seemed, in a measure, friendless and lost. He recollected years, many years ago now, when, with his last master, he, a mere black slave boy, and his master then almost a penniless exiled wanderer, without so much as one square foot of this world's earth on which to settle his roving foot or to call his own, that they had lodged in a house somewhere in the West End. And this house Massey tried, but tried without success, to find. At last, after various unsuccessful efforts to find the resting place of even a room in the city, where there are so many thousands of luxurious homes, Jules Massey located himself in a small house, in a small street, in that select locality of the great world where there are few small houses and but few small streets. That corner of London, surrounded by so much wealth, between Oxford Street, Park Lane, and Grosvenor Square. But we said, said perhaps rather incorrectly, that Jules Massey was in London friendless and alone, and, humanely speaking, this was so, as alone as a man can be in a great busy hive, or tossing on the wide sea of London life, but he was not alone absolutely, as he had one friend. When Jules Massey left Vernwood, or rather when he quitted the vicinity of Vernwood, after his acquittal of the capital charge, and by which time the management of the Vernwood estate, and all that appertained thereto, had by the order of the High Court of Chancery passed into Mr. Lumley's hands. The black steward and the valet of the landowner had made to Mr. Lumley one request, and that request was that he might have as companion, and take under his especial care, the great Mount St. Bernard dog, Monk, although, for that matter, the great dog had conclusively proved that he was quite as able to take care of Jules Massey as Jules Massey was to take care of him. To this request, Mr. Lumley, knowing that the dog would be in the best hands and sensibly affected by the touching incident, which we have noticed in connection with Jules Massey's arrest, readily and willingly agreed. And so, in his otherwise solitary London existence, Monk was still Jules Massey's friend, the link which seemed to unite him with the past, and thus Jules did not feel quite utterly alone. If Monk did not share the dark man's bed, he shared his lodging, and he shared his board. And night by night, a vigilant watcher, he rested on the matted or carpeted floor to welcome his human friend and keeper with a look of canine recognition as soon as the morning broke, or to rest his great lion-like head on Jules's knee, 
or on the table, gazing wistfully and patiently in the dark face as Jules partook of his morning meal. Often during the day, or in those autumn afternoons, the black man might have been seen. A conspicuous and noticeable figure among the crowd of pedestrians and passers and loungers who frequent Oxford Street, Regent Street, and the thoroughfares adjacent to his temporary home, always well, even fashionably, and elaborately dressed. His well-cut clothes, his somewhat haughty hair, all the more noticeable in connection with the ebon blackness of his skin. Or, in the inseparable pair, the black man and the great dog might have been seen together in the less frequented walks of Kensington Gardens or Hyde Park. If Jules Massey's pride had sustained a terrible wound, a blow that had brought the deep-seated vanity of his nature to the ground, it showed itself certainly not in a neglect of the careful elaboration of the external man, but that which attracted more public notice even than the well and carefully dressed person of Jules Massey, his fashionably cut, scrupulously neat attire, the gold-headed cane that he dangled and swung so deftly in his delicately gloved hand, the ebon blackness of his face, or, to please the dictates of good taste, his almost too profuse display of jewels, that which was even an object of greater remark and astonishment and admiration than the man. Was the curiosity excited by the sight of the great lounging lion-like dog? If a dog indeed it at all was, which some none too learned in canine stories seemed to doubt, which followed through the crowd, even within a short distance of the black man's heels. Dogs of the St. Bernard breed have only been imported into England during the last twenty or thirty years, and at the period of our story any dogs of this magnificent race were far more rare in England, and would be far more the object of admiration and astonishment than they had since become, and even more than the well-dressed darky, as they called him, the enormous, tawny, lion-like beast with his massive head, his intelligent countenance, and the careless, shambling, loose-jointed appearance of his walk, as he ever kept within an easy distance of his master's heels, was, as he passed along the crowded London streets, the butt of continuous running fire of popular wonder and remark. Many times was Jules offered tempting sums of money for the right to possess this canine curiosity, or prize. But even if Monk had been strictly speaking his own property to dispose of, which he was not, Jules Massey would as soon have thought of selling his head from off his shoulders, with all its abundance of well-oiled, well-perfumed, well-brushed little curls, as he would have a thought of exchanging the great dog for gold. For sagacity and fidelity, for the picturesque appearance, for their great size, strength, docility of temper, and general physique, and above all for the splendid services which, from time immemorial, they have rendered to man the race of dogs of which this splendid specimen was a scion, and which derive their appellation from the hospice of St. Bernard in the Alps, have behind them an ancestral record which is without its equal in the chronicles of the canine story. Whatever travellers or visitors to the hospice of St. Bernard may have been informed to the contrary, the origin of this magnificent race of dogs is so far enveloped in the obscurity of the past centuries, even by the holy fathers of the order themselves, it is not known. The monks at the hospice may point you to a portrait of Bernard de Menthon, its founder at a date some nine hundred years ago, in which the originator of the order is represented as accompanied by a large dog of the bloodhound type, and whatever lights this may throw upon the tradition, if it throw any lights at all, it shows that for generations and centuries these dogs have occupied such an indispensable place, and played so important a part in the life at the monastery, that without the aid of its dogs the functions of the religious fraternity, in their work of rescue, charity, and mercy must cease, without its dogs the peculiar work and existence of the monastery of St. Bernard could not continue to exist. 
According to another tradition of the monastery, its race of dogs descends from Parisian Mastiff and the Danish Hound. But this, too, is only tradition, and the sum of the total knowledge of the more remote and ancient history of the St. Bernard dog is that next to nothing concerning it is known. Be that as it may, we may say for the uninitiated that the original race of these dogs in the great snowstorm of 1812 were so constantly called into requisition in rescuing lost or imperiled travelers that, through great numbers perishing in the snowstorms of the Alps and by the fall of avalanches, there was brought about an almost total annihilation and extinction of the race. It may be explained that in the work of rescuing lost travelers who may be crossing the Alps by the Aosta and Martigny Road in winter and overtaken by storms and buried in the snow, except in times of pressing emergency, only the male dogs and those individuals conspicuous for bodily strength, endurance, and intelligence are employed. Two pair of these dogs in company, one old and one young, leave the hospice of St. Bernard daily. One couple goes towards the last refuge about nine miles from the monastery on the Italian side towards Aosta, while the other couple take, similarly, the opposite or Swiss side of the Alps toward Martigny, and although the snow may have fallen to a great depth, thus obliterating every trace of the way, so unerring is their instinct that they are seldom known to deviate scarcely so much as a yard from the path. Each couple of dogs travel as far as the most distant cabin of shelter, which the monks erect for the protection of the travelers. The dogs enter the huts, and if they find any traveler taking shelter within the cabin, he is, by their mute solicitations, invited to follow them to the hospice. Or should that not be possible, or should a traveler be overtaken by the storm and buried, if even deeply, in the drifts, he is, as far as the dogs can accomplish it, kept alive or revived by licking or otherwise imparting the warmth of their own bodies to the dying or unconscious man, till they can communicate with the monks at the hospice, who immediately set out, well provided, with means of relief, to spot where the traveler has succumbed. The dogs are always sent on their saving errands of mercy in pairs, the young dog being the pupil of the old. We offer no apology for these remarks on the origin, history, traits, or duties among his native surroundings of this noble race of dogs. They are as docile and mild-tempered as they are magnanimous, intelligent, and physically brave and strong. We have said, when we first introduced the great dog, Monk, into the story, which these pages record, that he was a choice selection, actually born at the hospice either purchased there by Bertram Gonault, or presented to him by the prior at the monastery in return for one of those outbursts of princely generosity in which the late owner of Vernwood not infrequently indulged. It matters not which, for buying the animal and having it presented in return for money is one and the same thing, and being so nearly related to the dogs of the purest breed. There was implanted within him all the striking instincts and characteristics of his race. We have intimated that Jules Massey was in London after the Vernwood tragedy, when London life was becoming comparatively dull, and during the months of the waning year. The summer, although with intervals of intenser heat and brightness, had, as in England sometimes come to us, on the whole been fitful, ungenial, and cold. Those who claimed to be weather-wise, the prophets of the sunshine and the storm, said there was an autumnal summer in reserve. But this prophecy proved not to be verified by the fact, for, as the last months of summer drew towards a close, it became more and more evident that autumn was to be a season, the charm of whose soft delightful stillness was to be as if well-nigh blotted out, as if altogether absent from the year. The seaside resorts became bleak and cold, while damp and drenching mists came heavily down, enveloping in impenetrable fogginess the Scotch and northern moors. 
Men and women, those fortunate ones who move about at the caprices of their own fancy dictates, were doubtful whether to locate by sea or lake or shire or shore or town. And in the midst of this, when notwithstanding the ungenial aspect of the world beyond, those London livers, who at least pretend to follow the ton, began to draw down their blinds and tacitly tell to the world the transparent fib that they were not at home. Jules Massey began to feel that London world around him was becoming, to a gentleman of his independence, unendurably slow. And thus there dawned upon him the pleasing enlightenment that he too would be benefited by some change. But whither should he turn? Either to hold him hither, or attract him thither, he, Jules Massey, was minus either anchor to hold him or lodestone to attract him in life. And then all at once, as if by some inscrutable desire, one of those inspirations which come upon us such subtly that we wot not whence they are, unless of heaven-born, he made his resolve he would revisit Vernwood. Yes, he would revisit Vernwood notwithstanding all the terrible past. The past was past. If he had nothing to hope for from a visit, he had certainly no fear to apprehend. Why should he fear? He had done his duty to his master in the eyes of God, and his conscience smote him by the tacit reproach of not so much as one single condemning word. But he resolved not to go to Vernwood direct. It was with due consideration and due mature cogitation within a few days of arriving at his resolution that, with the great dog Monk still as his companion, Jules Massey alighted at the situation of a country town within about six or seven miles of Vernwood Estate, his old home. His appearance at a locality where he was well known caused perhaps some curiosity, perhaps some little surprise, that morbid curiosity of the vulgar, to see the possessor of a name which has been on every tongue. As he had left London at no unconscionably early or inconvenient hour, poor Jules was now his own independent master and could regulate his own hours, it was late in the day when he arrived at his journey's end, and he made up his own mind to sleep at a small quiet hotel where he was known, intending to walk over to Vernwood in the early part of the following day. But Jules Massey had not alighted for the train so much as half an hour, ere more than once he was accosted, and the strangest, most ghastly rumors reached his ears. The body of the late Bertram Gannolt had disappeared from, had not been suffered to rest even where all others may hope for some rest, even within the quiet of the grave, and rumor went still further than that, and asserted that the master of Vernwood was not even dead, that he had been seen, recognized, identified beyond dispute in London, and before that in New York, by a certain detective or police agent who had been deployed to investigate the cause. Such was the tenor of the sinister rumor which Jules Massey was compelled to hear. Would the marvels of the mysterious episode never cease? Would the bright air of Vernwood never be cleared of so dark a reproach? There were those who said, At what wild impossibilities will the superstitious and illiterate and ignorant, or the malicious and envious minded not assert, that the whole tragic drama which had befallen this young hare-brained American, or whatever he was, was not but one gigantic hoax, a cruel and stupendous farce, a, and a fraud on the fidelity of a community which had loyally devoted its allegiance to an ancient and honored name. And that evening, as he waited in town where he was passing the night, Jules Massey, from one and another, a patch here and a piece there, joining all together, got to hear the whole fabric of the incredible story. The weather, which, as we have said, for weeks and months had been unseasonable, became, as Jules Massey left London, intensely and abnormally bleak and cold, and as, for the black man, whose physical constitution was better adapted to endure an African summer or the humid heat of the swamps and rice fields of his native Virginia or Maryland, 
the cold searching northeasters of a rigorous and uncertain English climate in one of its most rigorous and uncertain moods seemed to chill him to the very bones, and when he awoke and looked forth on the morning on which he intended walking over to Vernwood, to Jules Massey's most intense discomfiture as well as chagrin, it was upon what we called a white world. The snow had fallen deeply during the night, and with that quiet, preserving continually, which we sometimes witness, the large white feathery flakes came steadily, 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 all day, unceasingly, with their easy flowing motion through the air. All day this kept on, and the black man kept indoors. Nothing could entice him from the comfort of a warm hotel room. By the following morning, however, the falling had ceased, and Jules Massey, on putting his dark face outside the door, found that the intense cold which he had experienced previous to the snowfall had changed into a soft, genial, almost balmy and spring-like warmth of air. The house roofs and bent branches of the trees were heavily weighed with their pure white load, while in the streets that abnormal silence seemed to reign, as feet of men and wheels of vehicles moved noiselessly over the deep, white, soft cushion-like bed. So Jules resolved to delay no longer, and having procured some kind of vehicle, was driven over to his master's old home to Vernwood. Yes, once again, he was driven along the old road. Who can tell what were Jules Massey's meditations as he was driven along that road where so many times he had passed in his days of high estate, where so few months before he had been last driven in that dreaded custody of the law, and where now once more he drove along it, that which in his heart he had ever known himself to be, a guiltless, blameless man. He entered the gate to the grounds by David Blackham's cottage or chalet, and alighted and entered the cottage to meet Mrs. David Blackman his old sympathetic friend and hostess. She greeted him as if nothing, as far as he was concerned, had transpired, but there was a dark, blank, gloomily inquiring expression which spoke more than volumes of uttered words upon her face. Oh, lo, the poor dear soul, she said as the overwhelming feelings of her heart overflowed. Now they've been and took and robbed and out of his very grave, the dear and when she went over the whole story in the same language, in the same sad, sorrowing, serious tone, and law they do say, Mr. Massey, how do the poor dear is actually alive? Law, did you ever hear of such a thing? Find the body? Lord bless it, no, Mr. Massey, she continued to reply in question from Jules. They've been searching high and low and can't find the sign of the poor creature neither dead nor alive here, neither body nor soul. Lo, Mr. Jules, I'm that fearful to go to bed of a night for fear I should see his spirit. And my old man David, see he to me, says he, don't be such a moony. They won't even see no spirit. If allowed the fling of her tongue, how long the good woman would have gone on in this strain, it is very difficult to relate. But after listening for some time patiently to this apparently endless volubility of Mrs. David Blackman's tongue, Jules Massey tore himself away and left the chalet. As for Monk, he seemed quite familiar and at home, and walked about his old quarters with the air of a dog, who felt he was monarch of a good deal of what he surveyed. Then Jules Massey left the chalet and walked along the carriage drive through the shrubberies in the direction of the mansion, through the deep snow. He passed the stale yard, taking the same road that we have described him to have sauntered on the night of the murder underneath the leafy canopy of the small trees, and the unclouded light of the summer moon that never-to-be-forgotten night of his life. But between then and now, not everything was changed. Vernwood was still beautiful but it was like a picture of beauty painted by some other hand. Where then the zephyrs sighed amid the summer foliage, or wrought a gentle rustle among the leaves, now the cold bleak blasts whistled shrilly, 
about the denuded branches, and thus, phenomenally early in the season, the snow lay a deep and spotless waste of unsullied purity, untrodden upon the ground. Then he reached the wide lawns which glistened calmly in the bright morning sunshine, outvying the marble statuary in the unsullied purity and whiteness, a smooth and solitary expanse through which there rolled the broad and silent wintry river, clear and cold. All seemed silent, solitary, and sad, except here and there a blackbird hopping over the snow or a startled moorhen by the stream. All silence reigned. There was neither sight nor sound of animal or human. Then he came in sight of the mansion, every window of which was closely boarded up, and over all there seemed to brood, in Jules Massey's eyes at least, notwithstanding the bright sunshine and the glistening snow, a gloom and sadness which weighed heavily down upon his soul. Towards the fatal chamber in which he had passed the last evening of his life at Vernwood, he scarcely ventured, he scarcely dared lift his eyes. Then led on by that inscrutable influence which seemed to direct his steps as if by guidance of some unseen power, leaving the mansion to his right, he passed, by way of the iconic bridge, over the cold, chill stream, his feet at every step sinking deeply into the snow. But overcoming his repugnance to the discomfort, he still kept on between the white, wintry, silent, snow-clad woods and up the hilly road, for somehow that irrepressible spell seemed to rest upon him, and whose influence seemed to impel him, and who dictates he could only but follow like some leading spirit, who behests he must obey, and whose invisible hand seemed ever by its beck to call on him. In the old days Jules wore shoes which in quality and appearance would have been no disgrace to Her Majesty's drawing-room, and he would as soon have thought of soiling them by such a walk. As he would have thought, on that cold wintry day of wading through the broad chill stream. But, to-day true, he had clad himself a little more after the prudence of a man who knows he must wade through depths of driven snow. Still he struggled and floundered on. Up the steep woodland road for still the irrepressible desire, that same desire which had drawn him from his London lodgings, seemed to attract him once more to be near where he— the master whom he had at heart so devotedly beloved, should lay. If he could not be near him in life, if he could not hear his voice, if he could not minister to his desires, the faithful fellow felt, could he not look upon the place where he should rest in death? Oh, all the past with all its sweet and bitter recollections seemed to roll back upon him with a doubly engrossing and doubly potent hand. At last he had fought his way through the deep drifts till he reached the bleak hilltop, where the tall groves of beech trees stood, now looking taller, gaunter, lanker, as they bowed their nude and leafless heads, and the dark foliage of the evergreen yew trees and the avenues of cypress looked still darker, still more solemn in the unsullied whiteness of the ground. The wintry snow-clad solitude in the beech grove was supreme, broken only by the chirrup of a half-starved redbreast, who seemed to heed with curious and inquisitive eye an intrusion on the reigning silence of his cheerless, leafless, still domain. Then Jules Mazzy came to the mausoleum. The renovated fane in the midst of the circling iron fence seemed to rear itself like the thing of beauty in the midst of the unbroken solitude and silence of the grove and above the many generations of the resting dead. Dank and loathsome as it once had been, it looked now beautiful as it was, a place worthy of the reception of the sainted dead. The consecrated enclosure on every side was fenced by the high pawlings of massive iron, the only entrance to which was made securely fast, and inside the enclosure, like the world around, the ground was hidden by its snowy, hall of spotless, undisturbed, untrodden white. Over this, and through the woods, there reigned a silence which was impressive, complete, 
supreme, there was a stillness in the air which seemed to refrain from shaking ever so little as a snowflake to the ground, and, through the surrounding woods, was an unbroken atmospheric calm. Surely it seemed to Jules Massey, as he stood there in the solitude of the wintry grove, a fit resting place for the dead. Then his thoughts wandered back to the past. Even in halcyon days, where springtimes bloomed, or when summer in its gladsome music smiled, he had seldom, if ever, approached the spot. Was it because any sentiment of dead affected his superstitious mind? He knew not. He could not answer the question even to himself. Then he mused over the master whom he had so faithfully tended and served, even to the end. But not, not to the end. Oh, how a thousand times he had regretted. But it was a vain, a lost regret, that he had ever left his master's bedside for that fatal half-hour of that fatal night. In the midst of these sad reflections, a faint sound, which brought him to himself, seemed faintly, indistinctly, to fall upon his ear. Then it came again, something like a far-off wail through the all-pervading stillness of the surrounding woods. Then, suddenly, for the first time, Jules Mazzy, on looking around, on collecting his thoughts, became aware that his companion Monk was nowhere to be seen. He called, he whistled, but no Monk, as usual, came at his call. Then Massey listened intently. Again from some far-off distance, the same sound reached him, came floating to him faintly, faintly, through the stillness of the wintry morning air. Can you imagine to yourself, reader, the hunted fugitive slave as he lurks in the swamp, straining every nerve to discover the baying of the bloodhound on his trail, whose fatal instinct must bring him back to slavery, to the lash, hound him perhaps to very death. It was somewhat in this way Jules Massey strained every power of hearing within him to catch the direction of the sound of what seemed like the distant baying of a hound. Now, as some light current of air wafted the music to him, it was more distinct, then again scarcely audible at all, now again more inaudible and remote. At last, after several minutes of intense, attentive listening, Jules came to the conclusion that the repeated sounds proceeded from a distance beyond where he stood. Where was a deep range of rock and woodland far away beyond? on the other side of the mausoleum. Then, as he moved away in that direction, the deep occasional bay now, unmistakably that of a dog, became more and more clearly distinct. Following the direction from whence came the sounds, Jules Massey sometimes walked, sometimes fought and struggled, and floundered on through the deep snow. Leaving the mausoleum behind him, he commenced to descend the hill, on the opposite side to Vernwood Mansion, opposite that up which he had lately toiled. The country beyond was a wild, rocky, wooded, sequestered part of the estate, where great fallen crags and boulders, fantastic moss-covered rocky, deep glens, and the roar of foaming cataracts went, especially in the summertime, to form a peculiarly weird, wild, and impressive natural scene. But clothed in its wintry pall of white, we may again liken it to a picture of beauty drawn by some other hand. He had proceeded in this direction about a quarter of a mile when the tracks of his great paws in the freshly disturbed snow, as well as the now distinct and frequent sounds of the deep-mouthed bay, indicated beyond a doubt that it was the voice of his companion, Monk, that now and again broke the impressive silence of the dell. Monk seldom had much to say, even to his keeper. His intelligence, his love for jewels, his delight or displeasure, were greatly expressed tacitly by his peculiarly expressive face, or by his almost equally expressive tail. It was only on great occasions that Monk deigned to make himself unmistakably heard. And what could be the cause of his present unusual outbursts, Jules could not conceive. Still, down through the rough woods covered with snow, 
which he shook down upon him from the boughs as he caught them to save himself, as he slid down the rough, wooded, declivitous descent, now sinking waist-deep into the snow, now standing on firm, rocky ground, Jules led always, and directed by the deep, powerful, frequent baying of Monk, fought his way. Then at length, at the bottom of the deep ravine, some forty feet below him, Jules Mazzy saw in the midst of a great pit that the dog had dug out with his paws, still working with all his might, tearing off great roots of trees in the intensity of his excitement, now struggling with his claws and paws, now tearing with his teeth the great white and tawny body of the dog. Monk had scratched away the deep snow which had fallen and drifted to a depth of many feet along the boulders, and between the two perpendicular fences of rock which formed a deep and narrow kind of cavern or glen. He was dragging and tugging with his whole strength at some object before him, now pulling this way, now hauling that, now and again giving vent to his feelings in that long, loud wail or bay which had led Jules to the spot. But Jules Mazzy almost trembled with fear. He stood there shaking like an aspen leaf, as from the rock above upon which he stood, he was near enough to distinguish that object which Monk was exerting his utmost power to drag among the debris of the rock and earth and snow into the daylight was not but the body of his late master, Bertram Gnault. Jules Mazzy, as he stood there alone watching the dog, was too paralyzed, too terror-stricken to act. He could only gaze upon the operations of the mighty dog with a terrified, vacant stare. As for Monk, all the traditional attributes and instincts and powers latent, though slumbering, of his race seemed aroused to awaken, to revive within him. Whatever may be said of the influence of the first sire, or of the influence of continuous culture upon race, all the attributes seem to be at least inherent and revived in that noble brute. He had brought the dead man's face again to the light of day. Now by licking and fawning he sought to revive and rekindle in that cold corpse the extinct spark of life. Then he laid his great body across the body of the dead. Then he fawned. Then he whined. Then he caressed. Then again he gave vent to his long, deep, baying howl. O oh, monk, thy heart is big. But thou knowest not that he was man, that unlike thyself, in that poor body in which thou wouldst again were life, there was a soul that shall never die. Unlike thou art, he was a man. He had an inner greater being, which thou in all the greatness of thy heart, the affection of thy fidelity, thou canst not know, and which in thy wondrous instinct an instinct surpassing even in some sort the intelligence of man, thou canst not perceive. End of Volume 2 End of Section 27「For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heirloom by T. Duthie Lyle Volume 3, Chapter 1 The Lost Heirloom After the startling and ghastly discovery and disclosure which had been made by the noble dog Monk, the inborn instinct of the dog thus showing itself in its way, as it not seldom does, more than a match for the intelligence of man, to say that the shock which the perhaps somewhat delicate phlegmatic physical and mental organization of the negro-born Jules Massey sustained at the ghastly disinterment of the remains, to say that Jules Massey was well nigh as downstricken as when only a very few months before, on the fatal night of the murder, he was when he had been the discoverer of his late murdered master's body, would perhaps be no exaggeration of the fact. For some minutes, as Jules stood on the jutting rocky crag beneath which the body lay, the dark man was like one rooted to the ground, 
while the great and noble dog was all the while using his utmost exertions to unearth and free the corpse from its surrounding mass of dirt and rocky debris and drifted snow. With feet and teeth he scratched and tore with all his not insignificant strength, then with the warmth of his own body, or licking the dead man's face and hands, again would he labor, with the wondrous instinct so deeply seated in his nature, to reanimate, to cause the warm blood again to course through that now cold frame of the dead, and then, standing his forepaws on the dead body of his late master, would he throw back his great head in the air and give expression to his desire by, at intervals, venting it in long, loud, deep-mouthed bays, or, like as he did on the night of the murder, one long-drawn melancholy howl, which echoed weird and strangely through the deep still woods and rocky glens, now slumbering so noiselessly and silently, so motionless beneath their unsullied pall of spotless untrodden snow. For some minutes Jules Massey gazed at the spectacle before his eyes, then, without attempting to touch or remove the body, without even calling off the dog, with that same sickness of heart which he had experienced on the discovery of the murder, and which the more tender-hearted and inexperienced of us feel at the sight of some horrid form of death, Jules Massey turned away. Perhaps there are those who would say that Jules Massey was a coward, and perhaps at that moment he was, for there are circumstances which are so full of dread that they make cowards of us all. And perhaps, too, cowardice, like heroism, is an anomalous thing, for perhaps cowardice as the world names it is bold, and while there are soldiers, for the soldier is supposed to be the personification of heroism, who would not flinch or fear in the midst of battle, in the belching flame and thunder of artillery, of death and ruin and carnage, yet would shrink from the perpetration of a dastard act or the utterance of an unholy word, and whose fearless heart would quail before a woman's reproach or be melted by a child's tear. So, without attempting to remove the body of his late master, without approaching nearer to it than the crag above it on which he stood, Jules Massey turned away. He floundered and struggled again up through the snow-covered woods, now more than waist-deep in some accumulated drift, now thrown lengthways on his face as he blundered over some snow-hidden boulder or obstacle which lay concealed beneath the snow in his path, groaning in the very utter discomfort of his body, and overwhelmed in the agony of his soul. At last he reached where he struggled on to a more familiar footing, and in the vicinage of the mausoleum was on surer ground. Then on past the dower house, he sometimes ran, sometimes floundered, blundered, and fell, then down the hilly road, either by running or falling, making the best of his way, till he came to where, in the direction from the mansion, opposite to David Blackman's chalet, some laborers were hewing timber in the woods, and to these men he imparted what he had seen, directing them to go direct and inform Mr. Price, whose residence was some distance away, and who was, as already stated, factor on the estate. Of course, the news of the recovery of the body of the late master of Vernwood flew far and wide and on every tongue. Meanwhile, as fast as the horse's legs which that morning brought him to Vernwood would take him back from whence he came, Jules Massey returned to the town, and then, as fast as electric wires could be made to convey the message, Mr. Lumley was informed that the late Bertram Gonneau's body had been found. Jules Massey spent another unhappy night in the country inn, and by the following afternoon he was joined by Mr. Lumley from London, accompanied by Colonel van der Mulen and Dr. Sirius Wells. And then Jules Massey related to them the whole ghastly minutiae of what had taken place. Without further delay, through a warmth of atmosphere which was as genial as that of spring, and which converted the ground beneath their horses' feet, which the day before was deep snow, into depths of yellow mud, and caused the drippings of melting snow to fall like a shower of great drops of rain from the overhanging branches of the trees, 
the four men again drove over to Vernwood with all speed. The carriage passed into the grounds, and then over the Ionic Bridge, and away up to the mausoleum. Some men, laborers on the estate, those who had known and loved Bertram Gonneau in life, were loitering about the place. But on every face there had settled that sad, blank, downcast, woe-begone air, a spirit of inexpressible gloom and sadness seemed to reign throughout that death-haunted grove. In reply to questions from Mr. Lumley, as they drove up to the circular enclosure, the loiterers pointed to the building of the mausoleum. They pointed, for their hearts were too full to express such sentiment in words. The entrances to the mausoleum chapel were opened or unfastened, and then silently, reverently, the London lawyer followed the two detectives, and Jules Massey, with a feeling almost of revulsion, entered the beautiful and renovated fane. All within, without, around, was as perfectly the place of cleanliness and renovation and order as, before its restoration, it had been the charnel house of unhealthy vapors and unclean beasts, and all that was too loathsome even for the proximity even of death and there, on a raised, improvised catafalque, which Mr. Price had caused to be hurriedly erected before the altar, in the same coffin in which he had previously been interred, but now cleansed of the dirt and mire, in the fine linen and spotless napery of the grave, rested the remains of what was once Bertram Gonneau. With a melancholy, with a depressing gloominess of soul which cannot be expressed, Mr. Lumley and his companions gazed once more on the resting face of the dead. Whether it was the preservative influence of the atmosphere, those sunless weeks and cold days during which Bertram Gonneau had lain in the grave, whether it was the partial process of embalming which the body had undergone almost immediately after death, or whether it was the inexorable hand of that providence or fate which seems in one form or another ever to point to the assassin's trail, we cannot tell. But whatever it may be, the face and features of the dead, of Bertram Gonneau, as he lay there in death, were strangely, wonderfully, almost fearfully unchanged from their aspect in life. There was the intellectual face, the sparse locks of hair, the well-trained mustaches, the scar on the right cheek, indelible even in death. And as the incredulous American detective gazed silently, and for once awe-stricken on that face, he perhaps for the first time, then and not till then, believed that Bertram Gonneau was actually dead. The long, white, bony hand rested across the bosom of the dead, shrunken perhaps, but apparently as yet almost untouched by what is perhaps the most loathsome influence on humanity, that abhorrent influence of decay which tells us so plainly that we are but dust a silence that was awful and impressive seemed to pervade and bow down the spirits of the four men, as side by side they stood over that restful bier. And then suddenly, as if moved by some thought which arose in his mind, Mr. Lumley turned to Jules Massey. When he lay in the hall of the mansion, before burial, had he not on the ring? Mr. Lumley asked. That was so, Mr. Lumley, Jules Massey replied, "'That was so. I know it was so.' And as Jules Massey spoke, his eyes welled over with tears, hot burning tears. "'Then what became of it? Was it buried with the corpse?' "'Dunno, Mr. Lumley. Suppose it must have been buried when Massa was,' Jules replied in the same sorrowful, choking tone." We may mention here that Jules Massey, at the time immediately succeeding the murder, although in custody as a suspect only, but not a convict, had, by his own desire and Mr. Lumley's influence and intercession, when his late master lay in state, as we have described in the great Vernwood Hall, been, by the police authorities, permitted the favor of looking a last look on his late master's face. Indeed, Jules Massey's great desire to be allowed this favor had, in the eyes of many impartial judges, a strong appearance in his favor in the case. 
when these few words which in an undertone passed between mr lumley and jules massey fell upon and were overheard by the quick ear of colonel van der Mulen, who was standing near them perhaps neither the one nor the other perhaps neither jules massey nor mr lumley remarked the quick bright ray of intelligence which flitted across we may say lit up the almost stupid heavy stolidity of the new york detective's dutch or german face for it was a face which the light of intelligence seemed to so ill become that all brightness sat upon it with an unbecoming it seemed almost an unwelcome grace having viewed the chapel and the dead the four visitors proceeded then to the spacious vaulted chamber beneath like the mortuary chapel above the vaulted catacombs beneath were now beautified by no untasteful hand around the walls in their niches could be seen deposited the coffins of the dead but now in a suitable position hewn from a block of costly parian marble fresh and new from the sculptor's hand stood one the one untenanted urn one sarcophagus the most beauteous resting place of all lay open and uncovered its richly hewn lid upraised awaiting the reception of its coming occupant in death we need not particularize we need not write minutiae here it must be enough that we follow the general thread and tenor of our tale but all that and part of the following day mr lumley remained at or about or in the vicinity of vernwood in a sorrowful serious mood superintending its affairs and then at last the final ceremony in the presence of the lawyer and those who accompanied him and a few others was performed from the mortuary chapel where it had lain since its discovery by the dog monk the body in the oaken coffin was again removed to the solemnity and silence of the spacious chamber beneath and committed to its final resting place on earth in its costly marble urn and there let us hope to rest till that day and hour which as a thief in the night shall come when knoweth no man and shall echo through the world the blast of that mighty trump which we are told shall sound to the awakening even of the very dead and till the coming of that day they laid to rest the mortal remains of bertrand honor Gonneau. four sad silent sorrowing men mr lumley sirius wells van der Mulen, and jules massey immediately after the final disposal of the dead returned to town each heart seemed too deeply weighed down too deeply impressed with the incidents of the last few days to be exuberant of words the day had long closed when they alighted at that metropolitan terminal station of that which is the great modern iron road of travel from western english shires and here they parted mr lumley to that richly appointed mansion which the great conveyancing lawyer condescended to honour by the name of home one of those massively constructed houses at lancaster gate jules massey returned to lodgings in the small house of which in the locality there are few small houses between oxford street park lane and grosvenor square while colonel van der Mulen went to a small hotel in westbourne grove there in the fresh light that had come to him to review if it were possible to comprehend to draw into the one focus of his brain the divergent rays of so unintelligible and weighty a case end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of the heirloom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the heirloom by t dothy lyle volume three chapter two the seal of the dead left to himself and his own devices and reflections in the westbourne grove hotel where he took up his temporary abode and perhaps left above all to the inspiring influences of his twenty-cent weed which seemed to be ever between his teeth it took colonel van der Mulen, who while he was awake his mind was ever alert 
not many hours to recast, remould, and mature his plans. With the acumen of a man, with the faculty born of probing to their depths, the well-springs of human actions, human motives, and human affairs, in their most complicated entanglements, he had reviewed, now surely with different eyes, all the facts of this mysterious case, a case in the which he seemed to unravel, to eliminate, to divide the unreal from the real, seemed to sift, like wheat from chaff, the genuine from the sham, with that unerring sagacity which had placed his name and reputation in the work of his chosen calling on the pinnacle of eminence upon which it stood. It was only on the day following the arrival in town from Vernwood, the day following the committal to their place of final earthly rest of the remains of the late Bertram Ganneau, that Colonel van der Meulen waited on the great conveyancer, Mr. Lumley, at his office, which we have so often had to mention, near Lincoln's Inn Fields. Although, rather strangely, not much discussion had been entered into at Vernwood as to the fact it was patent that the late Bertram Ganneau had not only been mercilessly murdered, bereft of life, but that his corpse had actually and ruthlessly at some time or other even been stolen from its resting place in the very grave. At what time this last act of desecration had been committed on the murdered man's remains, for how long or for how short a time the body had been suffered to rest undisturbed even in his temporary grave, nor how long it had lain hidden beneath the autumn leaves and debris of the forest gorge, there was hardly a shred of evidence definitely to prove. All this there was nothing to show. It might not have been allowed to lay for twenty-four hours in its legitimate grave. None, as far as the outward world knew, none could tell. But we can acknowledge the workings of an unseen power in all things, and probably had not the latent sagacity of the dog monk, with an instinct more powerful than human intelligence, been led to the discovery of the remains, as far as man's wisdom could lead him, the body might have been forever lost, and the sin been one other added to the category of undiscovered crimes. But that was not to be, such is not the way of heaven in its dealings with those who have stained their hands with human blood. It was some time during the day following that the American detective called on Mr. Lumley, and the two men entered into a somewhat more exhaustive discussion of the circumstances of the theft of Bertram Gonneau's body from the grave, and as well also of his previous violent death, for of course Colonel van der Mullen could now no longer have a doubt left upon his suspicious and incredulous mind that the true Bertram Gonneau was dead, and although probably he did not tell Mr. Lumley all he thought, the New York private detective had a shrewd suspicion that although there might be enigmas in it which he could not yet fathom fully, yet on the whole he saw through all the semi-opaque waters of doubt and mystery, and could discern more clearly the profounder depths and motives of the crime. The one thing which seemed to exercise Colonel van der Meulen's mind was the mysterious circumstance of, and especially the mysterious disappearance of the sapphire ring, for, as articles of value have a tendency to do, it had by some mystic agency vanished out of sight. The ring, as we have indicated in an earlier part of this story, was comprised of a large translucent unclouded sapphire cut into an oblong shape and embedded in a massive setting of yellow gold, a rare stone of the true deep velvety sapphire hue, of high intrinsic value, and had ever, in the eyes of Bertram Ganneau and his father before him, been an object of considerable family and historic worth, as a family relic which he had drawn from his father's hand when after the engagement of Five Forks, the last battle of the American Civil War, his father Hubert Ganneau lay dying or dead. It was, as we have shown, before the eyes of his mind, that dead white hand which had been the ruling delusion of Bertram Ganneau's life seemed ever to appear. It had been ever the vision of his delirium when on the couch of sickness, or when the hand of death seemed near, 
when by reason of the excesses into which he sometimes plunged among the wild fantastic hellish shapes which haunted his disordered brain there ever stood out in strange relief the same strange vision of that dead white hand on the tabular facet of the precious gem were engraved the family arms and quarterings not excluding from the heraldic device that which the late bertram Gonneau would have given much if he could have seen eliminated from the shield that hated blot and stain and eyesore on his escutcheon the hated sinister bar telling of illegitimacy back in some remote generation of his race a race of unblemished honour and as the world counts taint of untainted name such shortly then was the object which although he had never set his eyes upon the precious bauble seemed to attract its very full share of colonel van der Mullen's consideration almost we may say his affectionate regard yes mr lumley said he had seen it knew it and had seen it hundreds of times on the then living owner's finger for the late bertram Gonneau seemed to hold it as one of the treasures one of the fascinations of the reckless years of his life and now when for ever he had gazed the last long sorrowing gaze upon that poor face then for the first time it occurred to mr lumley that the precious heirloom as if by some mysterious unseen agency had disappeared certain he was that it had been worn when on that fatal night with ruthless murderous hand the assassin had cut off bertram Gonneau's life he had observed that with a ghastly a sickening and misplaced and ignorant show of pride it had by those who attended to the late bertram Gonneau's obsequies been displayed an unbecoming show of human utter littleness and earthly greatness when the dead rested in state and in the confusion of all the surroundings of that dread time and deed although mr lumley now felt certain it must have been ignorantly buried with the body of the dead the ring in the pressure of his other affairs had until he saw the recovered body lying in the chapel of the mausoleum passed entirely from his mind and now for an intimate acquaintance with that valued jewel and its heraldic device colonel van der Mullen felt that as he expressed himself to the london lawyer verily he would have given his left hand but this anxious desire of the new york detective mr lumley after some search among those piles and bundles and boxes of dusty documents relating to the broad acres of his aristocratic clientele discovered that he was able to satisfy and willing to afford without the sacrifice on van der Mullen's part of that valuable member of his society namely colonel van der Mullen's very useful palm for after some search among those time-honoured documents relating to past indiscretions past wants past needs and past deeds the lawyer was able to produce very much to the colonel's satisfaction indeed some admirable impressions in wax of the signet ring of the late bertram Gonneau, and these wax impressions colonel van der Mullen stowed away in some very safe part of his personal attire with as much care as he would had they been veritable greenbacks or gold and perhaps manipulated with that skill which he could apply they were as good as greenbacks or gold in the detective's hands and so without much further parley for like many very able men colonel van der Mullen was not a man given to a superfluous redundancy of words and he felt that for that day at least he had learned as much as he wanted to know the interview wherein the new yorker received assurance that attached to the elucidation of the whole mystery which hung around the vernwood tragedy there was no insignificant reward came to an end and from mr lumley's sanctum colonel van der Mullen again withdrew then very suddenly rather mysteriously rather strangely rather queerly mrs chickett's thought the perfect gentleman her lodger captain west the splendid dream of her existence had vanished and her eyes rested on the glorious personality of captain west no more a polite message by a polite messenger arrived at mrs chickett's house 
walked across the desert of Sahara up to that lady's front door, and on Captain West's behalf, honorably, and even in a liberal, even in a very generous spirit, discharged all demands, and drove away with all the impressive array of Captain West's empty boxes and belongings in a cab. And thus ended this pleasant passing vision of Mrs. Chickett's life, the vision of which that vain woman, with the blighted life, probably retained a vivid recollection, not to poor Chickett's advantage, to the end of his days. But that which seemed more remarkable even than the sudden termination of Captain West's tenancy of Mrs. Chickett's front rooms, was the quite new departure which it entered into the mysterious head of Colonel van der Mullen to conceive. For with that marvellous power of adaptability to all the circumstances of any phase of life, Colonel van der Mullen had suddenly taken to the profession, a profession which, like other subtle arts, is supposed to take a lifetime or years to master, the profession of the stage, Colonel van der Mullen became a professor of the histrionic art. Not in its highest phases, it is true, not in the highest, most soaring flights or representation did he venture, nor in the most difficult parts did the New York detective assume the accomplishments of a new role. But doubtless it was his wondrous power of being all in all, of playing all the world's many parts, of playing them as it were by intuition, without all the laborious preliminaries of rehearsal and repetition which renders the life of the professors of the dramatic and the histrionic art a life of hard, incessant toil and grind, perhaps it was this faculty, added to the many other useful gifts with which Colonel van der Mullen was endowed, which had made him that which we have described him in the earlier pages of, and throughout this history, the most consummately skilful player of his part, the most devoutedly dreaded among the peccant community of New York world. Perhaps they dreaded and feared this wily man-hunter, because, like the harmless prey of the jungle, they were deceived as the leopard deceives his prey, by allowing its spots to simulate leafy shadows of the trees. With that ready art and ready adaptation which in him lay, under the theatrical name of Mr. Wedmore Summers, passing himself off as from some provincial English theatre, but recently landed from an engagement in the United States, our wily friend van der Mullen thus launched himself into the life of this new role, for like as in Hamlet a play is played within a play, and as a stage is placed upon a stage, so Colonel van der Mullen was playing a part within a part. He was not only one of life's actors, simulating the actor's part, but he was the simulated actor taking the real actor's part upon the stage. But except once in a minor and unimportant character, the prudence of that doubly clever player, Wedmore Summers, forbade his posturing behind the footlights of any other than some fifth or sixth-rate metropolitan theatre, where audiences were less critical as they were less exacting and less refined. He knew his game too well for that. This part, however, of the New York detective's role we will not pursue. But there was one fellow actor with whom Mr. Wedmore Summers became on very chummish and friendly terms. The two men acted together, they drank together, they caroused together. That is, as far as Wedmore Summers ever committed himself to anything of the nature of a carousal at all. But there was one thing which Wedmore Summers knew, and which his boon companion, who was known as Lawrence Houghton, did not know. Wedmore Summers, or as we know him, Heinrich van der Mullen, knew that in the great game of life, we may say almost the game of life or death, which these two men were playing, Wedmore Summers knew well that both were playing a double part. And with so astute a player as Wedmore Summers, and playing for such heavy stakes, Lawrence Houghton was bound to lose. End of section 29《》Section 30 of The Heirloom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Heirloom by T. Dothy Lyle. Volume 3, Chapter 3 A Trap to Entrap a Sunbeam. We must now once more follow the devious tangled thread of our narrative into the great American Empire city of New York where Vandermeulen's little ferret man, Paul Newgas, ever watchfully waited for their developments, or was dutifully awaiting the commands of his chief. But Paul Newgas had not been slothful in his master's business, he had not been an idle watcher, he had not kept laid up in a napkin the talent which his master had committed to his charge, and the meat of intelligence which he had invested had not been without its some measure of reward but of this we may have some more to say. It was about as soon after Colonel Vandermeulen's interview with Mr. Lumley, as a communication, except by cable, could be hurried across the Atlantic or from London to New York, that Paul Nugas did receive certain orders from his chief. As soon as it came to the knowledge of the American detective that the ring, that trinket of such value, had disappeared from the late Bertram Gonneau's dead hand, he thought he had discovered something which was of great importance in his sharp eyes, a mere gossamer thread which many men would not have heeded as it floated in the air, but which, if deftly handled, might lead him out of the mysterious baffling maze. The trinket, he knew, must be somewhere in the world, and he resolved that it should be through the lack of no effort of his if it did not come into his hands. He argued to himself, if there was a human being ruthless enough to commit the assassination, there was a human being vile enough and full enough of iniquity to think but lightly of adding to the already full and abundant cup of his iniquity the lesser and less heinous sin, for theft is the felonious deprivation against his will, or surreptitiously, of a fellow human being, of his goods, but murder is the highway robbery of a fellow creature's life perhaps, with the exception, when gained, of heaven the most valuable inheritance to which humanity is heir. Now that which, with certain instructions and orders from his chief, did reach the hands of Paul Newgas as he loitered about Vandermeulen's little den near Battery Park, was one of those wax impressions which Mr. Lumley had given him, and which Colonel Vandermeulen had so carefully treasured up, of the late Bertram Gonneau's sapphire ring. It is a lamentable reflection how much of the alloy of poverty has been foisted off on to man, or man has brought upon himself to bear, together with the vastly increasing wealth of the world. But perhaps as evil is the inevitable attendant and curse of the good, and the powers of darkness have ever sought to dim the light, so probably in like manner in this world there will ever be squalid poverty as well as overabounding wealth. There would appear to be a school of misleading fictionists who would palm off onto the innocent the belief that New York City is the refuge of the thriftless and ne'er-do-well of the old world, the very paradise of the alchemist, the El Dorado of the money-seeker, wherein, so they tell you, beggars are no more frequently visible than blue moons, where gold is used to pave the very highways, where every other man is a millionaire, and where poverty is a thing quite unknown. But reader, if you have hitherto kept outside of the American Empire City, and are therefore innocent of its condition, its wiles, and its little ways, these are delusive fictions which you are advised never for one moment to entertain. For together with the great wealth which has grown up around this gateway into the new world, there has sprung up with it, likewise, the inevitable degree of squalor, poverty, and necessity, which, like some spirit of evil, have come into the gates which lead to prosperity and wealth a realm of gold, as though wafted across the ocean upon the wings of the demons of thriftlessness, sloth, indolence, and, in all their unlovely shapes, of vice and crime. As in the old world, so in the new, the curses of necessity and usury abound, the necessitous driven into the toils and machinations of the designing and usurous, as the fowls of heaven are by hunger lured into the fowler's snare, 
the gloating wealthy draw the very life's blood from the already attenuated and necessitous coffers of the poor. And it was upon the assumption of the want and necessities of the necessitous that Paul Nugas played his wily game. Limited opportunities, as Paul Nugas had ever been afforded, of enjoying the use of the precious metal, he knew that the American dollar was almighty, and for its possession he saw daily that men around him slaved, and schemed, and toiled, and even died. The ring which the millionaire owner of Vernwood, when in life, had always worn, and of which Paul Nugas now held the facsimile impression, was a very costly jewel, a jewel which could be converted into the means of much enjoyment, and the little man argued shrewdly and rightly that it would not for long remain in necessitous hands, and none other than the necessitous, he argued, had, next to the murdered man, been possessor of the jewel. For some few days after he had got possession, from Mr. Lumley, of the late Bertram Gonneau's seals, Colonel van der Mullen resorted to all those tactics to find the actual signet from which they were taken, which are well known to the English detective world. But as far as London was concerned, all Colonel van der Mullen's efforts had been fruitless and vain, and there seemed on to the rest of the mystery to be as much doubt closing around the loss of the signet heirloom as there had been about every other step and aspect of the case. But it was now only the denser darkness which is greater before the dawn. Paul Nugas had no sooner gained possession of one of the late owner's seals which the latter had impressed during his life, than from end to end of the Empire City his attention was directed to those abodes of usury and refuges of the necessitous, where articles of value may be pledged for a mere fraction of their intrinsic worth, and which are no less or more plenteous in England than in America, or in London than in New York. At last, as fortune seems to bestow its favors alike upon the diligent and the bold, the little ferret man thought he had found his reward. He had examined all the multitudinous and heterogeneous odds and ends displayed in these establishments of New York City, where, to judge from wondrous collections of oddments heaped up, one would think the proprietors of such establishments were by the very demon of heterogeneous accumulation possessed. Sometimes he would think he had discovered the identical coveted jewel which was for the time being the desire of his life, but then on closer examination he turned disappointed away. But at last there came his reward. By the more powerful and official help of the New York City police, which, after exhausting all his own private powers, he had called in to his aid, commencing near City Hall, Paul Nugas set about a thorough and systematic inquiry, which he purposed instituting, if necessary, through every street from Battery Park to Harlem, for like the hungry bird, Paul Nugas resolved that no stone should go unturned beneath which might be deposited the coveted worm. But Paul Nugas had not proceeded very far ere fortune, which is so fickle and tantalizing to the timid and vacillating, and hands over the key of its treasury to the bold, seemed to play into his very hands. In an establishment near the northern end of the Bowery, one of those refuges of the thriftless and necessitous, Paul Nugas came upon what he no longer doubted was the late Bertram Gonneau's sapphire ring. Comparing it with the wax impress which he had received from his chief, he found it in every particular down to the most microscopic detail to correspond. There was the shield graven upon the facet of the rare unclouded gem, there was the coat of arms, with its quarterings, from which was not even omitted that hateful, sinister bar. There was the surmounting Gano crest of the javelin grasped in the gauntleted hand. On the little engraven scroll, beneath, were exactly legible in clear but tiny letters, the motto of its owner's house, Dum vivo nunquam sesso bolare, While I live I never cease to war. With the help of a magnifying glass, Paul Nugas and his official companion of the New York City police compared side by side the signet and the seal, 
and then the little ferret man felt as though he could have danced with delight, could have stood upon his head, could have run a race on all fours, could have gone head over heels, could have executed as many somersaults as an acrobat, or could have played any other extraordinary caper in the extravagant intensity and exuberance of his delight. The possessor or holder of the ring was a Hebrew named Levi Cohen, but who under the name of Simpson conducted an establishment, as he himself would of course have protested much to his own pecuniary disadvantage, and solely for the benefit of the numerous family of his many brothers and sisters, many daughters and sons, and to whom he had stood in loco avunculi, which may be loosely translated in their parents' brothers' shoes. In plain words, although he called himself Mr. Simpson, this said Levi Cohen posed as uncle to as many of the necessitous scions of humanity as, like the spider intimated to the fly, he could induce to enter, and forthwith be bled, fleeced, and shorn within the doors of his little home. But under the influence of the lever which Paul Newgas had brought with him, the impressive squeeze which he received at the hand of the limb of the New York City law in the shape of an imperative officer of the New York regular police, that much-injured Hebrew moneylender, Mr. Levi Cohen, alias Simpson, was compelled to admit that he had advanced a comparatively insignificant sum of money upon the jewel, which still under due pressure he acknowledged was intrinsically a very valuable gem. "'Then who pledged this article with you?' asked the New York officer of police. With an air of still greater injured innocence, such as the lot of the Jewish race has ever been one of Gentile oppression, Levi Cohen shook his head. Selp him God, he didn't know. But with yet another turn of the Gentile screw, yet another squeeze from that lever-like limb of the New York law, acting much as an instrument of torture in the Spanish Inquisition, in which, like Shylock, his Shakespearean prototype, Mr. Levi Cohen thought he saw in the near future the imperilment of his principal, his usury, and his bond, the supple Hebrew was brought into a submissive state of mind, and with slow, reluctant fingers felt himself compelled to produce a document relating to the transaction, on which was written the name and address, in full, in New York, of a certain Michael Gervois. Having got so far what they desired, with a hint of warning to the now more submissive and gentle Jew, Paul Nugas and the officer of New York police withdrew to review and consider their plans. For to the eager, elated mind of Paul Nugas, the identity of that certain Michael Gervois, whoever he might be, became as desirable as imperative a necessity as only a few hours before it had been to him to ascertain the whereabouts of the sapphire ring. And then the natural bent, the genius of Paul Nugas, that useful talent which the observant van der Mullen saw that in him lay, flashed forth, for whatever the faults or the virtues of the American people may be, they are not slow to recognize and to turn to account either special talent in any direction or brains. And then Paul Nugas did that which in Yankee parlance would be called rather a smart thing. Then and there, without affording Mr. Levi Cohen, alias Simpson, any scope or opportunity for false play, he returned to the office of the usurer, and offered him, payable within one hour, a reward for his cooperation, which was equal in amount to one half the money lender's loan. The little man's acute thrust struck the usurer in that tender place which has been the vulnerable point of his peculiar people through all their generations, throughout all time, which has survived apparently all the persecutions, all the wrongs, all the changes of country, climate, and dominion, whether in bondage or free, whether prospering or oppressed, namely, it appealed to a greed, which, alas, is by no means confined to the Hebrew race, his avarice, his insatiable love of gold. Then that which happened we will not describe in detail, but will leave it as our story proceeds for the sequel to show. 
Within an hour of his having struck his bargain, Paul Nugas had paid the substantial money reward, which he knew where to procure, into Levi Cohen's hands, which raised his bushy eyebrows and caused his dark, beady eyes verily to twinkle with delight. Although it was the price of blood, it was an augmentation of his hoard, it was the momentary assuagement of his thirst for gold, which was a part of his very flesh and blood. But how to possess himself of a reliable, identifiable, indisputable portrait of the unknown man Michael Gervois, whoever or whatever he might be, who had brought the signet ring to Levi Cohen, was the problem which sorely exercised the little ferret man's mind. One thing he learned from the pecunious and circumspect usurer was that Gervois had received a far less sum on the security of the jewel than he had asked, and this became the string upon which the little ferret man quickly saw that he might most tunefully play. And so that which Paul Nugas did, the first step in his move to gain his desired end, was to request Levi Cohen to write a letter to the man Michael Gervois, who had deposited the jewel, telling him that having more exactly priced it, he was now willing either to increase his advance thereon, or would negotiate an absolute purchase of the ring, at the same time desiring him to pay him a visit at a certain hour on the following day. Like the wary fisherman who stands in the concealment of the bulrushes by the water's edge, and throws his baited hook upon the stream, that was the bait which Paul Nugas cast upon the tide. Meanwhile, he secured the services of a photographer, and placed his camera in a small room adjacent to that occupied by Levi Cohen in his trade, but in such a way that although the lens commanded a complete view of the money lender's sanctum, and every one therein in its field, yet from this outer room, which Levi Cohen devoted to the purposes of his usurous calling, neither instrument nor operator could be seen. Such was the simple machinery of the trap which Paul Nugas set to catch, as it were a sunbeam, the shadow of his man, but the shadow rather than the substance was that which just then he had most exercised his wits to gain. Thus having adroitly and craftily set his snare, the little ferret man patiently, or rather impatiently, awaited its result. Perhaps it would be safe to assert that Paul Nugas slept very little that night, so intent was his mind on the interesting details of his game, a game by which he knew much of his reputation in his master's eyes must stand or fall. It was long before the hour of Levi Cohen's appointment with Gervois that Paul Nugas and his artist were ensconced in the moneylender's little back room, and as the hour drew near, the little ferret man's expectancy grew too intense almost to be endured, as he saw the so nearly successful consummation of his scheme. Then, with a punctuality which would have been worthy of a better cause, Levi Cohen's bell rang, and the next moment the false and usurous Jew, with much fictitious affectation of welcome, admitted Michael Gervois. The latter appeared to be a man approaching fifty years of age, with long, dark, curling beard, and with a worn, almost dissipated face and working hands. His dress was dark, ordinary, and plain. Levi Cohen gave a prearranged signal to Paul Nugas, and then, with the unsuspecting Gervois, he entered, intently engaging the attention of the latter, into the business at hand. Into the details of that business we will not enter, it is enough to say that the business ended by the usurer Levi Cohen paying an additional sum into Gervois' hand. Then, bidding his very accommodating banker adieu, the bearded borrower departed a well-satisfied man. But probably Michael Gervois would have departed far less satisfied, he would have wished the sapphire ring and Levi Cohen in Hades, he would have wished himself at the bottom of the sea, he would have wished he had never been born, had he known that during that fatal half-hour in the which he was receiving so much careful and kind attention at the false hypocrites, Levi Cohen's hands, 
in which he thought he was being so generously done by, had he known that more than once, more than twice, so noiselessly, and still so unerringly, through the tell-tale lens, the light of heaven was transferring the true unerring likeness of his face onto that sensitized plate of glass. But that was a trick which Michael Gervoy had yet to learn. It was a trap into which, fatal as it was, even he himself knew not that he had so unwittingly fallen. These were things which Michael Gervoy had yet to learn. End of section 30《》Section 31 of The Heirloom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heirloom by T. Duthie Lyle. Volume 3, Chapter 4. What the Trapped Sunbeam Told. The summer had passed away, autumn and October in the great London world came in utterly bleak, cheerless, and chill. It was early morning, early, that is, as wakes the London world. Through its many arteries the pulsations of the mighty Babylon of modern commerce were beginning to throb anew, and the great torpid sea of human life again to wake and stir. Busy men in warm coats shoveled along the streets, or hurried from omnibuses, or rushed into their warm offices from hansoms, carriages, or cabs. Mr. Lumley was among these. As his business obliged him to quit all the comforts of velvety-piled, carpeted rooms, bright warm fires, a luxurious breakfast-table, to say nothing of the charms of his domestic circle at Lancaster Gate, for the dull routine and dry legal details into which for years he had been daily immersed near Lincoln's Inn Fields, he was uncomfortable, brusque, short-mannered, to all about him, and cold. Not that Mr. Lumley's phlegmatic, law-sodden person ever under any circumstances looked very genial, very jovial, or warm. It was one of those dismal, comfortless days in London without, on which he would definitely have preferred, infinitely enjoyed, lounging at home in a large luxurious armchair by a great fire, reading a novel, or punch, or the times, in his own comfortable, cosy morning room. But Mr. Lumley considered himself a martyr, martyred, held in bondage vile, by the inexorable trammels and exactions of an almost lifelong devotion to the law, held in bondage to a practice worth many thousands of pounds a year, and that was the kind of martyrdom which Mr. Lumley endured. He reached his office, commenced reading his letters, but had not been thus occupied many minutes when a clerk entered and handed his principal a note. Rather snappishly, for it was carefully sealed, the principal tore it open and read, Number blank, blank street, mile end road. Mr. Lumley, sir, I respectfully enclose you herewith three portraits, of which I think, if you can identify the original with any person who has ever been on the Vernwood estate, may lead to important results. I should not send this by messenger were it not impossible for me, through an important affair on hand, to see you. Immediate action is advised. Respectfully, Heinrich Vandermulen. Folded carefully up, and enclosed together with the foregoing note, were three clear, well-executed portraits of the man whose personal appearance, and the surreptitious capture of whose physiognomy by the little ferret man, Paul Newgas, by means of the concealed camera, we have already shortly described, and whose name we have given the reader as Michael Gervois. The lawyer perused again and again this concise, laconic note, then one by one he long and closely and thoughtfully examined the three carte de visite size portraits, representing three different aspects of the same face. Then he folded up the portraits and note, replaced them in the envelope in which they had been handed to him, threw himself back in his comfortably padded, well-worn, shiny office chair, and for several minutes was buried in the profoundest thought. Then he glanced at his watch. 
then rapidly one by one he cut open and quickly read a pile of letters which lay before him did it with that ready celerity and instant grasp of subjects details and facts of a man who had been repeating the same thing almost every morning for the last thirty or forty years then he struck twice a silver hand gong which stood at his side the bell rang out with a silvery musical sound immediately a tall intellectual looking young man his managing clerk appeared mr willoughby said the lawyer i wish to give you some instructions then one by one he ran over some forty letters giving rapidly his orders on each one in a way that would have hopelessly bewildered and mystified any but the very cool clear clever-headed and practical man which mr lumley's able young managing clerk was and mr willoughby will you please tell johnson to order me a cab and send word to the house that i may be out of town a couple of days yes a couple of days having received his orders the clever-looking manager respectfully withdrew a few minutes after this mr lumley in a handsome cab was being rattled through the cold misty early london streets to the station from which passengers reach the far-off western shires what with delays stoppages changes and late trains mr lumley for vernwood was not too easy of access from town was travelling a good part of the day and when the train conveying him drew up at the little station of vernwood village the earliest blushes of evening sunset and shadow were tinging and darkening the face of nature with a more weakened ruddy glow and the shortening october autumn day was rapidly darkening to its close there is something so utterly different in the appearance so absolutely absurd in the contrast of a spick and span exportation from the centre of our great babylonish life when he appears among the rustic population of a far-off rural english shire that the contrast may be likened by comparison to a polished gem set among rude stones which have as it were been untouched by the finishing process of the lapidary's art and it was something like this comparison that mr lumley looked and felt as he alighted from the train into the rustic vernwood world near that fine old english home but they knew the portly figure of the vernwood lawyer so perhaps in the rustic imagination mr lumley appeared quite a harmless creature great as he was and not quite such a natural curiosity to be stared at wonderingly as a new real live importation from london would otherwise have been but still mr lumley was without that dual or plural adaptability which Heinrich van der Mulen, for instance in so marked a degree possessed of being romish when among the romans of being or simulating all things all characters in all situations to all men the want of which makes the ordinary everyday londoner appear in rustic eyes as much of a thorough-going simpleton when he lands in some remote shire as poor hodge is caricatured to be on his occasional visits to town when either of these two characters ventures from his native wilds the one from the ploughed arables and pastures green the other from the busy metropolitan streets it is often difficult to determine which of the twain looks the most a fool as soon as mr lumley left vernwood village he set out to cause the circulation of his cold blood by a walk over the two or three miles of country road which had to be traversed from the little station to the estate but dreading perhaps the sinister recollections which attached to the mansion he gave the house itself a wide berth seeking rather to avoid its near proximity and to accomplish the journey which he had in view by somewhat more circuitous roads a walk which was not unpleasant of upwards of an hour's duration brought him a mile or more from vernwood village direction beyond the mansion its pleasure grounds and park till he reached a house picturesquely situated and somewhat uncommon in its surroundings as well architecturally as in ornamentation and design it was the residence of mr price who was as we have before had occasion to tell residing factor during the interregnum of owners on the vernwood estate 
it was quite late in the afternoon, or rather it was evening, the hour of the gloaming which preceded the night, when the London lawyer knocked at Mr. Price's porched front door. It was opened by the head of the household himself, who was quite taken aback at this unexpected apparition of the ruling power. We have said elsewhere that Bertram Ganot had ever been fortunate in the selection of his stewards, and Mr. Price's tested capacity and fidelity to his master's interests had already showed itself such as to raise him to a very respectable position in the acute and sharp-sighted London lawyer's esteem. A dark, almost swarthy complexioned man, you would have said young man, for he almost looked young, and as a fact was scarcely halfway on the journey of life, and if, in a measure countrified, his mental grasp of affairs would to a stranger soon become apparent. With a mind fresh and not uninteresting, and although he might not be too superficially refined, there was nothing in him of the stolidity of the boor. Such was the steward at Vernwood." When Mr. Price undid his door, his eyes opened very wide with surprise at the sudden and quite unexpected appearance thereat of his chief. He might have thought the sudden appearance almost supernatural, but then Mr. Lumley's tall and portly person was very ample and substantial looking, so it precluded all ideas of a ghost. The lawyer extended his hand, and as soon as the factor could collect his rather confused ideas and recover from his surprise, he invited his superior indoors. The hour was just about that which in middle or lower class households is called tea time, and around Mr. and Mrs. Price's frugal board were seated of various ages and in various ungraceful attitudes, from the baby to the heir, some six or seven noisy, boisterous brats of girls and boys. As the important-looking London lawyer entered the family circle, especially the more tender offshoots of the house of Price, their fingers and mouths plentifully bespattered with adhesive dainties, were eagerly, with the proverbial rapacity of youth, devouring large portions of the stuff of life, plentifully bespread with layers of molasses or jam, while those delicate impressions of which the juvenile mind is so receptive were being vented in a babel of shrill treble tones. "'Now, Miss Katy, if you please, leave my spoon alone.' "'Oh, Mummy!' called out the eldest girl. "'Tim's taking such a lot of jam!' "'No, I ain't,' resented the four-year-older referred to as Tim. "'You look out. There's Baby shoving his hands into the treacle jar.' Such is a little sample of the conversation carried on at Mrs. Price's board. But Mr. Lumley's imposing presence produced markedly a quelling influence on this hilarious domestic scene. There are households, enter them when you will, into which no amount of prosperity seems to bring order, and there are households from which no amount of poverty seems able to drive order, cleanliness, and refinement out. I am sorry we cannot offer you any better accommodation, sir, excused the head of the house apologetically. But you see, sir, we didn't expect... Sarah, my dear, have you got any meat in the house? No, I haven't, James. Of course, you know I haven't. And you know, sir, to Mr. Lumley, our butcher's three miles away, but some eggs. So in the absence of any rarer and more recherche dainties, Mr. Lumley elected hard-boiled eggs and tea. The juvenile hilarity had become, by this time, subdued to whispering point, and Tim, Caddy, and the baby gazed on the great man with wondering eyes. But Mr. Lumley, while in sheer hunger he devoured with gusto his hard-boiled eggs, thought very regretfully of the sumptuous dinner which he should have been enjoying at the well-appointed mansion at Lancaster Gate, of his foaming dry cliquo, and the oyster soup at which his chef was such an adept, the roast grouse and orlatans, by the very flavor of which he swore, all crowned with just a nip of maraschino. French coffee and one of those choice brands of partagas, for which he paid habitually eighty shillings a pound. 
but whatever dignity may appertain to mental toil, only those who labor with their hands know the sweetness of plain fare. At length the unexpected guest at Mr. Price's table had finished his homely repast. All the time it was in progress, the steward had been puzzling his brains to divine what could have caused the lawyer to put in an appearance at Vernwood in this unexpected way. But the meal was over. Mr. Price was not left long altogether in doubt. At a sign from Mr. Lumley, the two men withdrew from what was the general living room, where Tim was now entertaining the baby with cotton reels on the floor, to the adjoining apartment, into what Mr. Price called his private or business room. Lawyer Lumley carefully closed the door behind him as they entered, took a seat opposite his employee, then drew from his pocket the very envelope which that very morning he had received from Colonel Vandermeulen's messenger in town. Then he took out the three portraits, and silently handed them to Mr. Price. For some minutes the factor long and steadily examined the three cards, then in the lamplight, his face full of meaning, without uttering a single word, Mr. Price very slowly raised his eyes, till, face to face, they and Mr. Lumley's met. Well, the lawyer asked, can you tell me whose is that face? Yes, I can. There was, as he spoke, a quiet, deep mysteriousness in Mr. Price's tone. Whose? Why, it is the likeness of Michael Sullivan, his beyond a doubt. Michael Sullivan, who is he? Well, he was employed here, sir. Was employed here? When did he cease to be employed here, and where is he now? He left several weeks ago, sir, but where he is now I don't know. At what work was he employed here? As a carpenter, sir. He was a house carpenter by trade. What was his character? Well, sir, he was a quiet man and a good workman, kept himself pretty much to himself, but as to his character I never saw anything amiss. Had he a family? No, sir, he was alone, said he was unmarried, and lived in half of the cottage occupied by old widow Garish. At first he lodged at Brown's up at the West Farm, but some unpleasantness arising between them, I gave him the unoccupied rooms under the same roof where Widow Garish lives, and she did for him. But do you know whence he came? I do not, sir. He came and offered here some eighteen months or two year ago, and as I wanted a good carpenter, and he seemed a steady man and a good workman, I have employed him ever since. Why did he leave? He gave no reason, sir, other than that he wanted a change and said he was going to Chester. Then there was a long, silent pause as the two men sat there in the dim, uncertain lamplight of the little quiet room. A pause during which Mr. Price, whatever was passing in his mind, said nothing, but waited further developments, and during which the lawyer's head was bent, his sallow face looking almost ghastly, almost deathly in the imperfect illumination of the dim lamp in its unusual pallor, and his eyes were long and steadily fixed upon the worn carpeted floor. Then again he raised his head. Who has lived in the rooms occupied by Sullivan since he left? he asked. No one, sir. They have been void. Old widow Garish has lived under the same roof, but she has occupied the adjacent half of the cottage alone. Then again Mr. Lumley relapsed into thought. "'I want you to drive me over to Gladborough,' he said at length. "'I suppose I can get accommodation for tonight at the Prince's Arms.' And that, without going into a further discussion of the case, leaving Mr. Price as much, if not rather more mystified than at first, brought the tete-a-tete -tete in Mr. Price's little room to a close. In less than a quarter of an hour after that, the London lawyer and Mr. Price, behind the latter's fast-trotting cob, were passing along through the chill October evening air, along the road towards the clean little country town of Gladborough, some two miles from Vernwood. Then, after requesting the steward to meet him there again with his trap at nine o'clock on the following morning, 
Mr. Lumley soon found himself the only guest before the great, bright coffee-room fire at the Prince's Arms Family and Commercial Hotel at Gladborough, enjoying something more toothsome than poor homely Mrs. Price's hard-boiled eggs and tea. As Mr. Price, after wishing his superior a respectful good night, turned his cob's head round, and in his open smart little dog-cart made the best of his way homeward through the chilly frosty night air, many thoughts, many things, many conjectures passed through his perplexed mind. And that night late, when their brats of boys and girls were put to bed, he and Mrs. Price held a council of conjectures beyond their usual early hour of retiring, as they sat over the dying embers of the quiet country kitchen fire. It is almost unnecessary to tell what the hopes and fears and conjectures of these two good people were. Mr. Lumley did little that night but enjoy the warmth and comfort and glow of the bright cheery Prince's Arms coffee-room fire. There was one thing, however, that the London lawyer did do. It was near ten o'clock, and Mr. Lumley, having well warmed his outer man, and well lined and fortified his inner man with something more grateful and comforting than hard-boiled eggs and tea, sallied forth from the prince's arms yard into the dismal, dead-alive solitude and solemnity of the little country town street. Following two or three quirks or turnings, he found himself before a rather long, low, new-looking building of massive stone. This he entered, and there, although there was a good fire, in a rather cold-looking, rather repellent-looking office or room, around which in the shape of handcuffs, manacles, cutlasses, and truncheons, hung various trophies and implements of the human chase, before a desk-table, busily writing reports, sat no other than our tall, dignified acquaintance, Mr. Superintendent Whittier, who had, under such ignominious conditions, some months before, taken so prominent, though mistaken, a part in poor Jules Massey's arrest. The superintendent was but little changed from the tall, kindly, dignified officer as we knew him, except that Monk, having quite failed to leave a whole garment on his official back, he had, at the expense of his country, to be provided with a completely new outfit of official clothes. But we mention this only incidentally by the way. It was in the cold, raw murk of the October morning of the following day that the three personalities to whom we have lately had to refer, namely Mr. Lumley, Mr. Superintendent Whittier, and Mr. Price, again met. Although of course nobody had mentioned a word, nobody in the world of rumor ever does mention a word, yet in that inexplicable way in which reports and rumors generate and fly, Dark sinister echoes again hung, as it were, like some uncanny contagion in the Vernwood air. But now, however, the malicious, busy tongues of slander or report over the Vernwood tragedy were forever to be stilled. After a short consultation in the cold morning, held in Mr. Price's comfortless little room, accompanied by a laborer with some tools, the three men left the factor's house and walked off through the Vernwood lanes. The damp and dripping dews of autumn hung heavily upon the hedges, the grass and the trees, as the three or four men passed on their errand along the wooded road. At last, after a walk of nearly a mile from Mr. Price's house, they reached the sequestered cottage now occupied by Widow Garrish alone. It was an isolated, sequestered domicile, thickly surrounded by, nay, almost buried in, dense, low underwood and high leafy trees. But, as Mr. Price had told the lawyer, some of the rooms, having a separate entrance, were now untenanted and void. The men gained an entrance, the house was furnished after a fashion, and here and there domestic utensils lay negligently placed about, having been left uncleansed and unused imparting to the aspect of the interior a desolate, neglected air. First they ascended to the upper or domiciliary apartments of the abode, which presented an aspect much in keeping with those underneath. 
commencing at once in a kind of upper story or attic, from floor to floor Mr. Superintendent Whittier instituted a thorough and searching investigation of every cupboard, shelf, corner, nook and cranny of the abode. After half an hour's careful investigation, the search for anything which could throw light on the sad history of the past seemed vain, and it seemed like being barren of results. The superintendent then directed his attention to the kitchen floor of newly laid boards, but although they displayed not the least sign of removal since the floor was remade, yet with the help of the workmen and tools he set to work and one by one lifted them up from the joists, thus exposing directly to view the earthen foundation beneath. But strange to say, the earth beneath the center of the room seemed looser than the surrounding soil. Following the instructions of the superintendent, the laborer continued to delve between the joists down to the loose friable mold to a depth of several feet, while the London lawyer and Mr. Price looked on with curious and interested gaze. At length the limits of the loose mold narrowed down to about one foot in width, and there, carefully concealed under a heavy flagstone, Mr. Superintendent Whittier and the workman came upon what was a damning find. It was the damning, condemning, indisputable link which so seldom seems quite absent in the chain of evidence, the fatal blunder in the operation, by which the murderer seems ever, as if by some inscrutable law, some strange unaccountable oversight or act of forgetfulness, to reveal his trail, for there, out of the depths of some five feet of loosened earth, was brought to the light of day a garment of the oilskin kind, which it needed no chemical analysis to prove, needed scarcely a second examination of the unassisted eye to determine, had been almost deluged with blood. Not only so, but rolled up in this garment was a long, murderous-looking bowie knife, of Spanish shape and make, with a lacquered ornamented blade, and it needed no further testimony to tell the tale of how, and by whose hand, Bertram Ganot, the master of Vernwood, had died. We need not pursue farther the details of that morning's work. Mr. Superintendent Whittier took charge of the condemning possessions, treasuring them with well-nigh as much care as if he had unearthed some long-buried crock or casket filled with precious ore or gems. But we will turn to another phase of our tale. Between the cities of London and New York there is some five hours difference in time. That is to say, when timepieces denote nine o'clock in the morning in New York, it is, in London, about two hours past midday. Thus, when New Yorkers first set about their daily labor, the London working day is some five hours old. This difference forms an important factor in the work of commerce and civilization and finance, a factor which is, and is destined to make, an important item in the making of the Western world. Thus it was on the damp October day in the which the discovery had been made beneath the floor of the cottage lately occupied by Michael Sullivan, or as we know his true name to be, Michael Gervoy, so great is the triumph of science and invention that almost before the New York world on that same day dawned, Michael Gervoy, for having willfully murdered Bertram Ganot, was arrested in New York. But once again on the magic wing of thought, we will bridge over the rolling tide in the ever-shifting currents of events, of time and space, we have again once more to change it to an episode which is ever-saddening, is deeply saddening whether contemplated in reality or romance. It is a size time in the county town within twenty miles of Vernwood. The entrances of the courts of justice are carefully guarded and closely thronged with an excited miscellaneous throng. There has been an eager overbrooding sadness, a morbid expectancy come upon the popular throng, for it is a foregone conclusion that one person within the precincts of that solid, massive, substantial structure must requite his sin with his life, for there, in the place of the accused and the condemned, for whom all the hope of this world has gone out and ceased, stands before his earthly judge, 
at last the true and proven murderer of Bertram Ganot, Michael Gervois. The dark man Jules Massey is there too, standing in the very same court in which so few, so very few months before, he was to have been tried for that very crime. But this time Jules Massey, even in court the great dog monk by his side, instead of being prisoner, poses now as a principal witness against the accused. Jules Massey tells how alone, in the solitary chamber, in the silence of the moonlit summer night, he watched by his sick, raving, perhaps dying master's side. In graphic language, he tells of his late master's wild vision of his delirium, the dead white hand, of the raving, delirious patient's dark presentiment of evil, such as by some western Indian witch doctress had been foretold to him in the wild, mystic jargon of witchcraft, when midnight music sounded at the rising of the moon. Then he told the court how, as he stood out upon the broad lawn, he heard the startled pheasant rise from the bushes, and the subdued rustle among the leaves, the significance of which was now as clear to him as the light of day. Then Jules went on to tell the story of his own arrest, and his own narrow escape, he told of the startled mysterious fright of the horse ranger, of the intense restless excitement of the great dog. Then he told how on the snowy October morning he went to the mausoleum, told about the finding of his late master's body, as it lay deeply buried hidden beneath the snow, by the St. Bernard dog now standing by his side, told of the very body stolen from the grave, told of the robbery from the person of the dead of the sapphire ring from his dead master's hand. As the court listened with rapt attention to the black man's recital of facts now clear to all, it was to them as the recital of some strange, weird, wild romance. At last all those horrid grim formalities came to an end. Then at last was the sentence uttered. Michael Sullivan, it is not my sentence which I pronounce on you, but the sentence of the law. You shall be taken from the prison whence you came, and thence to the place of execution, and hung by the neck until you are dead. Amen. Here again must the veil fall. It was the grey dawn of an early November morning, when within the privacy of the prison walls a little procession was being formed. It was stated vaguely by the press that the convict was resigned, that he was repentant, that he had spent all the fast ebbing hours of his life penning an account or in prayer, that the kindly ministrations upon him of the two holy fathers of his church, who by turns since his conviction had never left his cell, had melted the hardened heart. In short, it was said that the culprit had confessed." The last sacrament had been administered. De profundis te domine clamavi, clamavi. Out of the depths, O Lord, I have cried, I have cried to thee. And then, in the angry dawn of that November morning, at the common hangman's hands, was requited the death, and for the murder of Bertram Ganot, his murderer, Michael Sullivan, died. End of section 31《》section 32 of the heirloom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the heirloom by t duthy lyle volume 3 chapter 5 de profundis for the willful murder or let us call it butchery in all its heartless cold-blooded dexterity of the master of Vernwood, the body of his assassin Michael Sullivan, alias Gervois, had not lain so much as one twelve hours in the dust of an unhallowed grave, ere Colonel Vandermeulen knew, as far as by human knowledge could be known, each act, almost each word and thought of the last hours of the culprit's life. His protestations of innocence, or his confessions of guilt, of the brighter moments when rays of hopefulness at times broke through the rifts of the awful cloud, 
or some faint light glimmered beyond the gloom of the dark valley of shadow through which he was condemned to pass, of those dark hours wherein the great unfathomable future of eternity was an utter immeasurable void, without even the scintillation from its depths of a single guiding star, the present void, the future hopeless, the past remorse. All this, with the usual perspicuity, the usual insight into the depths of human lives and events which made him such a consummate master of his profession, the New York detective Heinrich Vandermeulen had quickly got to know. In our last chapter we said enough to show that Sullivan or Gervois had lived, had died, had confessed, had received absolution, had passed from this life to a life beyond, to purgatory or to paradise, amid the consolations and ministrations of the Roman Catholic faith. Born as he was, a Frenchman by his father and Irish on his maternal side, brought zealously up in the tenets of the Romish faith, he had no idea of any other than what in his eyes was the true and only real belief to trust in for the salvation of his soul, and the church, ever watchful and anxious for the spiritual well-being of her children, whether innocent or erring, lagged not to impart its spiritual consolations to the fallen and the condemned. Hence, day nor night had the two priests whose painful office it was to minister to the unhappy culprit's spiritual necessities been absent from the condemned man's cell. Whatever Colonel Vandermeulen knew, whatever means he had employed to learn, it is scarcely our privilege, it may not be within our ability, to look too closely behind the veil. The press, the busy mouthpiece of the world, gave to its public many conflicting and contradictory accounts. It was said that the murderer of Bertram Gonneau had confessed all, that he had made a clean breast of his deed, it was said that he had on the morning of his execution at the last moment placed a sealed document, to be opened only after he had ceased to live, in his confessor's hands. Such was vaguely said. But if that was truly and really so, like as the murderer's remains were buried in the oblivion of an unhallowed grave, to be forgotten or to be remembered only in dishonor, or chronicled in the annals of crime, so likewise any written confession that he ever penned, except to be examined in official secrecy and pigeonholed, to pass forever from human eyes and human remembrance, never saw the light. The man was dead, so argued straight-backed officialism and blind-eyed red tape, and whether he were innocent or guilty, the die had been cast, and no human power could bring him back to life. Therefore it mattered not to the outer world what were his final acts or protestations during his life. As a matter of fact, rumor was not completely wrong, and previous to his decease, the murderer Michael Gervois had actually placed in the hands of his confessors and spiritual advisers a document written and sealed to be opened only after his demise. And almost every word in this document, although it was never published, by some mysterious means, through some mysterious channel, that genius in his calling, Heinrich Vandermeulen, very quickly, as we have said, ere the writer had been twelve hours dead, knew. How exactly that came to be, we will not venture too particularly to surmise or to impart, but this much we may tell, from being in his religion, as necessity demanded of any faith which man ever hoped or believed in for the salvation of his soul, or from being, as circumstances required, of no faith at all, with that mutability which enabled him to adapt himself to all circumstances, to be all things to all men, to suit himself as naturally and easily to surrounding requirements as every hovering, changing shadow causes the chameleon to vary the hue of his skin, Colonel van der Mullen became a convert to the Church of Rome, as zealous and devout a proselyte as ever dipped in holy water or knelt before an altar at high mass. But without concerning ourselves with this, without intruding too curiously within the sacred veil of the confessional which hung around the dark precincts of the murderer's cell, 
ignoring avowals which under its solemn ban might have been uttered in sacerdotal ears, and which no anointed priest of the Romish church under pain of penalties or ostracism may divulge, we may tell only what we know. And the document which the murderer Michael Sullivan penned before his death, and which he placed in the hands of the young priest, Father Loyola, who administered the last rites and sacraments and consolations which his church could bestow, was this. Confession of Michael Gervois I, Michael Gervois, make this in writing my last confession before my death, and for my sins may the Lord through the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, have mercy on my soul. As before many days or many hours I must die, and even now it seems as if the grave yawns open to receive my body before my very eyes, I now desire to unburden my conscience, as far as confession can, by an avowal of my guilt and sin, and the great crime which weighs so heavily upon my soul. In the sight of God, trusting in the intercession of the Blessed Virgin, I hereby confess that I murdered my master Bertram Grenot, and for the crime it is just that I should die. But while I acknowledge the justness of the sentence which has been passed upon me by the law, I protest and confess that the crime for which I am about to suffer had not been planned or carried out of my own free will, of any malice prepense, and in this I protest that I am innocent of the sin. I confess my weakness, and in my weakness I have been but a tool in other hands in committing so fearful a deed, but for this weakness I own it is but just that I should die. And now, as I stand on the very brink of the grave, on the threshold of an eternity which seems to open so vast and dark and hopeless in my spiritual sight, I swear that I owed my master no ill will, and being now beyond the fear or vengeance of man, and having only to reckon with my God, who must deal as seemeth him good with my immortal soul, I write the following account and history of my crime. Some two or three years ago, when working at my trade in the city of Mexico, I was inveigled into blindly taking the oath of allegiance, fidelity, and obedience to the tenets of a secret fraternity calling themselves the sons of Cain. I took the oath, I say, blindly. And so it was. I was not long within the pale of this society of the sons of Cain, ere I discovered that while their professed reason d'etre was good fellowship, social enjoyment, and apparently harmless pleasures, yet beneath this surface, and within its inner circle, the hands of the sons of Cain, like those of the scriptural prototype after whom they called themselves, were deeply dyed with crime and blood, human blood, and instead of the innocent pursuits which they professed, the real and veritable business of the affiliation was murder, robbery, assassination, crime. When I saw the dangerous society into which I had fallen, I would have withdrawn, I would have cut off my hand if it could have disunited me with such men. But it was as the snare into which the bird flies unwittingly, or as the barbed arrow which has entered the flesh, easy to enter but practically impossible to withdraw. Within the inner circle of this fraternity, I heard murder and crime discussed with all the sang-froid and deliberation with which men of business or men of the world discuss the prospects of trade or agriculture, or the fluctuations of the exchange. Not only so, but I found that this Mexican murder society was the parent stem from which ramified certain offshoots existing in New York, London, and several other of the more important American and European cities but their aim and object everywhere was the same, murder, robbery, violence, crime. Within the inner circle of the order, the movements of the great and wealthy, both of the new world and the old, were known by a system of espionage as dark and secret and mysterious as it was complete. I will not now disclose the many crimes which I could unfold and heard discussed. I had not been so much as six months a member of the criminal fraternity when I was chosen by ballot for the perpetration of a crime, a murder. As the details of what was expected of me were imparted to me, 
I shrunk with horror from the deed. But there was no holding back, no turning aside. As is common with such fraternities, my own life would have been the exacted penalty of my refusal, of any faltering in my obedience or suspicion of infidelity to the voted decrees of the sons of Cain. But while its decisions were systematically arrived at by ballot and immutable, yet it was left to the arrangement of individual members of the fraternity, or what may be called subcommittees, to carry out its designs. I was instructed in the role which I was expected to perform by two of the secret brotherhood, whose names, as strange to relate, we knew each other within the council only by astronomical terms, I never knew. But that which struck me as most remarkable was the exact and marvellous similarity, the one to the other, of the two men who were my instructors in the deed which I was expected to perform. In stature, in complexion, in age, in features, in voice, in manner, even in dress, the one was a repetition, a facsimile of the other, so startling and striking was the similarity of form and face. There could be no doubt but that they were children of the same parents born on the same day. But the order which I received, and which being the unanimous vote of the assembled fraternity, was irrevocable and imperative, filled me with dismay. My orders were these. Accompanied by the two men who had been my instructors, I was to proceed from the city of Mexico to New York, and thence, if necessary, to cross the ocean to Europe, and accomplish the death of a young man who would be pointed out to me. Under what pretext, what sin he had committed in the eyes of the sons of Cain, to merit death, I could not comprehend. But now I know that his sin in their eyes was the possession of greater wealth than the plotters against his life possessed. A few days after receiving the orders of the fraternity, in company with the two men who had been my instructors, I left Mexico. We arrived in the city of New York, where a secret conference between the members of the fraternity, but to which I was not admitted, brought about some alteration in our plans, and one of my two companions informed me that he should cross with me to Europe, while his brother, as I can but call him, would remain in New York. In due time we reached London, and soon, in that great meeting and conference ground of all sects and societies, both bad and good, I found myself in company with a fraternity of villains, Americans, English, Irish, Germans, and Russians, no less murderous, seditious, and lawless than the clique of the same order with whom I had become so fatally entangled in the cities of Mexico and New York. Oh, the unhappy day! With these men I spent my days carousing, for, however obtained, there was never any lack of funds among the sons of Cain, and I found myself fast sinking to the level of those with whom I spent my nights and days. At last, one day, in one of two gentlemen issuing from a club in St. James's Street, in front of which we had been loitering and watching, was pointed out to me the young man whose destruction I was voted to accomplish in Mexico. He was handsome, tall, fashionably dressed, with dark Spanish-looking complexion and features, and I was informed he was the owner of enormous wealth. It would take too long, my last hours are ebbing too rapidly away, to tell in detail the machinations by which, making use of my trade as a disguise, I got employment on my late master's estate, got access to the mansion, knew every room, chamber, passage of the house. The complete knowledge which I was gaining took many months to acquire, but I knew that I was playing and scheming for enormous stakes. What led me to these conclusions more readily? What again to me looked another remarkable coincidence, as I got to know my master, the owner of Vernwood, intimately, was again his great personal resemblance to the two men who, as I have already said, had been my instructors in plotting his death. It even occurred to me if they could be brothers, but even to this hour I cannot tell. At last the night in which I resolved to carry out my bloody action came, 
it was a fresh pure unclouded summer night a night too pure and beauteous to be sullied and overshadowed with so black a crime midnight had passed when i stole from my cottage hiding secreting myself in the shadows of the trees from the almost unclouded rays and brilliancy of the harvest moon till i reached a spot on the lawn within a few yards of where i knew my master lay i could hear his ravings his delirious laughter i knew he was helpless and weak i saw the dark servant issue from his sick master's chamber i feared i must have been discovered so near to me in the moonlight the black man stood the rest is known as my thoughts approach it i shut my eyes in horror if possible to shut out the scene but it cannot cannot be it must haunt me to the end i lived on as before to the outer world unchanged but over my inmost soul there hung the dark shadow which made me wish myself ten thousand leagues away the awful terror of the consciousness of my guilt and crime oh who can portray the murderer's night thoughts the remembrance of the victim's terror-stricken face the ghastly visions of gore-stained hands and now above all the gaping eternity of an angered insatiable hell as alone night by night i lay in my cottage thickly surrounded and canopied as it were with woodland leaves and trees who can picture my mental agony and remorse in every sighing wind which shook the trees i heard my dying victims moan to my terrified senses the midnight cry of the screech owl was distorted into some demoniacal hellish wail suspicion raged around me but i i the true murderer of my master escaped untouched unscathed by its damning breath then with renewed agony i saw the colored man massey arrested and tried suffering for the crime which i had committed his suffering punished me all the more as i knew how faithful he was to his trust as i knew that far from murdering his master he would have died to save his master's life the beauteous world of vernwood around me became in my sight as a very hell but i must remain for i knew that a hasty departure would at once direct attention and suspicion on to my own head but when in cooler moments i came to ponder over my deed what i asked myself what but woe and agony of spirit what shred of advantage had i won by the committal of my crime and the tempting devil whispering in my ear answered not one shred man what hast thou gained not one shred then in that perversity wherein the tempter returns ever to the assault of the weak and fallen soul like a harpy which attacks the weakling lamb and satan ever forsakes his own i again was tempted it was i who acting as house carpenter at vernwood was called in to screw down my master's coffin lid ere it was committed to the grave and as i did so i saw that as his hand rested across his bosom upon his long white finger there was enclosed and to be buried with the dead the costly jewel which he wore on the ring finger of his left hand and of this with that fatal perversity my misleading demon tempted me to covet the possession emboldened and hardened by my first sin by the accomplishment of his death i need scarcely tell how at night i proceeded to my late master's grave in the mausoleum how i dug down to the coffined dead and then turned back the screws by which i knew i had so recently coffined the body in its intended long last bed i looked again on my master's face from his finger i stole the costly ring with the great bodily strength which i possess urged by my demon to so damnable an act i dragged first the body and then the coffin from the grave again and again i committed insane and fatal blunders as every murderer does for satan ever forsakes his own possessed thus of the coveted valuable i took the earliest opportunity which i could do without exciting suspicion of quitting both vernwood and england and only congratulated myself with my being beyond danger when i landed again in new york 
I re-entered there the New York Lodge of the Brotherhood of the Sons of Cain, and was congratulated on what I had done. I congratulated myself, too, but my self-satisfaction and congratulation came too soon, for ere I had been long in the American city, I walked into the trap which had been so adroitly set. And this I sign as being the true confession of Michael Sullivan, alias Michael Gervois. Such, somewhat curtailed, but reproduced substantially in our language rather than in the imperfect phraseology of the writer, was the purport of the penned confession of his guilt, which came by some means into the American detective Vandermeulen's hands, and it threw for his benefit, as it throws for ours, considerable light on the once mysterious Vernwood case. But Colonel Vandermeulen felt that his work was not done, he felt that his elucidation of the enigma was not yet complete, that much in the eyes of the world was still unexplained, he felt that although justice had been dealt to the guilty, yet to maintain his place on the high pinnacle of reputation upon which it stood, yet more remained. He felt, too, more than ever, that the opinion which he had entertained, that the confidence which he had reposed in his helper, Paul Newgas, the little ferret man as we have called him, personally insignificant as he looked and seemed, had not been misplaced, for however insignificant and despised any one of us may seem to be, let him not despair, let him be assured that there is a mission and a place for him in life. End of section 32section thirty three of the heirloom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b the heirloom by t duthie lyle a woman's devotion but while these things were happening in england events which will bring to a crisis a consummation and as far as this book is concerned our narration of its incidents to a close were rapidly maturing in the city of new york that which is known upon the map of new york city as east twenty seventh street is also but less familiarly known by another name a name conveying it with a sense of human sorrow and human suffering it is likewise called via dolores the way of sorrow or the street of tears and from the many forms of human suffering which pass along it it is not by this name of sadness inaptly called as in the case with most of the other streets on the eastern side of the empire city the eastern extremity of this way of sorrow is bounded by the rushing rolling turbulent flood of the east river to which at intervals we have had to refer from almost the beginning to the end of our tale right down at the end of this street on what is known as first avenue by which it is cut at right angles built down almost upon the very water's edge stands a huge massive edifice or rather a group of massive buildings of hard blue stone as strong and durable in construction as if almost they were designed to resist some hostile invasion or a siege but since that area of the north american continent known collectively as the united states is quite large enough to accommodate comfortably any reasonable host of hostile forces which may appear on its horizon and to invite them to a friendly banquet or if it felt so disposed without any inconvenience at all to its vast resources to a five o'clock tea probably siege resisting fortifications in the vicinity of new york are less of a grim reality and more an ornamental name but still the massive structure to which we have referred has had doubtless much to do towards imparting to its adjacent thoroughfare the title of the street of tears for surrounded on every side by iron palings high and strong there stands here the institution known as bellevue hospital an institution dedicated to the assuasion and mitigation of all the long and melancholy category of humanity's physical sufferings and woes but as if this were not enough to impart to the adjacent street its doleful name 
beyond the bellevue hospital and standing built upon a framework of massive wooden piles beneath which the current of the east river actually flows a building of obvious intent erected and named in imitation of a similar place in the capital of france as a temporary reception and resting place of the bodies of the unknown dead there stands the new york morgue for like every other great city new york has its hidden unrecorded unutterable tales of human woes its tales of anguish and sorrow too heavy for human flesh and blood to bear and it perhaps by the revolver perchance by the assassin's knife or the secret crime but unlike its parisian prototype the morgue of new york is a plain square wooden frame structure without any ornamental or architectural pretense erected upon a platform laid over piles driven into the bed of the river and quite isolated from the land from this platform across the east river in a funeral boat to the cemeteries and interment grounds beyond long island city there sails on its final voyage the corpse of many a one whose earthly career has closed in darkness hidden shame or by the hand of crime and within those massive walls of bellevue hospital lay one some of the threads of whose life are interwoven with the weft of our tale for here week after week following the fire which we shortly described in long island city lay the man merville garnier in his sufferings upon a bed of pain the new york world reporter's graphic and minute account of how merville garnier perished in his brave attempt to save his lover kathleen venner's life drawn in skilful word painting as it was in all its sensational details in all its graphic pathetically told elements of romance was not quite true it was not true therefore it was a lie by one of those hair-breadth escapes one of those miraculous interpositions of providence because to the intelligent mind there exists no such thing as chance although together with the fall of the charred and burning fabric of the frame house the woman kathleen venner and her preserver had been precipitated apparently to inevitable destruction like as if into a furious cauldron of flame yet both man and woman had escaped with life escaped without injury they had not for although the woman by a more miraculous protection extended to her was comparatively almost unhurt yet her preserver merville garnier came very near indeed to paying for his temerity with his life for many weeks merville garnier lay in bellevue hospital he lay there his life uncertain like one suspended by a mere gossamer thread over the mouth of the grave but in the end medical science and skillful treatment aided by his own natural physical strength won the grim race against death and as he had saved kathleen venner his lover so she yearned in her ministrations to snatch him from the grave from the very jaws of death for what miracles cannot woman accomplish in the strength and fidelity of her love and now day by day through convalescence merville garnier was regaining and returning to a newness of life but while merville garnier was thus regaining life there was darkening and closing around him as some web entangling his footsteps an ever thickening cloud it must not be for a moment supposed that in all the weeks of van der Mulen's absence from new york that paul newgas in the hours and days of semi-inactivity into which he was thereby forced it must not be imagined that he had not pretty completely fathomed and disentangled all the mysterious circumstances connecting the man garnier with the long island city fire it must not be imagined that he did not know of the man's whereabouts his present state of recovery of convalescence and of his previous narrow escape with his life and the use to which paul newgas turned his knowledge we will proceed to weave into the tangled weft of our tale the exquisite dyes of the indian summer like the european tints of autumn were passing away and the shadows of evening were falling over new york city and state when we must again revert to a phase of our story now so nearly told within the precincts of bellevue hospital 
situated at the foot of east 27th street in the city of new york to which we have in cursory sentences already referred merville garnier or the man whom we know by that name although on the way to recovery was still suffering from the effects of his narrow escape for many weeks had he suffered exquisite tortures but this acute stage thanks to skillful treatment of his wounds had passed strange to tell the woman kathleen venner for whom whatever the relations between them were he entertained a strong affection an affection which was returned with the strength of a woman's love when with the falling framework and timbers of the burning domicile in long island city both were dashed into what was a roaring sea of flame strange to tell the preserver came within a shadow as it were of losing his life while the woman his lover kathleen venner whom he risked his life to save from destruction came through and out of the terrible ordeal of flame and the terrible danger comparatively unhurt almost by fire unscathed and now through days and nights of agony and convalescence as far as the rules of the institution allowed day by day and night by night she was tending his wants with all the solicitude of a woman's passion and a woman's love but this we will pass over for another view of the scene while kathleen venner ministered daily to her lover merville garnier's necessities as far as she could in bellevue hospital while she visited him in his pain while she smoothed his pillow or with luscious fruits moistened his parched tongue with a womanly instinct if we may call it so an instinct which is even a higher attribute than reason she came to know that a great cloud was rising at first no bigger than a man's hand upon their horizon which threatened to surround to engulf his and their life and lives although she loved him with a woman's love yet she knew that there was much in his life which was obscured in mystery was hidden from her eyes for woman's love too often for her own good like the enfolded eyes of justice shuts out the light of reason and is blind for love is the subtlest attribute of nature while possessing much that is beautiful heavenly angelic saint-like yet is full of anomalies which we cannot fathom for while love is the sharpest eyed of all human passions yet it is blind and so kathleen venner although she loved merville garnier with a woman's love yet with the woman's intuition she became sensible that some danger loomed lowered very darkly and threateningly across the horizon of his life how she became thus sensible of danger impending we shall not attempt to say but there is a knowledge deeply hidden deeply embedded down in the profounder depths of natures both brute and human which we call intuition when we apply the term to a human being and which we call instinct when we apply it to a brute although the subject is one on which we might enlarge infinitely yet we must perforce leave it and pass on and while this woman ministered to the man's daily necessities she was the sentinel which watched for danger with a restless vigil and sleepless eyes but the cloud which we have said was no bigger than a man's hand appeared on their horizon was rapid in its development and notwithstanding kathleen venner's watchfulness was quick to enlarge to expand and to burst it was in the cold twilight of the november evening that suddenly as she sat in her poorly ill-furnished third-floor lodgings at no great space from where her lover lay that she became aware of the impending bursting of the storm a bribed female caller had whispered something in her ear which caused the blood which coursed through her veins to chase more quickly to run cold and her ears to tingle and her heart to beat more quickly for him she loved she rushed from the miserable room which was now all she called her own for her home and her belongings she had lost escaping only and barely with that with her lover and her life she rushed to where he lay or rather to where he now sat in a convalescent ward and quickly she reached his side for god's sake breathlessly she half whispered in his ear come hence escape for your life 
then she half dragged half supported him from the ward through the wide passages and corridors of the hospital past where the janitors should have stopped their exit but by some inscrutable interposition of the hand of providence they were unobserved or allowed to pass till still half urging half dragging she gained with her burden the outer gate and then passed the high strong iron palings by which the massive structure of the hospital is surrounded on every side they stood in the street and as she thought free to hasten him away but kathleen venner's heart seemed to leap into her mouth her brain seemed to whirl as instead of aiding her lover in his escape from justice she seemed to have dragged him into the very jaws of death or into the very hands of those who hunted for his liberty and his life for within fifty paces of the spot where they stood upon the pavement there hurried along in the direction of the hospital from whence the lovers had just come paul newgas with two men whom she recognized only too surely as being officers of the new york city police in her extremity in the weakened state of her lover she saw the apparently inevitable she scarcely saw one glimmer of hope then she dragged him down the street to the brink of the surging flood of the east river and then right on to the wooden framework over the rushing tide upon which stood that plain sinister wooden structure which we have already spoken of the new york morgue hoping within its dark shadows to escape but it was a vain a slender a forlorn hope a glance over her shoulder told her that the sharp eyes which she so dreaded were upon them they were recognized by paul newgas and his confederates and pursued was there no hope was all despair beneath the wooden framework of the foundations of the morgue building the rushing rolling tide of the east river dashed and surged and foamed past them with all the turbulence of its rushing seaward flow veritably a boiling chilling flood but slender as the chance was it seemed to be the pursued man's only hope in his days of perfect health and strength merville garnier could have plunged with confidence could have stemmed and fought and overcome the tide could have swum without danger of failure of his strength to the opposite shore but now he was weakened death behind him death before which death should he choose was a question she then momentarily asked but he preferred the mercy of the merciless sea scan as it was to his chances of mercy at the hands of man there was a plunge from the framework platform of the morgue and in the semi-gloom of that cold american october night he disappeared from view the woman kathleen venner fell upon her knees in the coldness of the night and clasping her hands she stretched them heavenward o oh god o oh heaven she ejaculated preserve his life o oh god preserve his life scarcely had merville garnier escaped ere paul newgas and his men were upon her as with their own eyes they saw the enactment of the perilous scene and raving at their loss for the second time have we had to tell in this story that the east river receiving into its cold embrace had cheated the little ferret man of his prey paul newgas stamped he raved he cursed he swore but of what avail but the poor body of merville garnier what shall we tell of that tossed on the turbulent dancing waves as their veriest plaything their veriest toy thrown hither dashed thither the body of merville garnier towards the great broad boundless swelling ocean senseless his body drifted out with the tide end of section thirty three Section 34 of The Heirloom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heirloom by T. Duthie Lyle. Section 34, Volume 3, Chapter 7, More Light while thus, as if by the infallible will of heaven the light of its omniscience shines athwart the gloom, 
dispelling into the clearness of day the dark clouds which once hung about the mystery of the Vernwood tragedy with the impenetrable density of a pall, while the true assassin of Bertram Gallant had been brought to light and justice by the instrumentality in the hands of Providence of so humble an agent as a dog, while justice had claimed her own, the murderer's sin had been avenged and his crime had been requited with his life. While this had been accomplished, yet other circumstances combined to effect a still more transparent elucidation of the enigma of the case. There have been those, the advocates of the horrid system of slavery, upon which the telling of this story is based, who have claimed that the absolute ownership, control, property, and power over the weak by the strong the subserviency of the enslaved to the will of the rich and free, that those enthralled descendants of the African race who in those days ministered, though in bondage, to the wealth of the Southern American states, enjoyed greater benefits in the care of humane ownership than if they were free. It has been claimed, if we may use a parallel simile, in effect, that because the horse or the cow or the ass was dependent on man for his daily needs and troubled not his head for the bread of the morrow, the condition of the horse or the cow or the ass was more desirable than that of man. But this is a line of argument, an analogy however far absurd it may be or the reverse, which, coming within the province of the economist or the statesman rather than the fictionist or storyteller, we will not trouble to pursue. It is a generation now since the die was cast and the fatal veto given and a dastardly system of human barter and thraldom forever overthrown. Whether in civilization or barbarism, slavery has now been recognized as a stupendous blot and through the round world its practices have been voted a disgrace to civilization, its bulwarks assailed and its strongholds overthrown. As we hinted in the early explanatory pages of this story, the explosion of this system, which has so long since been weighed in the balances of true intelligence, rectitude, and justice, and found wanting in every element of virtue, righteousness, and good, was as the blasting of a mine. The uncomely fabric was overthrown, and its ruins, its debris, its component parts, were by the force of the terrific disaster, if disaster we may call it, a disaster wrought, albeit that it might produce good, hurled to the farthest corners of the earth and scattered as to the winds of heaven. Among the items of human wreckage which had been uprooted from the alien soil in which it had been implanted was a deeply colored family which, subsequent to the emancipation decree, had located and employed themselves, or rather when they could find an employer had been employed, about the docks and shipping interest in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. This family of colored people consisted of a father and mother and some four or five younger branches, and rather unusual to tell, they formed practically an unbroken family circle, that is, a family circle unbroken, undivided by the slave trader's ruthless hand, for the now aging couple had, during their days of bondage, been spared that poignant soul-embittering anguish which many and many a slave parent had suffered of seeing their offspring ruthlessly torn from their bosom, rent forever asunder or sold by auction for gold before their very eyes. But the colored family to which we allude had, previous to the death of their master and owner at the Battle of Five Forks, and previous to emancipation, had been the property of Hubert Gonald who, as we have said, was one of those planters, for there were planters, and planters in those days, slave owners and slave owners, for while some were not unkind, others were mere devils incarnate in the treatment of their slaves, who was a humane and considerate master. This family consisted of the father and mother, Jeff and Martha, and four or five brothers and sisters of the Jules Massey, who has occupied a not despicable position throughout the course of this tale. After all, 
blighting and deliriatous as is the influence of the curse of slavery upon any country or community in which it takes root, there may have been some grains of truth in the assertion of its advocates that the slave was better off under the protection of a master than dependent on his own resources and free. For certainly, so hard is the battle to be fought to win the good things of this life, that it may require a training to fit him for the fray, and a race which has spent its generations in downtrodden subserviency and ignorance must emerge from such a school, it must be admitted, but indifferently acquitted to maintain its own in the golden strife. Moreover, on the American continent, and perhaps throughout the world, there exists a prejudice in the minds of those whose skins are white, inimical to those whose skins are black for the pale-faced races have ever been the dominant factors in the work of civilization, and must we not add the work, too often also, of demoralization throughout the generations and histories of men. And as Jules Massey was in a highly prosperous vein, as if he had struck ore, and as all the other members of his house were dependent on their own resources, and their own resources seemed a poor resource upon which to be dependent, their existence was one, which Jules, in the tenderness of his heart and yearning affection toward his parents, too well knew. In plain terms, while Jules Massey was prosperous and independent, even for him in affluence, his parents and brethren and those of his father's house were the reverse. And as Jules Massey's heart, as well as his pocket, bled copiously and continuously for the impecuniosity of those of his kith and kin, it occurred to Jules that it would be no greater extravagance on his part to do the large share which he did towards the maintenance of those of his family in London than it would in the city of Baltimore, where their own untrained incapacity, combined with that prejudice which we have said, more especially at the date of our story, was in some quarters very strong against the black-skinned race. They earned, to use a homely phrase, scarcely enough to keep together their bodies and their souls. It was under such circumstances as these, therefore, that, being left to the pursuit of his own unembarrassed desires, Jules Massey, soon after the events surrounding his late master's murder and all the evils which followed in its train, when the terrible storm had gone by and left him an untrammeled agent and free, and perhaps to interrupt the monotony of his now idle life, resolved that his father and mother should at his expense visit British shores. And so, leaving the younger scions to shift for themselves in the city of Baltimore as best they might, to England Martha Massey for the second time, and old Jeff for the first time came. If he had sprung from the same level and the same stock, the contrast between the highly civilized jewels, now fairly imbued with the European ways of thought, and his kith and kin was as a great gulf fixed. But if Jules was thus highly civilized, as we have seen, and, in his own estimation at least, a very genteel person indeed, perhaps almost as important in his own eyes as his late master had been in his, in the heyday of all his luxuriance and wealth, yet beneath his black skin there was the true grit, and Jules' heart had never gone very far awry. If Jules was vain and conceited to the backbone, his heart had ever kept fair and square and true. Magnified as he had become, there was not a spark, not a scintilla in him of that most despicable of all the despicable shapes of human pride and folly which makes a man forget, or that most noble and exalted form of humility and manliness which makes a man remember, however humble they may be, the kith and kin from whose level he has arisen, to his higher estate. Old Jeff Massey, woolly-headed, horny-handed, grizzle-bearded, stalwart old nigger that he was, of true African descent, a genuine specimen of the southern plantation freed slave, whom his late owner, Hubert Gonault, might at any moment of his life have sold as a horse or a dog. Martha Massey, a freed slave woman such as many owners in the old slave-owning days, now happily gone, had kept just as they would have kept a cow for what she was worth and sold her children from her bosom just as it would have suited their convenience for the profit they would make 
or used her in other ways too iniquitous even to name. Such were the enormities of slave life. Such parents as these, Jules Massey, because they were his parents, would have acknowledged in the presence of a king, for Jules had vanity and conceit. He had very little of that most despicable pride. But as we have often said before, the slave property of the late Bertram Gonald's late father, Hubert Gonald, had never while in his possession been reduced to such utter depths of degradation as these. In the English seeing eyes of the old, dead planter slaves were human beings. And then came the voyage. To old Jeff Massey as he crossed the great ocean, the wonders of the deep were marvelous wonders indeed. And as day after day the prow of the great steamer clave the illimitable sea, his astonishment never seemed to abate. Then, as he stood in the midst of London, in the great seas and tides of human activity and life which never ceased the monotony of their constant ebb and flow, he marveled almost still more. But in the eyes of Jeff, the splendid jeweled and gilded personality of his own son Jules, his fashionably cut cloth, his tall silk hat of spotless sheen, his upright form, his haughty air, this in the eyes of the old Negro slave Jeff was the greatest marvel of all. That his own son Jules should come to be such a fine gentleman was almost what he could not believe. We need not pursue the daily life of the trio in London. It were indeed needless almost to introduce the episode of their visit into these pages had it not been for the means of casting an enlightening radiance across the track so obscured in mystery of this tale. Had Jules Massey mailed to his parents all the press accounts which appeared of the terrible event of Bertram Gonald's death and the dark cloud through which he himself was passing, the illiteracy of old Jeff and Martha would have precluded them from availing themselves of the information. For compulsory ignorance, not compulsory education, was the rule of bondage in the old slave days. If Jules had had to die a felon's death by the hangman's hand, it would have been better far that his parents should be spared the humiliation and pain, better far than all remembrance of his name be blotted out. But now all the storm clouds around this terrific avalanche of woe had cleared, blown away, and for the first time Jules spoke of them to old Jeff and Martha face to face. As the black pair sat in their son's plainly furnished, plainly garnished little London room, which they considered very, very snug quarters indeed. So they were, no doubt, after the log cabin on a Virginian plantation which had been old Jeff's idea and ideal of home. As they sat there listening to all the saddening narrative of the tale which we have unfolded, which you, dear reader, step by step have been told, of Bertram Gonald's flight, if flight we may call it, from his Virginian home at Millbank, of his successful suit to establish his claim to his ancient home, of his rise to wealth and splendor, and then of his mysterious murder and untimely death, then of Jules' arrest and liberation, then of the strange rumors which came to Jules' ears. For you must know, dear reader, that Jules knew much less than we have told you of the movements of Colonel Vandermeulen and his little ferret man in New York of Bertram having been seen alive in New York. The once slave parents looked at their son and listened to all he said in astonishment expressed, rather than in words, by widely open mouths and eyes. For it is often by such facial contortions that surprise is expressed more plainly than in words. And thus Jules Massey told his parents the whole ghastly tale. We need not reproduce here that which Jules Massey's parents, old Jeff and Martha, told their son that they too knew, for we prefer rather to tell it in the sequel than in the text. And when Jules Massey heard what his parents could tell him, it was then Jules's turn to open his eyes and mouth widely with surprise. And so in the sequel we will tell our tale. It was within 24 hours of Jules and his parents' interchange of narratives 
that the door opened of Mr. Lumley's office near Lincoln's Inn Fields, and to the surprise and amusement of the array of Mr. Lumley's clerks, three black faces appeared. At this uncommon apparition of three black faces, where the usual topics of consideration were broad acres and broad cloth, a subdued twitter arose, and some of the young gentlemen of Mr. Lumley's staff did not refrain from breaking forth into a broad grin, till one, more self-controlled than the rest, suppressed his risible desires into a certain external gravity of face, and requested of Jules Massey, for to Jules Massey and his parents did the three black faces belong, what his pleasure might be. Jules replied that his pleasure was an interview with Mr. Lumley, and very soon in Mr. Lumley's presence the three dusky forms stood. Jules had acquired some of the manner of good English society, as well as some of its heirs, so rather than at all obsequiously, he shook the great conveyancer quite cordially, quite genially by the hand. But when Jules introduced his immediate forebears, the salutation with which they expressed their pleasure or respect for Mr. Lumley, was of a less civilized, more ludicrous sort, and which brought an ill-suppressed smile even onto the lawyer's white face. Please, Mr. Lumley, father and mother had something to tell you which I thought you might like to hear, which might throw a little more light on poor master's death, Jules began very sorrowfully. Yes, said the lawyer with an encouraging, not to say patronizing look at the black pair, and of which each of them acknowledged again the condescension with salutation of an indescribable kind. Lawyers, Mr. Lumby, my jewels, he has just been a-telling we this here dreadful tale of our poor young Massa Bertram's murder, broke in Martha Massey, too full of it and too full of womanhood to restrain the event in her overwhelming heart. Then, of course, you knew your son's late master, the lawyer asked but I think if I remember rightly, you were an important witness in this suit to recover some years ago, the Vernwood estate. Ta sakes, yes, Mr. Lumby, dat I were, Martha continued. Knowed our poor young massa, Massa Bertram? Guess I did known. Why, locks, ain't I a nust in my arms dis here many a time when old massa him's father were at Millbank? Knowed him when he was a teeny weeny child and I were just a scrap of a gal like. And our old massa gone out comed, and he bought the mill blank plantation, and took me over with the rest of the hands and the stock when I were a youngin. Mammy telled me as how I were flung into the deal, cause one of the colts broke his leg and didn't count for nothing when massa gone out bought the farm and the stock off the old massa peas. The London lawyer looked quizzically at Martha Massey at this outburst as she stood before him in a gaudy shawl recounting to him this tale of a state of society which to his English-bred way of thinking was so foreign and strange, that dark human being thrown into a deal to replace a broken-legged colt. Yet Mr. Lumley was intensely interested in what she had to tell. So then you knew your old master Hubert Gonald when he first came to live on the Millbank plantation, he asked. Noden? Why, sir, not Noden, Martha replied. Old Massa Gonald, him come, so twere said, from down south where he'd made a pile of money into silver mines, and come to Millbank with him's new wife, a real smart one, one of your tip toppers, a real beauty she were, but lord, the very double for all her beautiful looks. And you knew your late master's son from his birth? Mr. Lumley asked. Laura! Sure I knowed all three of them, didn't I? Three of what? asked Mr. Lumley, gazing earnestly back into the black face, all eyes and ears, and a strange expression spread over his pallid countenance. Why, knowed old Massa Hubert Gonald's three children. You mean to say Hubert Gonald had three children, three sons? asked Mr. Lumley in surprise. My good lord! Sartin sure he had, tree, all born the same time, one as like the other two as tree peas out of the same pod. Good God, the great lawyer sprung to his feet. There was a look of blank surprise upon his livid face. Triplets, 
he gasped. But so great was his astonishment that he had hardly breath to utter the word. The very idea of throwing a great light onto so much that was mysterious seemed to take away his breath. Miss, triples, said the black woman. That's what them's called. Then tell me what you know, Mr. Lumley asked excitedly. Well, sir, Mr. Lumley, you see, toward this here way, this here's just what happened. Our old massa, the massa Lee at the Millbank Plantation, him get down, don't know how, but him get down very, very poor. But that were afore my time, like, weren't it, Jeff? Jeff nodded assent. Then the day come, and old Massa Lee him go dead broke, and obliged to sell up the plantation, and sell all the hens, and the stock, and cotton crop on the plantation, everything. Then Massa Gunnell, him come, come from down south, Mexico or somewhere, I've been told. Him come with him fine Spanish wife to Millbank, to Massa Gunnell, him to bury best Massa for the niggers on the plantation in all them parts. Lord, what a time we did have. What shines, what capers, what shindies with them all darkies. But Massa Gono, him have quarrels like the very furies with the fine Spanish wife, till the upshot on it were Massa, he turned the fine wife out of the house. Cause Massa, him think she too fond of the young brother of old Massa Lee. But afore that, these here three children come into the world. Tree, all the same time, the same day. All there, just as like as tree peas out of the same pod. And I nussed them all tree, Lord, I nussed them all tree at once. Couldn't tell neither one from daughter two, nor tutter from both. And all tree marked on the right cheek. Every one like the other two. Warn him, Jeff, ain't that true? Ah, uh, never seed nothing like it, Jeff replied. Never did. The lawyer stared at the old negress during her remarkable narrative with the incredulous look of a man who could scarcely credit the evidence of his own ears. Well, sir, continued Martha Massey, then Massa gone out. Him had another shine with Mrs. about the chillin, cause they both claims all the tree. So what they do, they draws lots for the children. Then her Massa gone out, him get the one, and the missus get the other two of them that are children, the Lord knows which two, cause nobody except the mother couldn't tell nor a one from the other two. A broad smile passed over Mr. Lumley's features at the strangest of strange histories. He would have disbelieved every word of it, would have treated it as a wild fabrication, had it not been brought to him by Jules Massey, who sat near, a silent listener to all that was being said, and in Jewel's veracity and true-heartedness, he had the fullest faith. Then did the wife of your master leave the home at Millbank? Mr. Lumley asked. Lord, yes. Massa gone out, him go off on horseback one day, and when he come back, the missus were gone with her two children, and I never seed her after that. I never set eyes on her again. And do you know where she went? No, never heard, sartin but guess she went down south, and we never seed nor she nor the two children again. None of the hands didn't. And what became of the other child? The lawyer asked. Master Bertram, dad it were, replied Martha. Him stop at Millbank. I nussed and knowed all the time of his grown up like right up to the time when the war came. Then our old massa and young massa Bertram, they both go off to the war, and our old massa him get killed. Then, all the niggers on the plantation rise up against the overseer, and every nigger went just when and where he liked best. Lord, Massa Lummy, never were there such times like them are. Never were, never were. And did you see Mr. Bertram after that? asked Mr. Lumley. No, except that there were just one day. Him come back to Millbank regular broke down like, cause old Massa him's father dead, and the old home broke up, and all the niggers gone where the Lord knows where. Then him, young Master Bertram, dad it were, him come to our cabin, cause I and Jeff and the young'uns we stopped there. Poor young Master Bertram, him regular broke-hearted like, 
So the next day, Master Bertram asked Jules, and they two went off together. Lord knows where they went. But I only bless the Lord that my Jules, he ain't killed. And such a fine gentleman, too. And as Martha Massey said so, she cast an admiring eye on the dark, well-dressed son near her, a look of maternal pride. The rest of the tale needs no telling, for the place where Martha Massey left off in her narrative was just about the epoch, where many years ago, the London conveyancer's connection with Bertram Gonald and the Vernwood romance began. But Martha Massey's story threw, for Mr. Lumley, a great light into the deeper, profounder recesses of what there was once so mysterious and inexplicable in the circumstances of Bertram Gonald's birth and history and life and death. The mists of doubt and uncertainty had blown aside and left in the eye of his mind a dissolution of the enigma which for years had been puzzling and perplexing him, a view as clear as when in the physical world a traveler gains an alpine summit and sees from its altitude as far as his eye can reach an uninterrupted view of the lower world. End of section 34 Read by Paul Hampton Section 35 of The Heirloom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 35 of The Heirloom by T. Duthy Lyle Volume 3, Chapter 8 Birds of a Feather Brought Together but Merville Garnier was not dead. With that reckless daring and contempt for danger which marked the few acts in which he has come under our notice, like as he survived the seething cauldron of leaping, roaring flame in which that clever world's reporter told its readers that he was burnt to a cinder in Long Island City, so likewise he survived the perilous leap which he had taken to save his life by trusting it to the scant mercy of the boiling tide. Verily, the man seemed to live a charmed existence. Or perhaps like that feline quadruped, which purrs so complacently on the domestic hearth, Merville Garnier may be credited with a singular plurality of lives. In the early dawn of the November morning, following the night upon which the woman Kathleen Venner had warned him of his near-approaching danger, and of the coming of Paul Nugas with his two officers of the New York police. In the early dawn of that November morning, the coasting schooner Chesapeake Bell, bound for New York from the south with a cargo of fruit, when near the mouth of the East River, off Governor's Island, ran nearly foul of an inanimate mass which was upon a log drifting out with the tide. By the master's orders, the Chesapeake Bell hove to, a boat was lowered, and the apparently drowned body of a human being was lifted on board and lay on the deck of the schooner livid, motionless, and to all appearances dead. Having, however, no taste for such cargo on board his vessel as a missing corpse, the captain of the Chesapeake Bell directed that the body should be taken ashore. But whither? There was only one receptacle for such flotsam as dead men's bodies picked up off the surface of the sea, and that was the morgue. So in less than twelve hours from his desperate leap for liberty and life, Merville Garnier was brought back to the very spot from which he had cast himself so recklessly and daringly onto the scant clemency of the merciless tide. The body was deposited in a chamber of the lugubrious office. Then incessantly, hour after hour for many hours, those restorative measures were persevered in, which those attached to the institution knew well, only by too frequent experience, how to employ until finally perseverance was crowned with success, and the once apparently dead man Merville Garnier again opened his eyes. The blood again, though at first sluggishly, coursed through his veins, 
Little by little, warmth, animation, and mental consciousness returned. Having recovered thus far, Garnier was removed from the morgue to within the precincts of the Bellevue Hospital, where he was, of course, soon recognized and known, and before many hours had elapsed, the devotion of Kathleen Venner again brought her to her lover's bedside, for she and her love was as vigilant as was the little ferret man Paul Nugas in his pursuit of his quarry to the death. The written story and confession of the Vernwood crime by the convict Michael Gervois, which as well as to the knowledge of Colonel Vandermeulen, had likewise come into Mr. Lumley's hands. This written account, coupled with the remarkable tale related to him by Martha and old Jeff Massey, had the effect of widely opening Mr. Lumley's eyes, of widely extending his knowledge of the once obscure history of Bertram Gunnalt's unusual birth a manner of birth as uncommon as had been his manner of life and manner of death, and of the tragedy of his untimely fate. He now saw that there had been an influence, or influences at work beneath the surface of the dark tide of crime, which had rolled so sinistrously along, of which before he had no cognizance, had never dreamed. A rough, popular adage has it that there is a woman at the bottom of everything. And, deleterious as, alas, the influence of woman has too often been in this world for ill, it is certain that her presence in the world has likewise oftener been a stupendous influence for good. The mother's affectionate and kindly solicitude, the wife's guidance through the darkest as well as the brightest hours of life, or in weakest childhood, the support of a sister's hand. All have been influences for earthly good, which oft and oft have guided men through the storms of earth to the haven of heaven. With a lawyer's experience and acumen, and the sagacity of the man of the world, Mr. Lumley saw that there was an influence at work of which till now he had never dreamed. The marriage of the once wild, wandering, debt-laden, exiled Hubert Gonald to the beautiful Spanish-Mexican woman, her presentation to her husband of the three sons at one birth, their marvelous likeness each to each, then her subsequent separation from her husband with her two sons chosen by lot, the growth of Bertram to manhood were the first four scenes. Then Hubert Gonald's rise to affluence as a Virginian planter, his service under General Lee in the Confederate Army, and subsequent death at the Battle of Five Forks, and ruin of his estate at Millbank by the American War and the freedom of his slaves, closed the first part. The subsequent recovery by the son of the old English ancestral home, the jealousy of the hot-blooded, discarded Spanish-Mexican wife, and the affiliation of the Mexican murder society calling themselves the Sons of Cain, the perpetration by the emissary of the Brotherhood of the ghastly crime which we have described, alas, but too successfully achieved by Michael Sullivan, alias Michael Gervois. And here the curtain falls. All this, when the lawyer pieced together incident by incident, piece by piece, as a child places piece by piece of some puzzle or picture map, combining all into one comprehensive picture, into one harmonious whole, formed a puzzle which he quite admitted to himself that, but for the cuteness of the American detective, he could never have solved. But when all the once mysterious acts of the drama arose clearly in the London lawyer's mind, it seemed to him as if he gazed on a picture drawn by some weird imagination, guiding an artistic hand, or like the page of some romance. But even now, Mr. Lumley felt the drama was not complete. He felt that one act remained unplayed. It was an act in which he felt that it was his to play the leading part. The murderer, Michael Gervoir, in the written confession which we have reproduced, admitted that he was guilty of the crime of Bertram Gonald's murder. But in qualifying his guilt and protesting his innocence, 
the murderer confessed and declared as before his God that he owed his late master no ill will. He wrote that in the perpetration of the crime which he had committed and for which he was about to die, he was but the tool, the mere cat's paw in other hands. And in the truth of this part of the written confession, Mr. Lumley now fully believed. He therefore saw it as his duty again to act, resolved upon another coup, and again he called in the shrewdness, which he had by this time come fully to recognize, of Colonel Vandermeulen to his aid. We will again raise the curtain and shift the scene. Twice, to his intense disgust, had the little ferret man Paul Nugas lost the scent of his game. Twice he had been outwitted and befooled. Twice his quarry had eluded his grasp. But Paul Nugas uttered an irreligious oath that rather than again be frustrated, he would follow Merville Garnier into the East River or to anywhere beyond where the water wasn't cold. And Paul Nugas meant to keep his iniquitous vow. During these days, Colonel Vandermeulen, as an actor under the assumed and stage name of Wedmore Summers, never for a day lost sight of Lawrence Houghton, his familiar chum. If the lasso had to be thrown upon the wind, or the net to be cast upon the waters, he resolved that the throw should be accomplished with an unerring and a masterly hand. And a past master in his art, we have ever said Colonel Vandermeulen was. And so the snare was sprung. On the same day, and to prevent all collusion, and allowing for the difference between New York and London time, perhaps almost in the same hour, the two men of whom we have spoken throughout these pages as Lawrence Houghton and Merville Garnier were arrested, the former in London, the latter in New York, and charged with being, in the manner of the crime of the murder of the master of Vernwood, accessories before and after the fact. Under an extradition warrant, Merville Garnier was brought to England to be tried together with his brother, Lawrence Houghton, in an English court, for his crime. It is now no longer necessary for the purposes of our story that we should maintain around these two men the veil of incognito and the obscurity which we have cast about their identity and their names. To prevent all possibility of communication or collusion, the men were imprisoned, previous to their appearance in court, in different parts of the country, in different jails. At length, the day appointed for the hearing of the case arrived. The great London conveyancer, Mr. Lumley, occupied a seat at the solicitor's table of the court. The magistrates took their seats on the bench. The preliminary business of the court was gone through, none of which we need detail. And then at last, the two men whose crimes no longer hoodwinked, deceived, or misled the keen, clear-sighted scrutiny of the law and whose tricks the sagacity of Colonel Vandermeulen, aided, let us not forget, by his persevering little ferret man, had overcome, stood side by side in the dock of an English court. All eyes were directed to them, as in charge of constables they appeared. The curiosity of the community had been aroused, as we have often ere now said in the case and they stood before a packed and crowded court. But here again was a new surprise. As the two prisoners entered the dock, Mr. Lumley raised his eyes. My reader, have you ever been addicted to that treacherous weakness of humanity, that insidious device of the wicked one to affect the overthrow of your reason, by tempting you to imbibe just so much of the cup which inebriates just so much that your eyes play your reason false and seem to multiply every person or everything you look upon by two? If you have, you have some idea of how Mr. Lumley felt when he first beheld the prisoners at the bar. He asked himself whether or not, 
by some blundering, the prisoners had been brought up separately, or whether, ere coming into court that morning, he had not partaken of just one glass too many of that fine dry clicquot which muddled his head while it rejoiced his heart, and caused both his eyes to see at once what they ought by natural optical law to behold at twice. For there before his eyes stood the twin brothers, who, however they had shrouded themselves in mystery, and sought to conceal their identity upon the misleading veil of fictitious names, by the scant flattery and unvarnished truth of blind-eyed justice, stood before the world and before that tribunal, instead of Merville Garnier and Lawrence Houghton, brothers, two out of the three triplets, sons of the same parents born in the same hour on the same day as the remaining member of that strange trio, the murdered Bertram Gonald. The wondrous similarity of the two brothers, as they stood in the dock each to each, and of both to the late Bertram Gonald, filled with amazement the minds of all. There were the same tall forms, the same intellectual faces, the same stature and the right cheek of each brother by a birthmark, which had affected or disfigured all three alike, was similarly scarred. Similarly, curled mustaches, and frequently there played on the face of each the same mocking, sardonic, Mephistophelian smile. Moreover, they were similarly dressed, and when the four long white hands rested on the front of the docks, the ring digit of each left hand was adorned by a similar sapphire ring, facsimiles of the genuine heirloom with which they had been provided by their discarded Spanish-Mexican mother, who had been the chief plotter in the crime. To all who beheld it, the likeness appeared as whimsical, if we can apply such a term to the men in such a place, as it was miraculous, astonishing, and strange. To Colonel Vanderbulen, who sat in court, all the puzzling occurrences in connection with the perplexing case were explained. The scales of doubt and embarrassment completely fell from his marveling eyes. To Mr. Lumley and those in court who had been intimate with Bertram Gonald in life, the perfect likeness of the three brothers each to the other was all the more startling and strange. It was one of those freaks which nature, perhaps in her hours of idleness or dalliance, plays with creation and on man. But out of the labyrinth of puzzledom, into which nature and this strange freak of her erratic fancy had caused these men whom we have employed in the elaboration of this story to be involved, we will pass on to the consummation of our tale. The magisterial inquiry into the guilt of the two men Lawrence and Mervyn Gonald for being accessories to the murder of their brother Bertram passed off. Space does not allow us, and it is unnecessary to follow the details of the evidence adduced. With regard to them, justice was not swift. Her feet seemed hampered and fettered, and the clean hands of the blinded goddess for once seemed tied. Then there was a remand, for evidence sufficiently strong to convict seemed very difficult to find, for if justice is clear-eyed, her movements are deliberate and slow. There was, as we know, the written confession of Michael Gervois, the real murderer, but that document was hidden away in the pigeonholes of dogged officialism and straight-laced red tape. Besides, being a posthumous document, it was of no sufficient value as evidence to convict in the eye of the law of so serious a crime. Then there was another formal magisterial examination of the prisoners, and another, and another formal remand. Then a serious matter arose before Mr. Lumley's prosecution. A serious stumbling block was thrown in his path. The late possessor being dead, and the title deeds of beautiful Vernwood going a-begging for an owner, the two surviving brothers Gonald, through a clever conveyancing lawyer, as clever perhaps, and a little more so, and a deal less scrupulous and respectable than the great conveyancer Mr. Lumley himself, claim the estate. 
The quirks and quibbles of British law are apt to turn queerly round, and the pros and cons of a case may resolve themselves into curious conclusions in incongruous holes. And thus now it became a question whether the two men in custody would be the winners of a wealthy estate or the losers themselves of life, liberty, and all that the world holds dear. Then into that which took place at a private interview in Mr. Lumley's office, we will not too severely thrust the probe of our inquiring pen. Lawyers may have, and often have, strange reasons for doing strange things, and secrets enacted within the closed doors of lawyers' offices, like the utterances of the confessional, may be too sacred to know the light. Perhaps justice was cheated and deluded of her true own, but what is known is that the prosecution of the two brothers, Lawrence and Mervyn Gonald, was abandoned, and they stood upon English soil as free men. Whatever compromise was arrived at, however Mr. Lumley peddled with or lent himself to play into the hands of crime, we shall never probably be told. Perhaps Mr. Lumley had an eye to those future golden days when he should be released from the trammels and martyrdom of the law, and perhaps the distant vision arose upon his eyes of beautiful Vernwood and some longed for a future as his own beautiful home. But this is mere surmise. We know not. We have said that lawyers have strange reasons for doing strange things. If that was Mr. Lumley's dreams, it was, as we must show, a dream to be dashed, to fade and vanish as the dreamer awoke. End of section 35 Read by Paul Hampton Section 36 of The Heirloom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read to you by J.P. Lyle The Heirloom by T. Duthie Lyle St. Xavier's but, my dear reader, there is still a chapter of this story which remains untold. Perhaps you'll reproach me. Perhaps you'll ask, wherefore has this chapter been left till now? Why has an episode been allowed to drop as if we're out of this tale? It may be a chapter, like a day of sorrow, but having in it rays of genteel gladness and a sunset of brightness and joy. Verily, this whole bulk may be one overclouded tragedy of sadness, Nay, had not this chapter had to be written, perhaps this whole sanguinary drama would have never been acted or its history have to be told. Destiny is merely a fiction and a name. We cannot mold the world to our poor wills and little aims, for oft as man may be made the instrument in higher hands to higher ends, the making of history is the function of vaster omniscience, a more universal omnipresence than we, in our most splendid dreams, or the most magnificent flights of our circumscribed imaginations can conceive. For when man postures on the world stage, too oft he forgets how infinitesimal a thing he is, the greatest of his kind, but as the grass which springs up into life to flourish only for a span, or as a leaf which must be green for a season and then fall inevitably to the ground, an atom among the countless atoms of his race, even the great round world in which we live out our short lives is but one among a universe of countless worlds. The wiser we become, the more completely do we realize our own insignificance in relation to infinite time and space. But leaving such reflections as these, we will return to our tale. It was a peaceful, placid Sabbath morn. Over the wide expanse of the landlocked southern Irish bay known as Cork, or Queenstown Harbour, and upon the gentle slopes of its hills, valleys, and lochs, as they came undulating to the shore, a bright and genteel sun shone softly down upon the emerald isles and upon its landlocked waters, making it appear for the nonce a matter of difficulty to comprehend wherefore the water too round the emerald isles might not with equal right claim to the title of the emerald sea, for on this particular Sabbath morn, the translucence of the ocean seemed to reflect the hues of earth and all creation to be pervaded by a restful, calm repose. 
here and there dotted over, and within the shelter of the broad and noble harbor, a few craft, mostly grain-laden merchant vessels, lay at anchor, and like land and sea they lay at rest. On the quays and the wharfs at the mouth of the River Lee, which with the many villas on its picturesquely rising banks connects Queenstown with the city of Cork, and round the Catholic places of worship there loitered, all more or less decked out in holiday attire, a population of idlers of both sexes and many ages, who with that ceaseless flow of prattle and apt repartee for which the Irish are so justly famed, whiled away the peaceful idle Sabbath morning hours. But among the smaller fry of the maritime world which rested at anchor in the bay, out towards its center there seemed lazily to swing on her cable one of those ocean liners, a veritable Leviathan compared with a smaller craft, and which the experienced eye readily perceived to be an ocean-going steamer waiting there for the arrival of males, outward bound. The Prussian monarch, for such was her name, had scarcely been made fast to her moorings ear, there came alongside of her sun-dry small official and non-official craft, and several persons came on board. Among these were females of the working class, whose glib and ready tongues and characteristic head attire indicated unmistakably that their origin was of the Emerald Isles, and while they offered various pretty and petty ornaments of merchandise, such as fruit, drinks, bog oak ornaments, blackthorns, laces, and relics to passengers of the outward bound vessel, kept up, especially with the more youthful of the male passengers, a constant fire of keen, witty repartee in which the Irish tongue invariably triumphed and the latter invariably came only second best off for it is about useless for any other nationality to enter the lists or attempt to vie in repartee with the bright and ever ready intelligence of a bright witty irish girl but whilst on the great ship passengers and visitors were thus in barter or gossip or fun whilst away the idle waiting hours along the queenstown quay an official steamer tender the smoke lazily curling from her short thick funnel into the cloudless atmospheric blue lay waiting the arrival of the train from dublin bringing the latest outward new york and american mails and some passengers for whom business or pleasure made it desirable to go on board the prussian monarch at the latest possible moment ere she cut off communication with land however at the last train from dublin arrived and the calm peacefulness of the day was broken in upon by the transfer from train to tender and steamer of passengers and baggage and mails among the several persons who might be seen hurrying from the train to the boat were two individuals whose clerical garb shaven pates and other distinctive marks of their order marked them as priests of the church of rome although very similarly attired and so far alike there was a strong contrast in the physical character and appearance of the two men the one inevitably the younger although appearing most boyish at first sight perhaps on closer investigation you would have found to be some six or seven and twenty years it might have been that the austerity of the regimen to which he had been subjected from an early age the rigid abstinence the continuous fasts the asceticism the subdual of fleshly lusts the complete mastery of the spiritual over carnal being it might have been that his religious zeal had stunted and subdued that which other men acquired in a fullness of physical growth he was clean-shaven lean-jawed and although his features were sunken and livid by abstinence from the actual necessities which nature demands yet there was a clear healthful honest brightness in his large truthful gray eye which to a shrewd judge of human nature would have spoken volumes for the transparent honesty of his life and confidence in his belief without being contaminated by any of the jesuitical subtleties of the church of his adoption his soul has caught the fire of its holy zeal 
Such zeal as this it is, which engenders holy priestly lives. The traveling companion, however, of this youthful and guileless priest was a man of quite different mold, and although the tonsure was visible upon his crown, and he had a closely shaven face, and an ivory crucifix dangled from his girdle, and he wore the same sober habit of his order, and the same monkish hood and cowl, yet his portly person told far less of a abstinence, far less of penances and fasts, and a more intimate acquaintance with refectory and cook. With such laxity indeed, had he observed his fasts that he was even a little inclined to en bon point, his age, though not easy to determine, might have exceeded to the apparent five or six and twenty summers of his junior companion by a good two decades. His hair, or what of it remained since his now smooth and shaven pate, had passed under the barber's hands, was straight and dark, and whereas the boyish-looking countenance of the younger priest was open and honest and without guile, his was a pale, rather sallow than livid, while his eye was dark, restless, ever observant of all that passed on every side, and keen, and it would have taken but a superficial degree of penetration to determine that rather than in asceticism, or in monkish or monastic seclusion, he had been schooled and taught in the rough and ready ways of a wicked world. Along with the others from the steam tender conveying the passengers and males, the two priests who registered respectively the elder of the twain as Father St. Vincent de la Croix and the younger was Father Leola, stepped up the gangway on the deck of the noble liner the Prussian Monarch, and soon anchor was weighted and slewing around to the south. The fine vessel steamed out of Queenstown Harbor and turned her head towards the western ocean. Gradually, but rapidly, the southern rocky headlands and promontories disappeared one by one from view. The bright green slopes of the Emerald Isles faded away in the ocean haze. The fascinate rock with its lighthouse, as seen from the deck of the Prussian monarch, sunk every minute lower and lower beneath the horizon of the eastern waves, and onward, 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 the great ship plowed the sea day after day. We need not enlarge upon the incidences of the voyage. During its continuance, the two priests maintained a certain exclusiveness apart from those whom they were surrounded, a separation which was perhaps consistent with their holy office and their creed. In less than nine days, from the port bow of the Prussian monarch was visible, rising from the bosom of the broad Atlantic, the long, low, brown, shelving tongue of sand known as Sandy Hook, and the next morning, after certain formalities, in place of the monotonous outlook, which day after day they had looked upon, of the boundless ocean and the ever-rolling, ever-swelling deep, the Prussian monarch had reached her mornings, and on every side, on sea and land, was seen the busy life of the city of New York. There was the usual delays, and the inspection of baggage, and then the passengers of the great vessel, liberated from the luxuriously appointed water-bound prison which she had been to them for the past nine days, went each one on his own way of life. The two priests mingled with the busy and dirty throng which crowd the wharfs and the quays down to the water's edge of West Street, New York. But Father St. Vincent de la Croix had not been ten minutes in the busy crowd ere, rather to the astonishment of his young companion, he was accosted by a strange, insignificant-looking individual of diminutive stature, whose status and condition was a sheer utter anemia to the boyish-looking younger priest but who, as the diminutive individual is already well known to the reader, we will say no other than the little ferret man, Paul Nugas. However, after some minutes converse, Father St. Vincent de la Croix and Paul Nugas parted, 
and without further noticing this incident, we will accompany the two priests on their way. From its source among the Adirondack Mountains near the Canadian frontier, through Lake George and Lake Chaplin, for some 300 miles in a nearly southerly direction, the broad and stately current of the Hudson River flows along by the eastern counties of the state of New York. Although lacking in the castellated ruins and fantastic legends of the past, commemorative of the old freebooting times of the Middle Ages of European history, which led the particular fascination of their romance to the Rhine. The Hudson, in the charm of its Respirian scenery, which seems to rest upon the solitary silent reaches of its waters, its varying succession of broad expanse and straight defile, in grandeur, perhaps, the Hudson even outvies the Rhine. And thus this queen among rivers flows placidly onward past wooded banks and fertile lands, till between the villages or townships of Weehawken and Hoboken, and the more populous centers of Jersey City on the one hand, and the busy world of Manhattan Island and New York on the other, it debouches and becomes lost in the greater volume of water of the Atlantic Ocean and the Bay of New York. For hundreds of miles above New York City, the Hudson River is a broad, navigable, stately stream on whose majestic bosom there ply daily, among others, streamers to the cities of Albany and Troy. The river boats that ply in American waters are commonly white painted, differing in aspect, construction, and shape from similarly employed craft in European rivers and bays. It was on one of these boats, known as the Princess, as she lay berthed off West Street, New York, that the two priests, Father Leola and Father St. Vincent de la Croix, betook themselves very soon after landing from the Prussian monarch in which they had crossed from the Emerald Isles. Punctual to her time, the princess backed out into the stream, turned her head to the current of the Hudson, and began her journey up the river, whose aspect we have just shortly described. As the day wore on, there were several stoppages at waterside landing stages and wharfs to take in or put off passengers, produce, or goods. The two priests maintained the same exclusiveness of demeanor towards those around them which they had evinced ever since they stepped from the shores of the British Isles. At last, however, their long water journey seemed to have come to an end. The steamer princess drew up a little wooden landing stage or wharf on the left bank of the river. The two churchmen stepped ashore and the white boat, loosed once more on the landing stage, again steamed away on her northward voyage. After making certain arrangements as to their scant baggage and simple belongings with apostolic simplicity, they had almost taken neither purse nor scrip. The two priests left the landing stage. They made an inquiry as to the direction, and then, quitting the water's edge, pursued on foot between groves of tall chestnut trees, a devious path up a dusty road, till at a distance of something less than half a mile from the river bank, within secluded grounds which, in the heat of summer, would have been shaded by the tall and stately trees which stood around, giving to the place the aspect of sacred seclusion. They came to a large building which, beautiful without, commanding fine extensive views of the surrounding country, was a conventual retreat. As this building is part of a seminary devoted to the education of young ladies, besides being also a convent, and may be known to some who pursue these pages, further than to call it by the name of the convent of St. Xavier, we will refrain from publishing its name. The two priests, Father Leola and Father de St. Lacroix, approached the entrance by a winding drive through the beautiful and tastefully laid out grounds of the convent. Without hesitation, they rang the bell, which was immediately answered by a sister of charity or nun. The face of the latter was almost wholly concealed by a linen coif of spotless white drawn tightly across the forehead surrounding and concealing from view the lower parts of the face. For the rest, she was attired in the black woolen habit and veil of her order as a nun. 
Although the coif which she wore did not completely conceal from view her youth and her traces of female attractiveness and beauty, neither could it hide her sad, nay, dejected, mien, and what perhaps were traces of regret at having abjured, shut out from her existence all the brightness and beauty of the world around. With all its ecstasies and joys, which surely God would have had no purpose in creating if he had not created them very bright and beautiful that men and women might enjoy. As she answered the summons, with a slight obeisance to their holy office, the nun, on observing the two fathers of the church, swung wide the covent doors and the two priestly travelers entered a spacious and lofty hall, in fact, the entrance hall of the covent. On all sides were abundant evidence of outlay on needful or unneedful modern improvements to please the eye and for the gratification of luxury and taste. There were marble statuary, rich and curious vases. The walls were hung with costly paintings of religious subjects and portraits of saints, while the air was redolent with sweet and balmy fragrance of the choicest flowers. Such was the gilded portal of the whited sepulchre which led to the tomb of buried hopes and lives, the fasts and penances, the living deaths of too much and too many of those who have been deluded by their religious vows into passing beyond. The two priests, Father Leola and his elder and more portly companion, were invited by the pensive-looking sister of charity who admitted them through the entrance hall into one of four large parlors or reception rooms provided as receiving or waiting rooms for those who came on business or otherwise to this, call it as you will, whited sepulchre or abode of love. The reception room which the two new arrivals entered was like the reception hall, a lofty and spacious apartment, beautified by all that was costly adorned in profusion with all things beautiful that wealth could purchase, or luxury, ease, refinement, and cultured taste could suggest or demand. Here the two priests were left by the pensive sister who retired to inform the mother superior of the arrival of two fathers of the church. They had not long to wait ere the mother superior of the covent appeared. A woman, as far as the coif and gown of her order, permitted any judgment to be formed of some thirty or fifty years of age, and when the elder of the two priests, Father St. Missa de la Croix, presented to her a letter of introduction and recommendation from a well-known Irish Roman Catholic bishop, the Reverend Mother Celise, her conventual name, was all blandness, suavity and smiles in her exertions to impress favorably to the minds after traveling so far of her newly arrived guests the most anxious inquiries were made as to their voyage and their mission and their well-being from the covent parlor the two priests were conducted to the refectory where wine and choice refreshments were served they were then conducted through the various parts of the establishment and as the church pampers its fathers, were treated as honored guests. But these more material and worldly matters we will pass. The recital of this episode of our story tempts us now indeed to write with a pen of gold tipped with a priceless gem, to remove the very shoes from off our feet, to go gently, circumspectly, for the place wherefore we tread is most delicate, if most, shall we say it, unholy ground. Father St. Vincent de la Croix and Father Leola had tarried something less than seven days in the convent of St. Xavier when the former, the elder priest, became interested in certain religieuses known in the convent as Sister Agatha, a sister who, rather than in works of charity or cloistered devotion, was occupied in the instruction of the young. Although under the banner of the same faith and under the influence of the same church, the educational and conventual departments of the convent of St. Xavier were in separate and distinct, though adjacent buildings. 
but it is to be feared that the tender minds in training at the seminary attached to the convent of St. Xavier's were shown only the warm, devotional, poetic coloring of conventual life rather than permitted to see too closely the darker incidences which occur behind its veil. And we believe it a fact that few of those who even as Protestants entered its schools left without at least a strong bias towards the tenets of the Church of Rome. But these are considerations which intertwine not with the network of our tale. Even convent walls, jealousy, guarded portals, vows of poverty and chastity, the ceremonies of high mass, and all the phalanx of saints and imagery by means of which the church allures unwary souls within its fold cannot exclude the influence of love. Cupid is an intrusive divinity, and not the strongest have penoplied themselves impervious to his darts as he flits on golden wings around the tulip bells, and flirts and toys and trifles till he strikes wholehearted youth. So even stern penances austere vows, and all the thunders and anathemas of the church, with childhood's careless raillery he laughs to scorn. And had Cupid then entered the sacred precincts of St. Xavier's, had the staid priest Father St. Vincent de la Croix fallen a victim to his wily arts and spells? Ye who imagine that vows of chastity and abstinence, undertaken by they who assume the veil of the recluse, or don the cassock and the stole of anointed priesthood, can arm them against his assaults, unburthen your minds of a delusion so intense. But whether or not the staid and portly priest, Father St. Vincent de la Croix, had been stricken by Cupid's dart, the presence of Sister Agatha seemed to have for him the fascination of a charm. Whether he was drawn by the saintly beauty, the holy calm of her face, impelled by his own love-smitten heart, or influenced by some attraction more subtle or profane we will, without telling, leave it open for the reader to conclude. At the convent of St. Xavier, horticulture was carried to the perfection of a fine art. There were groves and gardens where the graces might have worshipped, or whose solitudes might, as high places, have been dedicated to spiritual communion with the gods. It was in one of these called the Italian Garden, set apart mainly for the use of the Sisterhood of St. Xavier's, that Father St. Vincent de la Croix encountered in sad contemplative mood the nun Sister Agatha alone. Her meditations might have been of holy things, or perhaps her thoughts flew back on golden wings of memory to other years, when in some bright home, in a world which she had abjured, which now she vainly sought to forget. She might have been the idol of a parent's heart. Or perhaps there came back to her the incidences of some undying and yet unforgotten love. But whatever the meditations of Sister Agatha might have been, they were broken in upon and interrupted by a till now unseen presence near her of no other than the priest, Father St. Vincent de la Croix. Sister, a dime for your thoughts, were the unclerical and somewhat profane words with which the priest addressed the nun. Oh, Father, she replied, startled at his presence, oft times the heart is sick and very, very sad verily bowed down even to the dust with sadness, with the consciousness of its own weary longings. Ah, too, by its own unworthiness. Yes, by the anxieties for its future as well as by memories of the past. The priest glanced curiously but keenly at the sad nun as she spoke. Perhaps he was too worldly, or perhaps he was not too well versed in the most needful of all knowledge to a priest whose functions are the elevation of spiritual ills, the care of the inmost spiritual necessities of the human heart. Perhaps he knew not the deepest pangs of its oft-time sufferers, knew not the utterness of the solitude which may pervade its most hidden, most secret, most sacred depths. But even Father St. Vincent seemed touched acutely, as what heart would not. As the nun gazed sadly into his face, 
her sadness and beauty seemingly intensified by the veil and coif and the sober weeds of her order. But sister, he resumed, should there not be joy in a heart which, renouncing all earthly ties, has dedicated itself to the Lord? Is such a consecration a holocaust of sadness? Nay, my sister, rather than bondage term it a sacrifice of love, which should be only too joyfully offered to the Lord, the sweetest holocaust that our holy church has granted the privilege of women to offer, to be its bride. Father, she replied, are not you a consecrated priest, one of the Lord's anointed, pledged by your vows of sanctity, of celibacy? Then what can you, Father, pardon my boldness, what can you know of the place which the word bride occupies in a woman's heart? Tell me, my father, if cloistered within these convent walls, were they as high as heaven is high and a thousand times the thickness that they are, think you, father, that they would shut from my heart the remembrance of my earliest, truest, purest love. Love, call it cardinal if you will. Such love is what we give to man, but adoration worship is the meed of and offered only to the king of heaven. True daughter, but your words tell me that there has been brightness in your past, that there has been worldly ties which you have not forgotten, from which you cannot sever, cannot disentangle your heart. At that moment they gained a summer, or arbor houses, among the trees which formed in a summer a secluded and cool retreat. But now with the reproach of winter, the aspect of the scene was less attractive and changed. They entered, and Father St. Vincent took a seat near the beautiful but sad-faced nun. Speak not, I pray you, Father, to me of a past. Past, the past! The word conveys to me a meaning which would to my God I had never known, which I were blotted out altogether from the pages of my memory as a thing that had never, never been. But sister, is there no hope? said the priest, as, taking her hand in his own, the tears arose in his eyes from, man of the world as he was, an overwhelming heart. For some moments both were silent, the priest still holding the nun by the hand. He seemed deeply saddened by her sadness, and now and again a sob broke the stillness around them. Then tell me, dear sister, he resumed, could the happiness of past days be restored? Could you live again the years that have flown? Would you recant? Would you live again the life of, of a recluse? Tell me. Oh, father, tempt me not, said the nun. You know, father, that I have taken vows. Tempt me not to recantation, to perfidy, to infidelity to my troth. And as she bent her head, hiding her face in her veil, the tears from her eyes fell fast hot, welling, blinding, burning tears. As in some of those sea-bound countries and communities where the land lies below the level of the surrounding ocean, a system of dams restrained the encroachment of the ever-threatening tide. So the barriers of an unnatural life of austerity which hedged in the life of the religieuse broke down. And the overwhelming torrent of the memories of years rushed into assert their natural place, to engulf, to overturn, to wash out all the false doctrine and delusion inculcated by a heretic faith. In the depth of her spiritual anguish, the agonized sister, call her girl, woman, child, matron, call her what you will, but all the attributes of true womanhood had been awakened. She fell upon her knees before the priest, whom the tenets of her adopted faith had taught her to venerate and prostrate her reason as if before some demigod. Oh, father, father, she burst forth, absolve me from iniquity, but refrain, O oh my father, from speaking of the past, of, of, of. She would have added more, but she broke down in its midst, and the tears seemed to flow from her eyes like rain. The priest sat silently by, knowing the cup of her tears and affliction would be all the sooner voided by the copiousness of its flow. Then, as she became more composed, he gently raised her from the kneeling posture and seated her again beside him, where, although less afflicted, the great sobs now and again burst from her like the great intermittent raindrops which succeeded a summer shower. Sister, tell me this, he then asked, were it in my power to produce proof positive that your past is not altogether strange, is not altogether unknown to me. Would you choose the life of a recluse, 
Tell me, is it by your own free choice that you have renounced a world, a life, which once smiled around you, around a beautiful home, around youth's dearest hopes? The nun started visibly, violently at his words. Father, you know more than you choose to tell. Nay, sister, say not more than I choose to tell. Say rather, more than I have yet told. Look, my sister, see here. With these words, he produced from the fob of the monkish gabardine which he wore and handed to her for examination. What was not else than that costly jewel which had passed through so many vicissitudes and adventures and into so many possessors' hands, the ring, the gold and sapphire heirloom of the Gonauts. For some minutes, the nun, as if affected by a magic charm, gazed at the elaborately cut stone. Perhaps the floodgates of memory would have again burst, but it seemed as if she had wept herself empty of tears. Sister, I see that the jewel is not strange to you. Tell me where you saw it last. She looked fixedly at the gem. Her lips quivered violently, but she stood silent and unmoved. At last she spoke. Father, she replied, I would keep silence were it not that my vows compel me to withhold not the truth from an anointed priest of God. Tell me, speak, sister, am I not too forbidden by my auricular oaths, by the seal of the confessional, to utter the secrets of lives which have been entrusted to me under its sacred ban? Yet, father, no other argument would move me to the confession of where I last saw that ring. Speak out, dear sister, tell me where. Father, I last saw it on my husband's hand. The priest winced visibly as she spoke, and there spread over his face a look of surprise. Her admission seemed to dispel all the priestly, what we would call the professional manner and sentiment from him, and whereas, as previously he surrounded, cloaked himself in his sanctity rather than his manhood, now he threw off his priesthood and became man. Sister, he resumed, you mean to tell me that you were wedded? to an earthly bridegroom ere you were wedded to the father my union with the church of god as i know you were about to call it was not but a farce a delusion a sham the tone of her voice changed as she spoke from warmth to anger nay she continued i grow reckless when i think of the past rather than being wedded to the church say rather that i am a slave kidnapped by the Jesuitical wiles of this accursed system which is called a religion, a faith, in whose false doctrines the deluded vainly trust for the salvation of their souls. The priest opened his eyes widely as she spoke, perhaps as much astonished at her bold condemnation of the system under which she lived as at her rising air. But if the inmost workings of his heart could have been laid bare, we should have seen that his true sentiment was as much one of exaltation as surprise. But Father de St. Lacroix did not fail to pursue and turn to his advantage the cue which thus he had thus cunningly obtained. You mean you speak truthfully when you tell me you saw that jewel, the priest asked, on your husband's hand. Father, I say it in the sight of heaven before God, in whose sight I became an earthly bride. Then tell me, when, where, under what circumstances were you wed? Father, the story of my marriage is a sad story. I was the dotedly loved and sole child of an aged parent in a very, very beautiful English home. All the surroundings of my life taught me only innocence. I was as guileless, as free as the birds that sang, or the flowers that bloomed. And the love in my heart was that of the birds or flowers, as the birds seek their consorts, as the flowers extend their tendrils. So it only needed the presence near me of a stronger manhood in which my heart must trust, to which I might yearn and render up its love. At last it came. Bertram Gnault came to our beautiful home. Father, it would be a long story to tell you why and wherefore he came. We were secretly wed, as stolen waters are said to be sweet, so our happiness, as it was only known each to each, was all the more blissful and intense. But it was bliss too perfect and beautiful to endure, cut short ere we realize its perfection or that it had begun. For this, Father, is not but a world of sorrows, perfidy, and afflictions, the cup of which is oft times too bitter to taste, their weight too heavy to be endured. 
Father, in the balances of affliction have I been weighed. But, O Father, spare me, spare me, I beseech you, the recital of my griefs. The ruthless Jesuitical priestcraft by which my life was desolated turned from a garden as into some arid waste. And was there any issue of your marriage? Father St. Vincent asked. Yes, my son, one child. And does he still live? He does, and is now being educated at a Roman Catholic college in this country, in one of the New England states. But we have said enough. We have shown the reader enough of this not the least sad episode of our tale. The root of all the wild erratic excesses of Bertram Gnault's life. Years ago, in that bright summertime, secretly undertaken, scarcely had the intense blissfulness of Marjorie Gillingham's and Bertram Gnault's wedded happiness began, ere a ruthless wile decoyed the young wife from the lover-husband's side, but to open up all its intricacies would be to add another volume to this book. Probably, ere now, the penetration of the reader has recognized what was once Marjorie Gillingham or Marjorie Gnault beneath the saddened, embittered, coiffed, and veiled figure of the St. Xavier's nun. A feeling of intense sadness came over Father St. Vincent de la Croix. He rose to his feet, stern, hard man that he was. The story of Sister Agatha of St. Xavier's, or as we will now call her in our own language, Marjorie Gnault, seemed to have pierced his heart, but again must the veil fall. End of section 36. Read to you by J.P. Liao, Vancouver, Canada, September 30th, 2022. Section 37 of The Alley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Alley by T. Dothy Lyle. A Mother's Tears. At last there is rest. Within a very few days of the interview in the Italian garden of the convent with the nun Sister Agatha related in the last chapter, Father St. Vincent de St. Croix, or, as we will otherwise now disclose him to be, no other than Colonel Heinrich van der Meulen, in priestly habiliments and guise, turning his back upon St. Xavier's, the profuse hospitality of which for the past fourteen days he had enjoyed, and bidding adieu to his late travelling companion, the young, guileless, and unsuspicious priest, Father Leolta, the Reverend Mother Celeste, and the very few others whose acquaintances he had made, not forgetting Sister Agatha, the sad-faced nun, for Father de St. Croix, in his sojourn, had discreetly kept himself much aloof from those around him, shrewdly arguing to himself that the tacit exclusiveness of his demeanour would be construed into the superior sanctity and wisdom of the Holy Father, and the constancy of his seclusion within the walls of his cell would be attributed to his devotion, superior sanctity, and the fervour and reality of his spiritual life. So quitting the convent alone, Father de St. Croix, under the pretense that he was due another convent in the vicinity of Jersey City and New York City, wended his way back down the dusty path between the groves of chestnut trees, and again caught the white-painted steamboat, Princess, on one of her southward trips to New York from Albany and Troy. Perhaps rather fortunately, the obscurity of the night, or rather perhaps the obscurity of the small and very early hours of the morning when the Princess reached her berth at the West Street Pier, favoured the unobserved arrival of the traveller as he stepped ashore on the garb which he assumed. And then, with the confident, unhesitating step of a man who knows every inch of his way, he threaded street after street in the cold, chill wretchedness of the unpleasantly early morning air to those uptown quarters into which the reader has never been introduced, where were Colonel van der Meulen's fro and bands. And sometime, rather late in the following afternoon for the first time for many weeks he put in an appearance once more in everyday attire at his little high up den near battery park where for the first time this prince of man-hunters was introduced to the reader in the opening chapters of our tale and perhaps in the pages which we have written the reader has been told and seen enough of colonel van der Meulen to understand the attribute of his character which had lifted him in his particular calling on to such a pinnacle of fame following up the information imparted to him under the conventional name of Sister Agatha by the widow and mother, Colonel van der Meulen undertook still another journey, 
but this time to a city which we need not name to the north-east of new york and here in a new england college as he had been truly informed he found in training the young boy bertram gonault but this would open a new page of a story which we shall not pursue no obstacle was placed by the authorities of the college in the way of van der Meulen interviewing the lad and the strong family likeness which he exhibited to the late owner of vernwood to the late murdered bertram and to of course his uncles lawrence and mervyn gonault left in the detective's mind no reason to doubt that he was the late bertram's son and consequently his true heir colonel van der Meulen lost no time in communicating to mr lumley the result of his success in the united states and his discovery both of bertram gonault's widow and his heir but the question arose in mr lumley's mind when did the marriage of the late bertram gonault and marjorie gilligan take place the nun sister agatha had told father st vincent that their marriage was a civil ceremony only and that they had been united before the registrar in the town of f and this statement mr lumley now felt it to be incumbent on him to prove search and inquiry both in london at somerset house and in the town of f was made and in due time evidence and the registration of the marriage a civil one only was produced with the name of one witness attached it will be remembered that long ago on the disappearance of marjorie then only known as marjorie gilligan but in truth marjorie wife of bertram gonault from her vernwood home the bereaved and heart-rent and disconsolate husband and lover had sought alleviation of his deep sorrow or apprehension of ill in the solitude of the cloisters and in the cathedral aisle under the influence of the organ's assuaging soothing alleviating strains as the sunbeams came stealing so softly and silently through the tinted panes dyeing the sacred floor and kissing and bathing in their warmth and light the altar cross it will be remembered that two female forms in the garb of some religious sisterhood arose from their devotions near the altar and as the husband that was sat there in deep dejection aroused his attention and interest as they quitted the sacred fane it will be remembered that the sorrow-stricken lover followed them from their sacred building and then they were mysteriously lost it was in one of these thickly veiled forms known in a semi-religious semi-charitable local institution as sister judith munro that bertram though her garb concealed both face and form believed he discovered the chief friend and confidant of marjorie and who had been the principal indeed almost the sole witness of their nuptials and whom he hoped might give him some clue to his wife's secret and mysterious if we may let us call it flight after this bertram had again sought sister judith munro but she was said to have left the locality for some distant religious home there seemed indeed to be a mystery about sister judith munro either about her presence or absence which all bertram's anxiety to penetrate could never unravel but now it became in mr lumley's legal eyes a necessity to not only ascertain who and where sister judith munro was but that a specimen for comparison with the handwriting on the register of the marriage of marjorie gilligan and bertram gonault of her signature if she were living or indeed if she had since died should be obtained by means of inquiry and a stratagem which it would take us at the late stage of our story too long to elucidate both these ends were gained sister judith munro was found in a religious institution in a distant and remote part of england and unknown even to herself an example of her signature was surreptitiously obtained so that when confronted with her own recent calligraphy and that on the marriage register of the gonauts she could not dispute neither did she attempt to deny that both were her handwriting nor attempt to dispute her presence and complicity in the secret union of marjorie gilligan and bertram gonault indeed why the union should have been secretly entered into was another of the list of mysteries which will never be known which involved bertram gonault's life but bridging over the winged flight of years we will for the last time conduct the reader in imagination back once more to beautiful vernwood after a lapse following the events which we have just recited of some nearly seven summers it is a bright unclouded day in june if possible vernwood is even still more beautiful than of yore all that wealth and taste can accomplish has been lavished to form a superlatively beautiful home 
Moreover, during the minority of the hour, under good management and with no spendthrift to dissipate its products in riotous living, its borders have been extended, and its revenues discreetly husbanded have prodigiously accumulated and grown. Such is the vernwood as we shall describe it under the bright June sunshine for the last time in the course of this tale. But, like as we have seen vernwood plunged in its utterest depths of sadness, overhung, overwhelmed as by some mysterious murderous pall, so now, amid the flourish of trumpets, the flaunt of banners, and shouts of welcome, we will forget the dark chapters, the gloom, the shadow, the sorrow of the past, and look on it amid all the rejoicing which surrounds the homecoming of the heir, young Bertram Gonault. For the joyfulness of the present seems even to outshine the gloom and sadness of the past, and for many a league have the expectant throng assembled, to accord in fitting accents and with fitting honours, notwithstanding the dark clouds through which it has passed. It's welcome to the descendants of the old time-honoured race, back to the old, the beautiful, the time-honoured home. The mother Marjorie, too, is there no longer a girl, no longer a St. Xavier's nun, but tried in the crucible of affliction, and mellowed by the influence of years, and amid all the pride of motherhood, and as the shouts of welcome ascended, she cannot repress the floods of tears and the deep, deep sorrows of those past memories which lie so indelibly imprinted on the profoundest depths of the wife's, the widow's, the mother's heart. Like two conflicting intermingling torrents from mountain heights, within her breast both joy and sorrow meet and clash and foam. O womankind, thy passions, thy love, the most perfect attributes of thy nature have brought thee many joys but have subjected thee, alas, to many woes. But that bright day at Vernwood, like other days, had passed, and the heir once more was in possession of his own. Yes, Vernwood is bright and beautiful, but dare we darken the picture? There is one closed and ever-silent chamber where the sunbeams never penetrate, in which no music of laughter ever echoes, into which no human footfall crosses the threshold where the dust of time has settled undisturbed. Perhaps it were iniquitous to leave so pronounced a relic of so dark a sin. The ignorant and superstitious say, at night when the moon shines clear and cold, they have heard uncanny echoes from within, like some murdered victim's wail. They tell, so says the legend, that for three nights in every year, the unrestful spirit of the past master of Vernwood walks the terrace outside the closed chamber of the rising of the harvest moon. But let us close forever this sinister episode of our tale. The mother of the present heir, as once she renounced the world, has now forever bid adieu to conventional life. She resides at Vernwood, but far away on the outskirts of the property, on a richly wooded hillside. A bijou mansion has arisen amongst the trees, and although she seldom comes to the old mansion, where two painful memories are revived, this new abode is Marjorie Gurnault's home. As to the future history and destiny of these characters whose actions have interwoven with the network of our story, to the reader who followed this history thus far, they may be soon and shortly told. To take them seriatim, as they appeared on our story's mimic stage, Horace Wyndham, as if the culture of choice roses was healthful and conductive to longevity, lived to see most of the incidents which this book relate, and amid the healthful habits and pursuits of his retirement, contrived to elude the slaying scythe of the grim old king of terrors for considerably over five score years mr lumley who has shuffled off what he termed his bondage and martyrdom to the law is now no longer young by some manoeuvre he has become the professor in fee simple of an english country seat on very reasonable terms and having resigned the reins of the well-known and lucrative practice near lincoln's infield into mr willoughby's or other able hands he seldom shows his face in town Mrs. Chickett's, a lone, lorn widow, keeps a lodging-house near Maida Vale, for poor Chickett's, whom she worried to death, is dead. After a rather lengthened sojourn in England, old Jeff and Martha Massey, together with their son Jules, returned to the United States, the two former returning to Maryland. But Jules, rather than proceed further, and having money in his pocket to spend, decided to settle down among other gentry and other gentility of his own colour in the hub of the universe, the city of new york where on sixth avenue almost any sunday evening 
is tall, erect, and rather haughty form may be met, not less elaborately dressed and jewelled than when in the English capital, now the pride of himself and the pride of his race. By Jules's side, when on Sixth Avenue, on the promenade, is usually to be seen a dark, fair one, whose ebon hue is lighted up by incessant smiles and the pearl-like brilliancy of faultless rows of teeth, which it seems to be her constant occupation to display. This is Lizzie, whom Jules has honoured by making her his bride. There is another actor in this drama whose services in the cause of enlightenment and truth you must not forget. Neither are they forgotten, for Monk lived to an advanced and honoured age, and in a sequestered glen near the mausoleum at Vernwood, in a grave around which rhododendrons flew, and where the sombre shadows of the cedar fall, a tall and slender obelisk of faultless marble points upwards to the fleeting clouds or sunlit skies, telling in graven characters what Monk had done. And there, let us only add, requiescat in parche to the lettered honours of his tomb. Dr. Sirius Wells is neither more nor less, neither greater nor smaller than he was, while the little ferret man Paul Newgas is a New York manhunter on his own account, for on his shoulders has the cloak of his master, that past master in his calling, Brandon Mule and Fallen. The two surviving of the Triplet brothers, namely Lawrence and Mervyn Gonal, for so we will call them, by whatever name or names they were subsequently known, so far disappeared from the great tracts of civilization that their whereabouts was never afterwards generally known. They were believed to have retired into the great silver mining regions beyond the Mexican frontier and the Rio Grande, where, perhaps at the instigation of their beautiful Spanish-Mexican mother, and by the aid of the secret fraternity of the Sons of Cain, they plotted further crimes, or rather let us hope they lived to regret their past. Colonel Heinrich van der Meulen, for his intelligence, energy, and smartness, and his complete elucidation of all the puzzling mystery in which the Vernwood tragedy was involved, received what was a mere fraction of the Vernwood revenues, fifty thousand dollars reward. And what became of him? The sun was fast sinking towards the horizon, when far, far away towards the towering peaks of the rocky mountains, a comfortable-looking prairie homestead seemed tacitly to invite us, after a long day's weary travel, to crave rest, shelter, and hospitality for hungry man and jaded beast. Both were granted. The work and travel of the day had come to an end as we sat together under the veranda of the cosy western home. The fumes of that solace of the western weary, the inevitable weed, were circling around our heads, scenting the pure, fresh prairie air, and enveloping our presence in a veritable haze. Away, out upon the prairie and in the adjacent stockyard, our eyes roam away onto the wealth of its owner in vast herds of resting kine. Near by us, some half dozen idle cowboys, after the labours of the day, have grown hilarious and boisterous over the chances of a game of euchre played with dirty, greasy cards. And as Colonel Heinrich van der Meulen, who is owner of the ranch and boss, and is also our host, and we are his guests, as we sit by his side in the agreeable falling of the gloom. Among the chances of his life, he tells us what we, dear reader, have told to you. The story of the sapphire shield crossed by the sinister bar. And that, said Colonel van der Meulen, was how I came to be a ranchero. The End of the Airling by T. Dothiel Lyle